Young. I couldn't help but chuckle when Ruby mentioned John's plans to win his first fight. It wasn't out of spite, but it seemed ridiculous. Carden couldn't be considered the finest warrior in the room, that title was reserved for me, and perhaps the serial girl. Still, he was pretty powerful, and his semblance, combined with his judicious use of dust crystals, had given him plenty of triumphs. Pira and I were the only two who never lost a fight against Carden. Blake and Nora had an even chance, while Ruby, Weiss, and Rin usually lost two-thirds of their battles. It wasn't that they lacked skill or strength, but whenever they let their guard down, Carden's fire wave pushed them out of the ring. I couldn't help but laugh, and Ruby responded with a cute pout. She warned me that I'd regret it later. Oh, damn! I couldn't believe the result and spoke my thoughts aloud. The fight was anything but ordinary, and at times, I could empathize with Carden. John's actions seemed underhanded and unscrupulous, but in the end, that doesn't matter. He's been tricked, he's been backstabbed, and he's been quite possibly bamboozled. John kicked his ass and emerged victorious. As I gazed at the knight, he grinned like a buffoon. He was thrilled beyond measure, like someone who had won the lottery and couldn't wait to tell their loved ones. Despite his silliness, John was smart enough to teach me today that attacking head-on wasn't always the best course of action. With the class dismissed, we met in the hallway as usual. Everyone was happy and proud of John's victory. John! Ruby yelled, pouncing onto his neck and embracing the dorky knight. My eyes popped as I stared at the scene before me. Ruby and John were being pretty chummy, calling him her first friend at Beacon, it only solidified that Ruby needs some more pals. Well, would you look at that? John spun around with delight, holding Ruby in his arms like she was some kind of princess. My first victory, and I already have such a beautiful rose thrown at me. Ah! Ruby squealed, embarrassed. John! The tiny Grim Reaper blushed and tried to hide her face as everyone around burst out laughing at the situation. Well, everyone except for me and Pira. The champion seemed to be witnessing the most heinous act of her life, and despite sharing the serial girl's dislike, I definitely didn't feel it as intensely as she did. John? We need to talk about your fight. The jealous partner commented. I am delighted that you won, but you could have used more assertive strategies and had a quicker victory over Carden. It would be advantageous for you to review the peculiarities of this fight. Just the two of us. Was she trying to sound sophisticated to hide her feelings? My attention started to drift at the end, but then I realized that all she wanted was some private time with her crush. Clever girl. I whispered grinning at her. Carefully, John put my sister back on the ground before responding to his partner. Today was important for me to demonstrate the effectiveness of my special ammunition. Pira, while I agree with you and feel nauseated for indulging this dolt dash dot. Weiss began before getting cut off. You'll also like... I will make sure to force you use insults that are more up-to-date next time we sign a contract. Ha! I exclaimed to the Ice Queen. Some might call this childish behavior, but I call it a top-notch burn. As I was saying, the heiress complained, glaring at John, as if she dared him to interrupt again. Today's recording will be sent to potential buyers, so John had his equipment fight for him. Who's interested in buying such unconventional ammunition? The Green Ninja asked. To maintain professionalism, let's avoid mentioning names. Dash dot. Atlas Army. John interrupted her again. Ark. Weiss shouted, turning to him. In sequence, they began to argue as if they were an old couple who had started a business together. During their discussion, I took a closer look at the leader of Team JNPR. Unlike the first day, he was now comfortable in his position and with his teammates. 
Ruby and Weiss had also gotten closer to him, and even Blake had taken an interest in him. Not that the ninja girl on my team had gone to talk to John to get to know him better. That would be too normal for her, too mainstream. One day, I found her scroll unlocked and discovered that she owned the Nightshade profile, the account that used to post photos of students, both men and women, in compromising positions, but lately, it had been very focused on a blonde squire. Everyone had access to the photos of John working out with Professor Port, but on the day she posted the professor helping him stretch, a yaoi fanfic thread was created. Ish. I shudder, just thinking about what's written there. Are you okay? Blake asked. I'm fine, and I hope you've washed your hands. As if she were the most innocent person in the world, the number one stalker voyeur of beacons stared at me, confused. Why do you keep saying that to me? It is the same reason you keep your nails so short. Belladonna gazed at me, confused, but then she looked at her fingers, trying to figure out what I meant. Oh, Blake, I commented, sighing disappointed. For someone who consumes a significant amount of pornographic material, you are a fool. She responded by scowling and rolling her eyes. The walk to the cafeteria was filled with laughter and comments at Cardin's expense, the atmosphere was relaxed and pleasant. That is. Until a male hand pulled me by the arm. I need you, was whispered in my ear. Taken by surprise, I blushed, but as soon as I calmed down, I was furious with the asshole who thought they had the right to grab me like that out of nowhere. In anger, I turned around and found the man of the moment, John Ark. I need to talk to you, he whispered again, this time close to my face. The male figure was larger, bigger than I remembered, his calloused hand held my arm firmly without hurting me. Has he always been this tall? Blake's photos made it clear that the guy had gained some muscles, but in person, he was more. Yummy. Young, did you hear me? John asked, releasing my arm. As soon as he let go of me, I found myself biting my lower lip and running my eyes up and down him. Despite being a little embarrassed, I had no regrets. The big sis here has been on a dry peel since initiation, and in front of me was a hunky blonde who could potentially quench my thirst. Oh, yes, of course. I replied as I composed myself. What do you want to talk about? It's a delicate matter. Could we talk somewhere else? Delicate? Just the two of us, please? John seemed to be worried. Looking to the side, I noticed a certain Australian champion watching us suspiciously. A cruel idea popped into my head. I didn't have anything against a private conversation with John, but... I could also have a little fun. No problem, you don't have to beg. It would be a huge pleasure to assist you. The last word may have come out louder than I planned, but watching the color drain from Piranikos's horrified face was priceless. I grabbed his arm and nestled it between the Merrymaker's sisters, Yara and Yelena. Without knowing the subject, I pulled John away from the teams, where we could have some privacy. Young! Where are you going? Ruby asked from inside the cafeteria. Is he building a harem? Blake, don't dash dot. Valkyrie tried to stop the comment, but it was too late. Creak. The cafeteria doors were enveloped in a black glow before being torn from their hinges. I'm starting to notice a pattern. When John shows some riz, metallic things are thrown around as if we were in a horror movie. Hmm. It must be nothing. Once we were alone away from the main building, I released his arm. Speak, lover boy, what do you need? I wanted to wrap up this conversation quickly. Even though I didn't have anything personal against John and loved to annoy Nikos, I still didn't forgive him for putting me in the friend zone. So, John said, embarrassed. 
You may have heard that Ruby has been helping me with marksmanship lessons. I nodded. It was interesting to see John so timid and awkward. Usually, he either didn't understand the situation or said absurd things to show confidence. This side of him was kind of cute. When we were practicing, Ruby told me that you trashed a bar before Beacon's school year. I widened my eyes instantly. That traitor. I'm going to set her comics on fire. No! John shouted, holding me by the shoulders. With ease, he lifted me off the ground and looked at me seriously. You're not going to do anything to her. His voice was heavy and full of authority, and his hands were tightly gripping my shoulders. I had no doubt I could escape from him, but... There was a part of me that didn't want to. Just as suddenly as it had appeared, all that seriousness disappeared from John's face. He blinked both eyes in my direction and put me back on the ground carefully, stepping back two paces. Sorry. He said, sad, unable to look me in the eyes. A relative did something similar to me a long time ago, so I got a little worked up. It's all right. I replied softly, almost whispering. What would he do to me if I broke the famous collection of movies that Team JNPR had in their dorm room? I shudder at the thought. Could you pass on the bar's contact information? That's it? I complained out loud, disappointed. No problem, I said to Ark. Thank you. The blonde said. What's up with all this drama? You're a huntsman in training, you can drink. It's just that I'm going to take Cardan there. What? I exclaimed in surprise. You're going out to drink with Vale's biggest jerk? My plan is to settle my issues with him. After your attack, this bar must have improved its security. If Carden became violent, it is probable that they can handle the situation. My brain fried instantly. What do you mean, settle? You want to be friends with Carden? John looked down and sighed heavily, as if he were stressed about something. I just don't have time for this crap. John exclaimed loudly. The statement carried a weight that didn't match the lovable goofball we all knew. I'm not going to waste my time at Beacon worrying about a ginger piece of shit who's out to get revenge on me because of his popularity. Wow! Thinking that way, Carden became even more pathetic. What's the plan? A sincere conversation. Really? I asked incredulously. Hard liquor. I turned my head to the side, scrutinizing him, trying to find something hidden in his plan. Think it through, John. Do you really believe you can deal with Carden Winchester with some drinks? Looking at me with those big blue eyes, John responded without hesitation. Wanna bet? His voice exuded confidence, and his face didn't bear the usual goofy smile, but rather a sadistic one, accompanied by a hungry look. You should show this side more often. Sure, why not? I shrugged. If you win, I'll give you a kiss on the cheek. I punctuate the sentence by pursing my lips and blowing him a kiss. I hoped to finally break through his facade, but John only widened his smile and pointed his finger at me. If you win, I will help you find the person you're looking for. I froze instantly, my mouth moved, but no sound came out. I felt a twinge of pain in my heart at the proposal. Ruby? I whispered uncertainty. He shook his head in response. Despite the relief that my younger sister hadn't betrayed me, I was still wide-eyed and overwhelmed by the surprise. After a brief period of irregular breathing, I attempted to regain my composure and finally articulated myself. H.H. -h how? I asked, stammering. I don't know this bar, but I know its reputation as a place to buy and sell information. 
John replied, relaxing his shoulders and returning to his normal self. You don't strike me as the kind of person who sells information, so you are probably there to buy it. And how did you know I was looking for someone? That was a wild guess. I guess? I shouted indignantly. Usually, people who buy information are looking for something or someone. He replied, crossing his arms and giving his usual goofy smile. So it was a 50% chance. Crunch! His ribs made a loud noise when my punch connected with Dork Knight's torso. Jesus! Are you crazy? John complained, activating his aura to begin the healing process. Sorry, it's a delicate matter, you know, like your ribs. I replied in a cold and threatening tone. Understood. But I mean it, I can help you. John said, removing his hand from his stomach and deactivating his aura. He had already healed himself? That's quite fast, even though I had only cracked his ribs. How? Yang, I'm the guy who entered Beacon with no training, has the Australian champion as a partner. And we'll never have to worry about money again since Wai Shi wants to invest in everything I've created and will create. The blonde affirmed, puffing out his chest with pride. That's only possible if I'm a well-connected guy or the luckiest idiot in the world. He concluded with a warm laugh. Still in shock, I couldn't find a reason to disagree with him. Do you think you can? I stopped speaking, hesitating for a moment. I lowered my head, trying to hide from the inquisitive blue eyes. Can John find her? And even if he has the means to find her, can I trust him? Why will you help me in exchange for a bar's contact? I asked, full of doubt and a trembling voice. Something you could find if you weren't too lazy to look more carefully at your scroll? At the end of the sentence, the accusatory tone of my voice revealed my insecurity about the situation. Actually, he said, scratching his head sheepishly. The part about laziness is true, but I also want to help you for another reason. My anger and insecurity disappeared from me, and now my mind was filled with fearful curiosity. I bet this jerk wants some kind of favor to relieve himself. A kiss won't be enough, he'll want at least a blowjob. Why do you want to help me? I asked, apprehensively. Because I can. With my right hand, I started to massage the headache that had started to appear on my forehead. Repeat. I commanded the source of the headache. Because I can, he said, shrugging. I don't understand you, John. Wasn't it enough that you put me in the friend zone, dash dot? It's not my fault. John said, raising his hands in surrendering. You offered yourself for a coffee. What? You need to value yourself more, dash dot. Crunch. Fuck. Again, why the ribs? The blonde knight was bent over once more, with his aura focused on his ribs, repairing them once more. I want to help, you crazy bitch, dash dot. Raven, I whispered to him. The person I'm looking for is Raven Branwen. John ceased his complaints as soon as I revealed whom I was looking for. He seemed to be taken aback by my response, as if he expected more resistance from me to reveal the name. I don't blame him for thinking that way, Raven is a sensitive subject, and even though I disclosed her name, I won't go into details about why I'm looking for her or my connection with her. I'm not ready to open up in that way. Your mother? How do you know? I asked, mouth agape. Your uncle, Crow Branwen, is one of the most powerful huntsmen in the kingdom. If this woman has the same last name, she must be your mother. Take a deep breath, Yang. I know you're frustrated, but use all the patience you have left not to punch his ribs again. 
I was quite surprised when I found out you were related to the Queen of the Bandits. You know where she is? I screamed hysterically. John stepped back as if my shout had hurt his ears. The exact location, no, but I know the region in Mistral where she operates with the rest of her tribe of Thebes. A tribe of Thebes? My mother leads a gang? John raised his hand and, using his semblance, materialized a wanted poster of my mother. Without ceremony, I took the poster from his hand. Black hair, red eyes, a sword, and a sour expression. I had no doubts, it was her. She looked just like the photo of Team STRQ, only older and grumpier. As the image dissipated, I brought my right hand back to my forehead and resumed massaging the headache, which was even more intense now. Why did you say all that? What will you do if you lose the bet? Simple, he replied, puffing up his chest. I won't. Professor Ajbin. The setting sun's light streamed into my office as my greatest hope and my greatest fear sat across from me, sharing a cup of coffee. I suppose it is an exaggeration to say that, the greatest threat to humanity was still the Queen of the Grim, who is not only immortal but also the most powerful magic user in all of Remnant. I know that young people have better things to do on a Friday night than talk to an old professor like me. I said, trying to break the silence in a friendly manner. Most young people weren't conscripted into a secret war by a millennial old wizard. John replied in a sarcastic tone. It was good to know that despite his jokes and relaxed demeanor, John Ark was aware of his responsibilities. From my drawer, I retrieved a file and opened it on the table. John examined the papers and then looked at me with a raised eyebrow, curious about their content. This is Professor Goodwich's report and some observations from Professor Port on your performance during your first month. John took a deep breath, as if he was feeling uncertain. On the first day of private training, Peter mentioned that you were someone who had led a sedentary life, and Glinda noted that you had deplorable control of your aura and that it was more fragile than usual. Yes, John replied somberly and emotionlessly, looking down. Glinda said that my aura was absorbing between 57% and 62% of what it should. On the first day, I had the impression that Mr. Ark was a proud and self-assured young man, given that he held knowledge of Remnant's future in the palm of his hand and knew my greatest secrets. That's why I was surprised when Peter and Glinda's reports informed me that the boy was insecure, anxious, and self-critical to a degree that was damaging to his morale. To correct this, you did nothing but train during your first month at Beacon, I commented, smiling at him. But I think this comment wouldn't be 100% accurate. John's doubtful gaze was replaced by surprise as I turned the page in the file. On both pages, I had clippings of headlines from prestigious newspapers and tabloids from Vale and Atlas. Heiress of the SDC spotted in a romantic meeting with possible fiancé? Scandal, billionaire heiress caught in a romantic encounter. $50,000 reward for a photo of Weishni with her fiancé. Marriage between the Atlas heiress and the Vale Huntsman? White and gold. A young blonde man is going to marry Weishni? By the way, congratulations on your engagement. I added, staring at the surprised young man. Oh, no. John complained aloud. His tone was trembling and filled with regret. Perhaps the young man valued his privacy and anonymity more than I thought. Weiss is going to kill me. Hmm. I grumbled unintentionally. What's the problem? The problem is that I'm not engaged to Weiss, he exclaimed, throwing his hands up in despair. We're not even dating, let alone planning a wedding. I couldn't help but burst into a low chuckle at the young huntsman's situation. I'm sure Mishni will handle the situation with great calm and maturity. Are we talking about the same girl who almost marched to your office to force you to make her leader? 
Let's change the subject. Thank you, John muttered, sliding down a bit in his chair. I would rather not keep the young man in my office all night, I had noticed he had a tendency to reveal secrets when angered. Besides commending you for your efforts in catching up with your peers during the first month, I'd like to inform you that our three targets have been spotted at Haven Academy. In response, John sat up straight in his chair and stared at me with seriousness and an otherworldly intensity. There he was, the young man who had revealed all my secrets while demanding his own. Is Crow keeping an eye on them? Yes. I replied, bringing my cup to my lips, before continuing. And don't worry, Crow is my top agent, and even Salem has no idea of his infiltration abilities. As soon as I finished speaking, I took a long sip of coffee while waiting for the young man's response. Are you talking about his ability to turn into a bird? Puff. Taken by surprise, I spit out the hot coffee, but at least I was quick enough to cover my mouth and prevent it from staining the important documents on the table. The downside was that my hand and clothes were now covered in coffee. How? I'm not going to reveal it yet, but I recommend keeping an eye on Headmaster Leonardo Lionheart, he's a traitor who will send many huntsmen to their deaths in the near future. The frustration and exhaustion from Mr. Ark's secrets were already getting on my nerves. Hmm. I mused, realizing that I was a bit of a hypocrite. Do you think Salem is already in contact with him? Likely. A grim seer, hidden in a closet in his office, will be proof of that. I glanced at my cup and pondered for a moment about adding whiskey to my drink whenever I scheduled meetings with Mr. Ark. While I would be eternally grateful if everything he said was true and could be avoided, it was still stressful to have these bombshells dropped on me so directly. Is there anything else you'd like to discuss, or can I go now? Any future events you can share with me? Hmm, John murmured, scratching his neck. How long until the forever fall excursion? Four days. How long until students from the other schools start arriving? Two weeks. All right, John murmured with his eyes closed. Blake will reveal herself as a faunus to her team at some point during these two weeks. This was not news to me, the Belladonna name was well known in political circles, even when it had nothing to do with menagerie. This will create a lot of friction within Team RWBY, but it's essential for their growth as a team. Once she disappears, I'll need you to come up with a good excuse for my absence. May I know why? I am very close to Ruby and Weiss, so it makes nonsense if I don't get involved. Strange, usually close friends want to get involved when there's internal conflict like this. Maybe Mr. Ark is a coward. They need to resolve this between themselves. It will strengthen their friendship. Through this conflict, they will grow closer. I breathed a sigh of relief at the young Ark's response. It wasn't that he was trying to avoid other people's problems. He wanted them to learn from the conflict and grow as individuals. I'll provide an alibi for your absence. But I recommend not staying in Beacon, maybe leaving Vale would be a good idea. Don't worry, I'm going far away. The young man's response was punctuated by a smile that sent shivers down my spine. Anything else of interest? Tomorrow, I have my special training session with Port. Planning on taking your miracle drug after training? John's eyes widened, and he looked at me in surprise. Please, few things happen in my school without my knowledge. In response, the young man frowned at me, but decided not to antagonize me. It was a sign of maturity that I was relieved to see him display. Let's do it in a secure location, away from prying eyes. The serum has a zero percent chance of failure, he said, raising his voice. I won't question your methods, but it's better to have trusted individuals nearby in case of emergencies. Still suspicious of something, John scratched his chin in thought. 
Who are these trusted individuals? Only three, Port, Glinda and me. I'm in. John quickly replied, cutting me off. I looked at Mr. Ark, shaking my head slightly, disappointed in his behavior. Despite everything, he was still a young man made of flesh and blood. He could be persuaded with female charms. Maybe I can control him using that. I got up from my chair and escorted the young huntsman to the elevator. Have a good night, Mr. Ark, and thank you for your cooperation. Thank you, my ass, give me your corporate card. John replied, pressing the elevator button. What? I asked, surprised. I'm going to solve Carden's problem for you, the least you could do is cover my plan. Are you going to harm him physically or emotionally? I don't think so. John said uncertainly. Impatient with the young man, I decided to hand him the card. As the elevator door began to close, I remembered a matter that I should have discussed with him but had forgotten. Your father and mother are looking for you. With his mouth agape and his eyes wide, John Ark stared at me in silence as the elevator door finished closing. It was satisfying to drop such a bomb on the young man so suddenly, and perhaps he would stop doing the same to Glinda and me now that he had a taste of his own medicine. Carden Winchester Fucking hell! I grumbled, irritated. The rest of my team went out without even telling me. The worst part is that I'm not even mad at them because they could be screwed because of me. No! I yelled furiously. The blame was all on that stupid, clueless, and cowardly blonde named John Ark. Thwip! My train of thought was interrupted when something attached itself to my leg. Looking down, I saw a semi-transparent white goob sticking to my pants, stretching and pulling my leg. Who's the dumbass who did dash dot? Hey, cardiac, a cheerful and idiotic voice exclaimed. I tried to walk in his direction, but he started to pull me across the floor. Ark! I roared in anger. There he was, grinning like an idiot. I tried to get up, but John kept pulling me like a sack of potatoes. I don't have time to explain, Carden. Confused and a little panicked, I struggled and tried to regain my balance to stand up, but John was running like a madman, dragging me along the ground. Stop! Damn it! Carden, get ready for an incredible adventure! This is the John and Carden episode, yeah, he shouted, accelerating the run. John dragged me out of the academy toward the bullheads. What are you talking about? I asked. You're tearing my pants, you retard. Don't worry, I'll make you better pants. I'm going to kill you. I shouted, threatening the idiot. But he just laughed loudly like a maniac. No, you are. We're going to have our meeting, and you can't say no. John ran, laughing like a lunatic, shouting that this was the John and Carden episode over and over again. Okay, it's decided, tonight, I'm going to kill this bastard. E.A.I. Gurizada? As always, I would like to start by thanking everyone who encourages me to continue this story with expressions of gratitude. I also like to give a shout out to the people who caught the Lobo reference in the last chapter. I'm on Twitter, at AvaBR, where you can find AI artwork for my stories. To the Comments Summer's Cave Thanks for the chapter, absolutely loving this so far, hope MC will contact John's family at some point. Anyway, I am looking forward to all the training he is gonna do soon after all I am sure he can eminence and shadow this and become super broken with all his powers. Response equals, there's always one guy, who guesses something I've already written in my drafts. One eel. The hell is E.A.I. Gurizada? 
Response equals it is used to greet a group of people in a relaxed and friendly manner, often equivalent to hey folks or hi everyone in English. Gurizada is a regional term that refers to a group of people, especially young ones, in an informal and affectionate way. Ender 1227 I wonder how Neptune will react when he finds out that practically all the popular first-year girls like the same guy, John, and that he has no idea about it. Response equals thanks man, I hadn't thought of that, but now that you've mentioned it, I'm already inspired to write hilarious scenes. Random Asian 00 Carden, the arrogant ass, has finally gotten a bit righteous punishment, good for everyone else. On another note, most of the tech John creates using his semblance seems easily replicated, but the more exotic stuff like the Epstein formula would genuinely take the entirety of Atlas Science Division to decipher. Which means that the tech, if given to Atlas, could easily fall into the hands of Arthur Watts who in the show has near-complete access of Atlas systems during the fall of Beacon and could simply hand it over to Salem. Is it wise to trust them just like that? Response equals, is it wise to trust them just like that? Man hell nah. Manatharindral. Yandera Pira is great, but she's going to have to learn to share. Response equals if not, there will be a lot of crying, blood, and other bodily fluids. Pira Nikos. The sound echoed throughout the gym every time my strikes connected with the kick pad shield. Boom! Despite the sound being as strong as thunder, it had more to do with my form and technique than mere strength. Boom! Boom! Even though the equipment was meant for kicks, I used it to train punches and other types of strikes too. Punching bags usually hang on walls or even chained to the ground, becoming a static and dull target. With a shield, you could almost simulate a fight by moving, fainting, clinching, and evading advances. Boom! Damn! Complained my teammate. If you're going to hit that hard, Go punch the bag and spare me. Another good thing was that I could train Nora to read her enemy and anticipate their attacks. Sorry, Nora. I replied. But you know the importance of training in unarmed combat. The hammer slips from my hand once during training, and I'm haunted for the rest of my life. My teammate commented in a dramatic tone. It was more than once. I responded, shaking my head in disapproval. And one of those times was fighting that death stalker John took us to hunt. Hee <laughs> hee. Nora chuckled awkwardly, turning her face away, avoiding my gaze. Nora had been holding the shield for me for almost half an hour, and I hadn't started sweating yet, but it wasn't fair to take out my frustration on my teammate. Ten minutes break. Thanks said Nora, throwing herself on the ground. I reflect on my situation as I reach for the water bottle I brought. Drama aside, I always end up laughing at the jokes of my only female teammate. Drinking the refreshing liquid from the bottle, I looked at the training area. It's a gigantic gym, with a complete weightlifting gym, space for running, and six arenas for various types of fights. Yo! said a cheerful and irritating voice approaching from afar. All good, invincible girl? Young. I almost growled as I uttered her name. Oh. Sorry there, you don't like that nickname, do you, serial girl? My blood started boiling instantly. I don't like it when people call me that, but coming from her, it makes me angry in a special way. What do you want, Xiao Long? I asked sharply. Oh boy, you're sour today. You don't need to bite my head off. Yang said, giving a mischievous smile. Just because someone didn't bite you. Creak. Another steel beam bending? Nora complained aloud. This school is falling apart. Tell me about it added Yang unsuspectingly. I need to get back to my meditation exercises. 
If I keep bending beams every time I get irritated, I'll bring down Beacon before the end of the school year. You'll also like. I came here to talk to you too about your leader. What do you want to know? Dash dot. Unfortunately, we can't talk, I interjected, cutting Nora off. It doesn't make me happy to treat a friend so rudely, but it was better than helping Young try to corrupt poor John. Oh come on, Nikos, I want different perspectives on the Virgin Knight. My response was to turn my back and ignore her. The blonde frowned. However, before she could protest, Nora stood between us. Did you talk to the rest of your team? Nora inquired. Why said she wouldn't give out any confidential information about her business partner, and Ruby and Blake went out shopping. Really? Nora asked incredulously. Didn't know they were that close. Young shrugged, unconcerned, turning towards me. How about a bet between you two? Curious, I turned to my teammate. A bet? I asked, intrigued. Something like what John and Carden did this morning. You two duke it out, and the loser has to do whatever the other says. Hmm. Murmured Young, considering the idea. I wanted to decline the proposal immediately. Despite being happy with John's victory, I find it childish and a waste of time to make bets, and forcing others to do something they would rather not do is deplorable. But at the same time, I like the way you think, Valkyrie. Yang commented, smiling like a fool. A chance to put this blonde cow in her place shouldn't be wasted. But we're low on aura due to fights and training during the day, what do you suggest? How about a mano a mano without weapons or dust? Pira's already wearing gloves and foot guards, you're the only one missing. Oh, it is on, shouted Young, running to grab her gear. In a few minutes, we were stretching in a ring identical to those used in boxing matches. With closed eyes, I took a deep breath, trying to relax before the match. I was a bit apprehensive because Young had more training in unarmed combat than I did, but in my favor, I have more experience facing more competent fighters than hunter apprentices in fights like this. As we finished stretching, we didn't notice Nora positioning herself with her radiant smile, taking a breath. She stood in the middle of the ring while Young and I took opposing corners. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fight that will decide the strongest huntress of the first year. What? Surprised by the announcement, I looked around and noticed that we were attracting a small audience. Some students had stopped training to watch our fight. Damn. I thought, disheartened. The last thing I wanted in my life at Beacon was the attention I received in tournaments. A true clash of titans here and now. No breaks, no points. Just knock out. Even without a microphone and speakers, everyone around the ring could hear Nora's loud and powerful voice. In the red corner, we have the invincible girl from Argus with her dexterity and epic skills. You know her, you love her, the Mistral champion. I was caught off guard by a round of applause and cheers that erupted from the audience around the ring. Despite being in a training room, people were cheering and shouting my name, activating my champion's etiquette training. In response, I raised my right arm, posing for the audience, who began to chant my name even louder. In the yellow corner, the untamed beauty of Patch with her unyielding strength and fury has built her reputation as the fiercest student in all Beacon, the Dragoness of Vale. Yao Wa Wang Xiao Lung Instantly, Yang raised her hands to a crowd chanting her name. Image Intoxicated by the attention, Yang raised her arms, elevating the excitement of the audience. Yang's enthusiasm in response to the public applause made it clear she wasn't accustomed to this kind of setting. With a smile, I concluded that I could use this to my advantage. 
Looking around, I noticed there were more people around the ring than there had been training just a while ago. How did so many people find out and come here so quickly? I thought aloud. To the center, both of you! exclaimed Nora. The audience erupted in applause and excitement as they saw both of us ready for the fight, approaching Nora in the center of the ring. All right, I want a clean fight, no punches on the tatas or who has. Nora said in a serious tone, despite her humorous vocabulary. Okay, but why did you announce this as a competition to find out who's the best? I asked my teammate. It's just a little thing to make the fight more exciting, don't worry about it, commented Nora, trying to dodge the subject. I'm with the serial girl on this, this is just a friendly sparring match with a bet involved. Okay. Nora muttered in an annoyed tone to us. Would you prefer if I said you were fighting over a man? We both went pale instantly and shook our heads in denial. With a mischievous smile, Nora took a step back, raising her hand. When her hand descended, we moved towards each other. Yang advanced with a right punch straight towards my head. Although the punch was powerful, she had telegraphed the entire movement. Twisting my body a bit was enough to dodge the blow, taking advantage of the opening I ended up delivering a kick to her stomach in return. Humph, grumbled Yang, stepping back trying to catch her breath. Assuming a boxing-like orthodox stance with the left hand forward, she advanced this time with jabs. The punches were weaker than her first strike, but were harder to dodge due to their superior speed. Was she probing my defenses? This wasn't normal for her. Don't get me wrong, Yang has good posture and great technique with her punches, but she usually throws herself into the fight headfirst against her enemies, and when they don't yield to her attacks. She simply activates her semblance, bulldozing anyone in her way. With a high guard, I began intercepting and evading her jabs, trying to find the blonde's rhythm. Wow! We're witnessing a show of skill and power here. Pira, with her agility, evades and blocks Yang's powerful punches with little difficulty. It's a battle of experience against sheer determination. Normally, I disagree with Nora's comment, but Yang's jabs cut through the surrounding air with the weight of a direct blow from a veteran competitor in Mistral. Fearing the worst, I countered towards her head when she opened her guard. Fwack! Fuck! Murmured Yang, my attack had reached her face, but I couldn't connect with force, although the impact made a sound. First blood, shouted Nora. The Mistral champion landed the first blow of the night on the face, and the audience goes wild. In response, the audience, which seemed to have grown even larger, cheered and roared, rooting for us. It made me wonder if Nora had some sort of formal training as a showwoman. Boom! And the dragoness of Veil counters. A punch connected with my abdomen while I was distracted. He! Chuckled Yang, smiling in my direction. Irritated by her arrogance, I clenched my fists and shifted to a more aggressive stance, with my knees flexed. Are you going to take a chance, Nikos? She asked, widening her smile even further. I'm going to put an end to this game. I exclaimed furiously. Go for it, serial girl. We continued exchanging punches for a few minutes. Yang's punches were more powerful than mine, but she landed them less frequently. With my guard high and quicker punches, I started wearing down Yang's resistance. The fight had turned into a battle of attrition, if we kept this pace up, my victory was guaranteed. Even in my advantageous position, I kept my cool to avoid giving Yang another opportunity for a direct hit. Pissed, Nikos. Yang whispered in my direction with her guard up. I scowled, ignoring her, and started throwing more jabs, looking for an opening. 
Do you want to know what John came to talk to me about yesterday? Boom! A punch came out more open and heavier than I'd planned, hitting Yang's high guard, but I quickly managed to raise my guard, preventing Yang from capitalizing on my mistake. I think you know the kind of thing a boy comes to ask a girl about, he said in a mocking tone. Especially when they're alone, right? Arg! I roared furiously, advancing towards her. Boom! Taking a wide step, I lunged with a straight right punch at her closed guard and kept punching, driven by my emotions. Boom! 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 Each punch was heavier than the previous one, but each punch was also more open, sloppier and slower. Smiling, Yang advanced, crouching to evade my last punch. As I hit the air, she was already within my range. With no way to defend myself, Yan leaped, punching my chin. Bye, uh, 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 um. The punch connected with all her force and body weight. A punch that made everything go white, until my vision started darkening. A punch that knocked me out. Carden Winchester. That John, son of a bitch. First, he drags me all over Beacon, humiliating me and draining what little aura I had recovered, then he brings me to some club all beaten up where we're forced to show our aura levels at the entrance. Humph! I grumbled furiously, taking a sip of my whiskey and energy drink. The worst part is that this is actually nice, John offered to pay for the drinks, and just to mess with him, I ordered a bottle that cost over two, five hundred. In response, the idiot smiled and said it was a good idea. What I didn't know is that this clown had already paid for a table in the VIP area, and the drinks came as a courtesy. I still can't believe you're drinking such expensive whiskey with an energy drink. John commented in an accusatory tone. Fuck off. I replied curtly, taking another sip of the drink. In response, he just sighed tiredly and took a sip of his drink. That was the only good thing about this shitty gathering, until today, this idiot always got beaten up and lost with an optimistic smile. Now, the exhaustion and frustration he's been showing throughout the night were a pleasant change. You could make it easier for me, Carden, said the shield knight, mocking me. The hypocritical statement from this animal boiled my blood instantly. Easier? I asked, getting up. Because of you, I was humiliated and nearly arrested. John just leaned back in his chair, staring at me with a serious, stoic look and spoke in a dry tone. There's no need to get worked up, please calm down and sit. Calm down? This idiot wins one fight against me and already thinks he's better than me? I'm not going to do a damn thing. You don't order dash dot. Something cold and sharp touched my throat, silencing me. Paralyzed, I looked to the left and beheld the figure holding a black blade with a blood-red edge against my neck. When we entered the bar, this girl with black hair and green eyes, wearing a red dress, was at the bar talking to what seemed to be her twin sister, who had the same hairstyle and makeup but wore a white dress. Image Are we having any trouble here, Mr. Ark? Giving a tired smile, John responded to the girl. Not yet, Miltia, but thanks for keeping an eye out. She removed the blade from my neck, but staring at me, she warned. Don't cause trouble, kid. Her tone was professional and dry. I turned to face Dorky Knight, who resumed drinking as if nothing had happened. I'm serious, Carden. John commented once he finished his drink. With a thud, John placed his glass on the table and started filling it up again. Once he filled his, he filled mine too. I want to resolve our issue, put our feuds behind us, and move forward. He handed me my full glass and took a generous sip from his before continuing. And I didn't humiliate you or get you arrested, you did that to yourself. 
I lowered my head, trying to avoid his accusatory gaze. Carden, I got you out of jail, went out for drinks with you, and paid for the best table in the house with some of the finest drinks they have to offer. So what? I replied, crossing my arms and shrugging. So, I've done a lot less for girls I wanted to fuck in the ass. The frustrated blonde exclaimed. My eyes widened at the statement. Talking like this, John almost seemed like a normal guy actually, he almost seemed respectable. Since I'm not going to fuck your ass today, stop being a bitch, or I'll send you to jail, where they'll love messing with a white ginger boy like you. Humph. I grumbled, this time frustrated, taking another sip of my drink. I've made that stupid video, my reputation can't get any worse than it already is. What do you want from me? Cruelly smiling, John raised his glass as if toasting to me and said, Your friendship. Have you smoked crack? I asked incredulously. You have crack here? John asked, surprised, looking around. What are you talking about? I complained to the idiot blonde. In this kind of bar, I bet you could rent a private room with girls to get high. Wow. I know where I'll celebrate my birthday. John said, laughing at the end of the sentence. He finds it amusing to buy drugs and get hookers to have a birthday party? Maybe John Ark isn't such a bad guy after all. What's your plan for us to become friends? Spending the whole night drinking whiskey at your expense is nice, but after a while, that'll get boring. I complained, trying to get something more from the idiot blonde. Banging the empty glass against the table once again, this guy is a drinking machine, John burps, before continuing. I'll bribe you. I widened my eyes at his proposal. With what? I asked, suspicious of his intentions. How about a new weapon? Raising an eyebrow, I stared at the slightly intoxicated blonde. I'll give you a weapon identical to the executioner, only heavier and indestructible. Indestructible? I asked incredulously. Yes, and if it breaks, I'll make you a new one for free. He commented, refilling his glass once more. What do you think? He emphasized the question, extending the glass towards me, inviting me for a toast. The idea of being friends with this idiot still doesn't appeal to me, but it's a small price to pay to avoid jail and get a weapon if I just have to pretend to like him and ignore him from now on. Deal. I replied, toasting. I guess I'll drink until I'm sick at this jerk's expense. Oh my god! It's John on! shrilled a high-pitched voice behind my ear. Puff. I spat out the drink due to the shock. I turned, furious, ready to strangle the crazy person who yelled in my ear, but I was paralyzed by the sight of the two women in front of me. Image. Cherry Ray and Amethyst Shade. The one who yelled had long pink hair like bubblegum and yellow eyes. She wore a shocking pink top that barely contained her chest, while her tight black shorts accentuated her rear. The other was a sexy goth, wearing a tight purple corset that made her breasts stand out in a wonderful neckline. Her long hair, eyes, and lipstick were all purple. It was an interesting contrast between the two, an enthusiastic party girl and a dark goth, both extremely attractive. Good to see you again, Cherry. John said, standing up and receiving a hug from the beautiful woman in pink. Hello to you too, Miss Shade. In response, the goth girl made a respectful nod. A arc! I exclaimed, stuttering. Do you know these women? Of course, he knows. Shouted the girl in pink, leaving John's chest. Daddy John is always so good to us. True, despite not sharing the enthusiasm or lack of manners of my friend. The voice of the purple girl was low and lascivious, almost like she was purring. 
sulking, Cherry stuck her tongue out at her friend. I can't believe this. This loser has been in town for less than a month, and he already has two girls of this caliber throwing themselves at him? Who's your friend? Asked the girl in pink, approaching me. My heart raced when Cherry approached. She was different from all the other girls in Beacon. Her graceful stride seemed like a dance as she moved through the room. Her radiant and captivating smile was like an invitation to a world of possibilities. Near me, I caught the scent of Cherry's perfume. It smelled like bubblegum? All I know is it's a sweet and captivating fragrance, a peculiar blend that captured my attention unexpectedly. Normally, I'd find this kind of scent too sweet and cloying, but today it's my favorite. I think I know you. A lump formed in my throat as she stared at me with those beautiful golden eyes. My hands began to sweat, and I desperately tried to find a place to fix my gaze, avoiding eye contact. This had never happened to me before. I had never felt so small and awkward. For a moment, our gazes met. Cherry, with her vibrant personality, sensed my hesitation. She offered me a smile, trying to dispel any discomfort. Shade. She shouted in a shrill voice, pointing her pink-painted nail at my face. It's him. The girl in purple looked at me suspiciously, but soon her expression of doubt was replaced by one of surprise. Holy shit! She said, breaking her gothic and serious persona. I think you're right. What are they talking about? I've never seen these two in my... Could they be the ugly girls I mistreated when I was younger, and now they've become attractive? As if my life didn't already seem like a badly written high school drama. Carden! exclaimed the girl in pink, jumping into my arms. Hmm? I grunted, surprised. I got distracted for a second, and now there's a cutie in my arms. Not that I'm complaining, but an explanation would be good. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Winchester commented the girl in purple, hugging my arm, fitting it between her breasts. Another one? T.T. thanks. I replied quickly. I can't act like a loser. Hi. I whispered. Ah, so cute, said the girl hanging on my neck, resting on my arm. He's shy. The two were giggling softly, but they didn't seem to be mocking me. Were they really into me? Let me explain. Said Ark, inviting us to sit back down at the table. I had told the girls about Carden Winchester a while ago, the strongest guy in all of Beacon Academy. What? We wanted to meet you so bad. Cherry said, sitting next to me. When we found out John was having a meeting with you, we convinced him to bring you into our presence. Added Amethyst, putting a hand on my leg. That hand, so small, so soft, and so warm, pressing against my thigh. We also watched your fight, didn't we, Amethyst? My blood froze, thinking I could do well with two cuties, but there's no way they'd be interested in me after that humiliating fight. True, your strength and demeanor were formidable and intense. The last word the goth whispered in my ear, almost purring. I was very disappointed in you, John. Complained Cherry, sticking her tongue out at him. You fought like a coward. John remained calm, raising his hands in apology, but my head was spinning. Do they understand me? A smile formed on my face at that thought. Of course, they understand me, only fools didn't. It all made sense. John may have won, but the victory was mine. Finally, the world made sense again. That coward thinks strategy is better than raw strength. I commented, laughing at the blonde's stupid ideas. Seriously, John? Cherry asked, 
full of disdain for the blonde. That's so icky. Unfortunately, I have to agree with Cherry, Mr. Ark. Added Amethyst in a cold and judging tone. I thought you were a real man. Yeah. Like Carden here, wouldn't have let you have your way if that old hag hadn't gotten involved. The feeling of having my confidence restored is like a ray of sunshine after a long storm. These two amazing girls understand me, they know what I truly deserve. How they highlight my qualities, my efforts, and even those small things that I never thought would be noticed is simply incredible. These moments with them are not just about beautiful words, but also about how they make me feel. I feel like... Before finishing the thought, I open my arms and hold the girls by the shoulders, pulling each one into a hug on either side of my body. I'm Carden fucking Winchester, the main man. I unintentionally shouted, interrupting the conversation and bringing an uncomfortable silence to the table. John looked at me with surprise and concern, but Cherry Ray and Amethyst Shade, the only sane people at this table besides me, started applauding. Bravo! exclaimed Amethyst. Finally, a real man. Cherry, on the other hand, sat on my lap and started kissing my neck. I feel renewed, stronger, and more confident than before. The gratitude I have for these two girls is indescribable. Their words have an immeasurable impact on me. Exhausted, John sighed frustrated and got up. I know when I'm not wanted. Wait? Is this serious? Is he leaving? Did I really win? Don't worry about the bill, drink whatever you want with the girls. He walked out of the VIP area, dejected and defeated. Ha ha. Ark, you are an idiot. You're not a bad person, but you're no match for the big shot. Let's drink until we drop. I shouted, raising the expensive whiskey bottle. Hey, Xiong Jr. Any problem, Mr. Ark? I asked the boy approaching the bar counter. No, to tell you the truth. He whispered, sitting at the counter. Everything went according to Kikaku. Hmm? Don't worry about that, let's talk business. First, thank you for the consideration and support during these past few weeks. Know that I read all the positive comments, wishes for health, luck, and prayers that you send across all platforms to my brother. You brightened his day on one of the hottest afternoons of the year while he was hospitalized in a room without air conditioning or a fan. But to sum it up, without giving too many details, I stayed in the hospital with him, helping him with eating, going to the bathroom, and other things like administering his medication. And for those curious about why I couldn't write anything while at the hospital, I have ADHD, I mentioned this in a few chapters ago. When I write, I practically isolate myself to concentrate. In the hospital, that wasn't ideal for two reasons. One, I needed to be attentive to help my brother. Two, whenever I'm interrupted while writing, I get very stressed and nervous, and I would rather not direct that towards my brother. Once again, thank you for the consideration and the positive messages for both me and my brother. The next chapter of Multiverse Crafter will be released on December 30th, 2023. Story of what I did in the hospital to pass the time without being able to read or write. My brother bought Pokemon Shining Pearl before the accident, but he hadn't defeated Cynthia yet. In fact, he lost to her five times. So, sitting by his bedside, I did a grind to level up his Pokemon enough to, in his words, defeat that bee's Garchomp with a one-shot from my Gardevoir. It took a while because Cynthia is tough, but here is my brother's winning team. Garchomp Georgina. Rapidash, no name. Empoleon Aquaria. Lucario Mile Cyrus. Rose Raid Rita Lee. Gardevoir Frere. 
According to my brother, despite the Pokemon being males, they have female names because they are drag queens. Neat. Yan Xiaolong. Green eyes open, staring at the infirmary ceiling. Despite being confused, she tries to get up, but a throbbing pain in her head forces her to lie down again. Hold on, Pira. I say to the bedridden girl. The nurse said you shouldn't move too much. She tries to move again, but the muscle pains made her effort in vain. The Mistral champion looks to her right and gives me a lost stare. Slowly, she attempts to get up for the third time, but everything spins around her, and she lies back down on the bed. Stay down, Nikos. You're not in danger, but you still need to rest after that hit. I said say, trying to give her a friendly smile. What do you want? Asks the redhead in an irritated tone. Ish. The girl is still sour. But it's not surprising, after all, she wasn't in a good mood when I interrupted her training, and after I knocked her out, I'm the first person she sees when waking up. I guess it wasn't a good idea to ask Nora to leave us alone. I think I'll start by apologizing. Ha! Huh? said Pira, confused. It was wrong of me to tease you like that. I know you have a thing for your leader, and it wasn't cool of me to tease you. I say to her as I sat next to her on the bed. And when we made the bet, I really wanted some answers, so I fought like John. Like John? She repeats, parroting myself. Yeah, being smart and making your opponent make mistakes and taking advantage of them. I sigh, looking down before continuing. But I guess it's not a good idea to play dirty with someone I want help from, right? I chuckle awkwardly, realizing I should have thought better when I fought her in the gym. Smiling serenely, the champion looked at the ceiling, processing what I said. From the start, I knew he was intelligent and that it was only a matter of time before he had a victory. He's quite a guy, huh? I comment, relieved now that she calmed down thinking about her crush. Yes, replies the redhead, closing her eyes. A comfortable silence settled in the room as Pira took deep breaths and tried to settle into her bed. Can we have our conversation now? I ask, getting up from the bed and sitting back in the armchair beside it. Nico sighed wearily, but she nodded to me. So, I started without exactly knowing what to ask. What do you think of Ark? In response, the Mistral champion widened her eyes and regards me suspiciously. I think that's a bit broad for a question. The redhead replies questioning me. What exactly do you want to know? You'll also like. Laughing nervously, I relaxed as much as possible in the hospital chair before rephrasing the question. At first, John was just a random guy to me, a clueless idiot with zero training wanting to be a hunter, it was even hilarious to see everyone wiping the floor with him in Goodwitch's fights. Hmm. Grumbles Nikos with a stern face. Crap! It is important for me to remember what Blake told me, don't insult her husband though. Then out of nowhere, he starts improving like crazy. I know he had extra training with you and two professors, but it's still insane that he's already caught up to the rest of the class. In terms of fighting and experience, he still had a long way to go, but in physical aptitude, aura quality, and density, he was already at the level of a beacon applicant. I thought to myself, staring at the redhead. Even before his victory against Carden, it was a pain to defeat him, not just because of the shield, but his aura is huge. Raising my voice dramatically, I sat on the edge of the armchair. And that semblance combined with his big head? He could dominate the world. Unable to control herself, Pira burst into laughter instantly. In response, I crossed my arms and glared at the redhead, annoyed by her reaction. I'm serious. 
I affirm in a dry tone. That's why it's funny, replies the redhead, laughing melodiously. John Ark, evil mastermind? I shrugged in response. The same John Ark whose pants got burned when he forgot a fire dust crystal in his pocket? I began to deflate in the armchair with each of her responses. Hee hee, I forgot about that. The same John who scared off that dog that had chased Blake and then helped her out of the tree? Well. The same John who broke curfew and accepted the punishment without complaining to buy medicine for Ruby's flu? Hmm. I grumble, unable to counter her. The same John who had every right in the world to send that creep Carden Winchester to jail without anyone judging or questioning him, yet he chose to have a civil conversation with him? Okay. I exclaim, hands raised in defeat. The guy has a heart of gold. But that doesn't answer my question. Pira's laughter gradually subsides, and she wiped away a tear from the corner of her eye. From what I know about John, he's very determined when he puts his mind to something. He is kind and a good leader, despite his initial lack of skills. He might not be the strongest, fastest, or most talented, but he is relentless and inspires those around him to do their best. Sighing, I leaned back on the armchair, processing what she said. Is there something else you want to know? The redhead asks, genuinely curious. Closing my eyes and scratching my head, I contemplate asking what was really bugging me. What about you? How do you feel about him? Opening her eyes wide, Pira blushes intensely, making me regret the question immediately. Why do you ask? She inquires, her voice a bit higher than usual. Curiosity. I lie, trying not to make it weirder. The atmosphere in the infirmary suddenly became tense, making me regret asking that question. Ahem. I clear my throat, trying to change the subject. When did you start training John, and why? Realizing my attempt to divert the topic, Pira relaxes a bit and sighed, focusing her gaze on her hands. It started after the incident with Carden. John was in a bad state, and I couldn't stand seeing him like that. So, I offered to help him improve. He's a good friend, and I wanted to support him, she explains, her voice softening. So, you two are close friends? I ask, trying to keep my tone casual. Yes. Pira replies, nodding slightly. I see. I mutter, falling into a brief silence before mustering the courage to ask another question. Do you have feelings for him? I immediately regret asking, but the words had already escaped my mouth. The room fell into a heavy silence, and Pira hesitates, her cheeks turning a deeper shade of red. I... I... That's... Sorry, forget it. I quickly interject, not wanting to press further. I shouldn't have asked. No, it's okay. Pira says softly. It's just complicated. John is a good friend, and I care about him a lot. The tension in the room persists, and I feel a pang of guilt for bringing up such a sensitive topic. It's a bit awkward, isn't it? I chuckled nervously, trying to ease the atmosphere. Pira managed a faint smile. It's all right. Sometimes things get a little uncomfortable, but that's life. The awkwardness lingers, and I decide it was time to change the subject. Hey, Pira, can I ask you something else? Sure, what is it? Do you think he's too good to be true? Pira furrows her brow, pondering the question. What do you mean? It's so weird. I comment, looking at my hands. He's fun, intelligent, kind, sensitive, and to top it off, he became hot in just one month of training. Pira chuckles at me and asks. 
When he arrives, can't you help but smile at him? Pira asks, giving a sarcastic smile. Yes. I reply, pointing at her. And when he smiles back, do you feel all happy and uneasy? Exactly. I nod with a shy smile. It's like time stops for a moment and everything feels lighter. It seems like he has that effect on people. But I still don't understand what your problem is, Yang. It's just, everything seems too good to be true. Sometimes, I question if it's real or if I'm just idealizing. I mean, how can someone be so perfect? I sigh, gazing into the void for a moment. I guess it's normal to feel that way when you have romantic feelings for someone. What? I shout, jumping up from the armchair. I tried to take another step back, but I bump into the window blinds. J -j John's a ni nice guy and all that. I stammer, avoiding eye contact. But I don't have feelings or anything for the guy. Me? Yang Xiaolong, into the weakest and least popular guy at Beacon? That makes no sense at all, but my body seems to react weirdly to this idea. I feel a knot in my stomach, my hands start sweating, and my heart races for no apparent reason. Is something wrong, Yang? Pira asks, teasingly smiling at me. You're pale and sweating a lot, girl. I try to hide it, but my legs feel a bit shaky, and I get a chill down my spine whenever he's around. I find myself avoiding eye contact in fear that she'll notice how genuinely nervous I am. I'm just annoyed that you think I have feelings for that virgin. It's like my body's screaming at me to be cautious, but I just don't know what I'm protecting myself from. Humph. Pira grunts arrogantly. And here I thought I was the coward. Say what? I asked, confused. What do you mean, Nikos? I might not have confessed yet, but at least I'm not terrified of my feelings like you are. My blood boiled instantly, and I scowl at the arrogant girl on the bed. I've said it before, I'm not into John. Please, Yan. Replies Nikos in a proud tone. Not only do you have a crush on him, but you're so scared of your feelings that you came to me looking for some dirt to forget about him once and for all. Listen here, Nikos. I exclaim seriously, pointing my finger at her. You stay on your pedestal all protected in your golden cage, but I live in the real world, and I know guys like John who seem perfect are just waiting for a chance to use stupid and innocent girls. Silent and wide-eyed, Nico stares at me for a few seconds until she softened her face, looking at me with understanding and compassion. Did that happen to you? I looked down and hugged myself as unease overwhelmed my mind. Yang? Nikos calls my name, but I don't hear her. It had been so long since I thought about it. At that time, I was only thirteen, and he was almost graduating from Signal, but I still can't help feeling like a complete idiot. If Crow hadn't found me by chance when he went to drink secretly. That bastard used to say I was pretty, that he loved me. He made me feel special, but in reality, he just wanted to use me as a piece of meat to satisfy his desires. Young! A shout snaps me out of my spiral of depression, and I look at the redheads staring at me, concerned. In response, I take a deep breath, covering my face with my hands. Nothing happened, but... I swallow hard, trying to untie the knot in my throat and continue speaking. Someone I liked tried to take advantage of me a long time ago. A tense and uncomfortable silence settled in the room once again. I think it's best to leave this conversation aside and get out of here. But as soon as I got up to try to leave, I felt something grab me and pull me by the hand. I turned, surprised to see Pira pointing to the bed, asking me to sit next to her. I sat without looking at her, staring at the wall, but the invincible girl didn't give up on comforting me. 
She placed a hand on my shoulder to calm me down. I don't know what you went through or how you felt, but know that I'm happy that you're fine and the person you are today, young. I turned towards her, surprised by this mature and compassionate side of her. Even though I don't know what happened to you, my mom was tricked by someone who said he loved her. But when she became pregnant with me, the person disappeared. Pira sighs and gathers her strength to continue speaking. My grandparents wanted my mother to have an abortion, but she refused and was disowned. Wow. Giving a slightly embarrassed smile at my reaction, she continued talking. It wasn't easy for her to raise me alone, but I'm grateful for everything she did for me. That's why I worked so hard to win the Mistral tournaments, to help her with the prize money. Wow! I thought you were dash dot. Before I could continue, I was interrupted by the beep from my scroll. Who is it? Pira asked curiously. It's Ruby. I reply, opening the message. Young! We need help! Attached to the message was an image of John lying unconscious on the ground, his body covered in golden flames. Image John is dying. Hei Xiong Jr. Two hours before the picture. Any problem, Mr. Ark? I asked the boy approaching the bar. None, to tell you the truth. He whispered, sitting on the counter. Everything went according to Kikaku. Hmm? Don't worry about it, let's talk business. I eye the alcohol-smelling boy with a raised eyebrow. Are you sure? The kid finished a bottle of whiskey alone in less than twenty minutes and then asked for another to keep drinking with his friend. He might seem fine, but even with Aura, it's hard to hold it together. Yes. He says while drinking a green liquid from a glass jar he took out of his coat pocket. Don't worry about me. Shrugging, I stepped up from behind the counter and guided him to the real VIP room where the real business took place. Miltia accompanies me, a new policy for my business. Never be alone with huntsmen. Even trust fund babies that look like idiots and have more money than sense, like John Ark. When he made contact, I thought it was a joke. He wanted the two best escorts money could buy, not just beautiful, but experienced enough to fool that ginger tool. Since he didn't complain, the girls must have convinced the boy. Spending money so another guy could have good company to drink the best drinks in the house was already a big flag signaling that young Ark had money, but when he made a special order for dust. That's when I understood this kid wasn't playing around. We walk for a few minutes until we reach a large wooden door. I enter, opening the door, and gestured for the young man to come in. Thank you. John replies in a sober tone. He seemed more lucid than when he was at the bar. It must be the effect of that green liquid he drank. The VIP room was a specially chosen area for more discreet negotiations. It was a private area, completely separate from the noisy and disorganized atmosphere of the rest of the club. The environment exuded luxury and sophistication, with its walls made of dark wood, intelligent LED lamps hanging on the walls. The large wooden table in the center of the room was an imposing figure accompanied by elegant leather-finished chairs, yet comfortable. John sat at the table, and I closed the door and sat opposite him. Miltia, on the other hand, went to the safe to retrieve the merchandise. Are you aware that the prices of the girls and the whiskey are significantly cheaper than the costs of dust? John asked. Smiling confidently in my direction, the boy put his filthy feet on my Australian mahogany table. And you're not moving all this dust because you're afraid of attracting Torchwick's attention, right? The man replies. Humph. Miltia grunts as she places the merchandise on the table. Milch's bad mood was to be expected, but not because of the mention of Roman, it was because he knew about the difficulty I was having moving all this stuff. 
Do you think I'm afraid of Torchwick? I ask, glaring at him. Of course not, the guy is a genius in the art of crime, but he's still a clown. Comments the young man, laughing at the situation as if it were a childish joke. But his little associate who has the power to infiltrate anywhere is scary, you know. I had to agree, Neo was a true threat with that demeanor and willingness to kill anyone cold-blooded. But I must admit that his contractor is even scarier. H.H. How do you know? I spoke, trying not to stutter. The young man furrows his brow in response and gave me a feral smile. Can I evaluate the merchandise? I pushed both cases toward the boy, who then opened them and started examining the contents. There were a total of 20 tubes of dust in each case, each tube is enough for 10 ammunition clips. In a few moments, the boy closed the cases and stared angrily in my direction. It's fake! The boy exclaimed as he examined the last tube. What? He had examined all 40 tubes in less than three minutes? Don't fuck with me, kid. Even a dust engineer would take hours to assess this amount of dust. Ark frowned and stared at me intensely, making a knot in my stomach. I'm paying for grade 4 dust, and this crap in front of me is 3. How did this pampered prick figure it out? Listen here, kid dash dot. Thud. Listen here, you. He shouts, hitting the table. Shying. Miltia drew her weapon as he got fired and moved toward him. Smiling, I faced the boy, who would learn in the worst way that you don't mess with Hei Xiong. Bam! At least, that's what I expected until Miltia fell flat on the floor. Ugh! Groans Miltia. I stood up, worried about what had happened to her, but what really caught my attention was Milsha's body being lifted from the ground by one of her legs. What the hell is this? I ask, looking at the metal tentacle that was holding my worker's leg. Following the arm of the strange metallic limb, I noticed that it was connected to John Ark's back, from where? Another three? The mechanical arms lifted John while he stared at me intimidatingly. I hesitated for a second when I took a step back. No. John orders as one of his tentacles flew in my direction. I raised my arms to defend against the blow, but instead of hitting me, the mechanical limb coiled around my arm and pulls me forward. Bam! Damn. I groan in pain, falling face first onto the ground. I tried to prop myself up with my free arm, but the third tentacle grabbed it while the fourth ties my legs, pulling me toward my assailant. Jeez, Junior. John comments in a sad, sarcastic tone. I came here to help you get rid of all this stagnant dust using an official Beacon account. You could probably deduct some of the value from your taxes. That moron is a genius. How did I not think of that? With my vacuum on accounts, I could have made this operation look like a standard dust supply purchase, I could have earned more than 30% of the value of this transaction. You bring me this grade 3 crap and expect me to pay for it as if it were grade 4? He asks, squeezing my arms and legs. My aura flared in response to the damage. I was probably still in the green, but I couldn't break free. In this soundproof room, I couldn't call for help, he had my life in his mechanical limbs. I'll give you a discount. But please, don't hurt us. Miltia was upside down, trying to free herself by cutting the tentacle. But as soon as Ark realized what she was trying to do, he started shaking her slowly in the air. Hum? Miltia grumbled confused. Crunch! Ark slams her against the floor, as if she were a rat he wanted to kill for daring to invade his home. H.H. -h Hick Miltia whimpers as if she were about to cry, while Ark slowly brought her face close to his, upside down. Stay quiet. 
Ark says, almost whispering to her. The poor girl almost broke her neck, nodding her head in response to the boy's threat. Let's do the following. John comments as he scratches his chin in thought. I'll pay half the market value for all this grade 3 dust. The girl's fees and the bar tab will be on the house, right? I nod, accepting the 50% discount hurt my ego, but it's not like I was in a position to negotiate. The money was still good, at least 50 million lean. To me, that was huge, but for an institution like Beacon, it was a drop in the bucket. He places us on the ground while holding a tube in his hands. As soon as I stand up, I notice a strange golden mist emanating from the boy's body. It hovered in his hand until he touches one of the tubes. This is the annoying part. As soon as the boy complains, the mist engulfs the tube's contents. Red veins appears on the boy's arm, like bright fire lines, the same color as the dust he was holding. Damn! The boy groans in pain, but within seconds, the veins disappear along with the golden mist. One down, thirty-nine to go. He concluded, throwing the tube to Miltia. Even caught off guard, she managed to hold it without dropping it. Empty? She asked, wide-eyed. What? Did he consume all that dust with his semblance? As soon as he finished the second vial, he let it fall to the ground and moved on to the next. Clunk! Only when I heard the noise of the second container hitting the ground did I understand what this madman wanted to do. He's going to consume all that dust at once. Clunk! 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 Every time he absorbed one of the dust containers, bright veins jumped on his arm in the same color. It was evident from his face the pain he was feeling, but he still quickened his pace, starting to absorb dust with the other hand even before finishing the first. He ignored all the pain and discomfort, and in a few minutes, empty vials surrounded his feet. It's always difficult to go through all this pain. He complains only to look at the void but it's worth it. I know lunatics who like to feel the pain of using dust without an intermediary like weapons, but storing so much power without exploding is the first time I've seen it. With a sadistic smile on his face, the young man walked towards me, staring at me seriously. This would be the moment when Miltia would step in front of me to defend me, but poor thing was still on the ground after being smashed against the floor. John raised his right hand, pointing his index and middle fingers at me. Boom. Arg. I shouted, falling on my butt. Young Ark laughs at my reaction. Don't worry, Junior, today you tried to pull a fast one on me, but it didn't work out for you. He finishes the sentence, offering his hand to help me up. Relieved by the return of the boy's normal behavior, I accepted, but as soon as I stood up, he frowned again, staring at me. I'll come back in the near future to do business with you. Clunk! Clunk! Two tentacles dug into the ground in front of me, lifting the boy, while the others pushed me against the ceiling. I promise I won't forgive you a second time. His voice was cold and serious, as if he were making a vow rather than a threat. The mechanical limbs pressed harder against my chest, draining even more of my aura, squeezing me. Beep! Beep! Why is my scroll alert ringing? I glanced briefly at my waist where it hangs. Is my aura in the red? Thud! With a dry thud, I fell to the ground as the blonde psychopath let me go. Remember what we talked about, after all, an arc never goes back on his word. Slowly, the huntsman in training walks out of the VIP room, leaving me and Miltia behind. It was surreal. Now he has enough dust in his body to blow up a few buildings. He's a monster. Miltia whispers in a trembling and breathless voice. Poor thing, she usually doesn't accompany me in the more dangerous negotiations. 
Despite this kid's power, he still went easy on us after we tried to deceive him. I know guys with this kind of power who would have cut off a hand or two just for disrespecting them like that. Strong, well-connected, and rich. She continues in a more intense tone. So? Do you think he's single? Asks the breathless girl with starry eyes. Go take a cold shower and then come back to the bar. I'll keep a close eye on this boy. He has a lot of power for someone so young. Original point of view. Shit. 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 Why did that bald jerk try to double-cross me? I came to spend a shitload of money with him, and the asshole tried to deceive me. I could have died if it weren't for my semblance and the training with Glinda. During initiation, I spent more than 30% of my aura to create stilt men's armor. Today, I spent only 7% of my aura to make Dr. Octopus's arms. Was I influenced by the tentacles and became more violent? Yes. Was it worth intimidating and putting Junior in his place? Definitely. Especially considering how many points I have now. Multiverse crafting system. What would you like to do? Magic, 226,954 points. Aura, 93.7%. I can't contain myself and start laughing like an idiot as I leave Junior's bar. I know I promised not to do anything scandalous to attract attention, but with this many points, I'm very tempted to create artificial intelligence. Maybe I'll make Jarvis with all the blueprints of the arc reactors and armors that Tony Stark has ever created in the movies and comics. But first, there's something I've wanted to do for a while. Multiverse Crafting System This will cost 1,000 magic points. Magic, 226,954 points. Aura, 93.7%. Cheaper than I thought, make its system in a language I understand and its hardware and software compatible with this world's technology. Multiverse Crafting System This will cost 1,500 magic points. Magic, 226,954 points. Aura, 93.7%. As soon as I gave the command, the golden mist appeared in my hand, materializing the small device with a red lens that I had longed for. Image it was a Dragon Ball Scouter, with a red lens, just like Vegeta's. I waste no time and put it on immediately. As soon as the small yet powerful device was in position, I press the button. Beep! Beep! Neat! Beep! 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 Cool. Even the power level measurement sound is the same. I comment happily, fulfilling a childhood dream. That's weird, it seems like there's someone strong nearby. The sound was identical to the series, which made me thrilled and unfortunately distracted. When I turned in the arrow's direction, the scouter pointed out the power level of something emerging from the darkness. 4000 Damn! As strong as Nappa? Before I could see the owner of such power, something golden flew from the darkness toward me, wrapping around my right foot and pulling me forward. Thud! Damn it! I complain, falling on my butt, with some kind of chain tied to my foot. Watch your potty mouth, John! Said a familiar voice, coming from the darkness. Heavy and slow footsteps walked in my direction, a figure in black armor with golden details approached me. Instantly, my blood froze, and a knot formed in the pit of my stomach as I beheld my attacker. 
Her armor made of black steel plates with golden details should have been more than enough to identify who had captured me, but it was her cold, cruel blue eyes and golden hair just like mine that sent chills down my spine. Hello, John, says the cold, feminine voice hiding internal fury. My past had finally caught up with me. It's time to pay for your sins, little brother. Image E.A.I. Gurizada Dany Elrin Why ESS your back? So good man I really miss this, also glad everything is better now, Alto I'd kinda sad the next chapter will take so long I understand your circumstances, really loved Young vs. Fira. Alto I'd can't wait to see more about Blake since soon it would be her turn. Let's just hope she doesn't corrupt Ruby with filth XD. Keep the good work. Response equals Ruby reading Blake's books. Mikhail Sharon. Pira actually got knocked out? By Young of all people? But then again, she was a bit too heated and was foreman to Yang's Ollie. Well done. Response equals as you mentioned, Young One, because Pira didn't keep her composure. In a rematch, I would bet on the serial girl's victory. If that were a fair fight, Pira would surely win, despite Yang having more experience fighting unarmed than the Mistral champion. Asynchronous Texture Streaming Nice chapter. Can't wait to see how the SDC and Dustless Tech stuff works out. Response equals, I'm finishing the first arc of this story, in the interlude, I will write about that. Original Point of View it's time to pay for your crimes, little brother. Noir Arc I mumble aloud the name of my attacker. Can you tell me why this is necessary? I ask, pointing at the chain on my leg. The chain on my leg pulls me through the street, getting me closer to my older sister. I try to get up, but a boot pressed down on my chest, forcing me back to the ground. Looking up, I behold my aggressor, a blonde with short hair, cold and cruel blue eyes, and her imposing 1.95 meters, 6 feet 4 inches in American, 9 centimeters, 3.5 inches, taller than me. Image Not that I was envious of my older sister, the successful and respected veteran huntress dressed in black steel plate armor with golden details. Wielding a sword in each hand held by chains on the handle, making her look like a death knight armed with Kratos' blades of chaos. Okay, maybe I was a little jealous of her. A lump formed in my throat and my stomach begins to churn. She didn't step on me with force, but from the contact I was already at the mercy of her powerful semblance. Go home and leave me alone. I growl at her, trying to hide my anxiety. I'm a huntsman in training at Beacon Academy now. Noir looks at me with a raised eyebrow, doubting my statement. Here. I lift my scroll, displaying my student ID. I'm impressed. She says in a genuine tone. I give a smile at the first compliment I received from my older sister in this world. I even regretted all the insults I shouted at her before fleeing the Ark's house. It's truly incredible how much the quality of Beacon's applicants has fallen to the point of accepting a weakling like you. Mega bitch, gaping asshole, blonde cow, uber cunt, dyke bimbo, syphilitic dick sucker, communist dash dot. Enough. I don't know what a communist is, but that is irrelevant. Noir says, cutting off my list of insults directed at her. I will be escorting you home, where you will receive the necessary medical care. Care? Is she insinuating that I'm sick? Not knowing how to respond, I opted for my modus operandi. Fuck you. Offense and swearing. You'll also like. That's what I'm talking about, John. Noir comments in a tired tone. Since the accident, you have displayed a drastic change in behavior, including swearing and exhibiting a more aggressive demeanor than usual. Despite her formal tone, I begin to notice that she truly cared about my well-being. 
Everyone was jubilant when you recovered from your coma, but since then, you've changed so much, even father is worried about you. Despite her stoic face, her voice is filled with sadness. I'm worried about you. Wow. I muttered quietly, feeling bad. But what about this paying for your crimes thing? You mean, besides the money you stole? That money was mine. I reply indignantly. That money was for your college. She says in a dry tone. In response, I could only give a wry smile and avoid her gaze. Sighing tiredly, Noir took her foot off my chest and helped me stand up. As soon as I stood up, I took a step back, moving away from her for fear of being captured again. I admit you seem to have developed some muscles, but that doesn't matter, you're coming home with me. I say it doesn't matter what you want. I reply as I raise my voice, trying to assert myself against her. It's my life, fuck yours, I'm going nowhere. So much unnecessary vulgarity. Noor said, shaking his head. This just proves how immature and unfit you are to become a huntsman. Are you a deaf woman? I yell. That ship has already sailed Noir, I'm on beacon, I'm a team leader, go live your life and leave me the fuck alone. I curse, raising my hands to the night sky. With an irritated face, the blonde took out one of her swords and points it in my direction. The weapon's blade and chain were black as night, which suited her name, Minuit. Image. You are an arc. Her voice was filled with authority and veiled anger. The sole male heir of our lineage, you have obligations to the Ark clan. Swish. Before I could complain or curse at her again, the weapon flew from her hand. All I could see was a dark metallic blur coming towards me. Startled by the speed, I raised my hands to defend against the attack. Ha! Huh? I mutter aloud. The sword hadn't struck me, it passed by my side, wrapping me in its chain. Straight to BDSM? At least buy me dinner first. An angry vein bulged on her forehead, yet she didn't respond to my behavior. I gave my word to our father and mother that I would bring you home safely, even if I have to drag you unconscious. I was pulled to the ground, again, with a tug of the black chain. And you know very well that a arc never breaks their word. I struggled futilely on the ground, trying to force the chains, but it was in vain. Besides the metal being of high quality, the chains were reinforced by Noir's semblance. It was impossible to break them while she remained focused. To make matters worse, I had left my weapons and shield at Beacon. You haven't changed at all, Noir says in a tone filled with disgust. What? I ask, ceasing my struggling. Noir shook her head disapprovingly at me, seeming disappointed by my question. An enemy stands in front of you, and you've allowed yourself to be easily captured. Why? Because I'm your sister? Do you think I won't hurt? Ah. Uh, I murmur, speechless. I'm a specialized huntress in hunting criminals, I've killed more people than I care to remember. Could you bear a similar burden as mine? Silence was my only reply. You might have become more aggressive and foul-mouthed, but you're still an unworthy weakling who fears hurting others in combat. A strange feeling began to weigh on my conscience. What are you talking about? Your fight when fleeing from the Ark Mansion. Noir said, looking at me with shame for my actions. Ten guards were injured, some of them frozen, burned, electrocuted, or just lightly wounded. But none died. My eyes widened at my sister's draconian declaration. You think that's bad? I asked incredulously. They were just innocent men doing their job. Your point being? Her voice came out graver and more intense than before. They were standing in your way. 
such weak conduct will only result in difficulties in the life of a huntsman. B.B. But. I love you, John. She speaks with a stern tone, appearing somewhat depressed, akin to a parent who is dreading the task of reprimanding their child. But you're weak, insecure, inattentive, incompetent, and above all, a coward who lacks the courage to kill those who oppose you. Her words wound my spirit like a rain of sharp blades, but it was the next sentence that felt like a knife through my heart. You weren't born for this. The casual way she said it uttered deeply within me. The pain echoed, revisiting a memory from my previous life. You're a lazy and forgetful person. The voice in my memory possessed a friendly demeanor, infused with concern and affection, yet the words spoken still weighs heavily on me. How about something simpler and less risky? This person was worried about me, wanted the best for me, yet couldn't help but crush my dreams and hopes with every sentence. You weren't born for this. Words became a crushing weight on my shoulders. I began to question if my dreams were mere empty fantasies. A mix of emotions flooded my heart. Disappointment, pain, and an overwhelming sense of despair. Maybe she is right. Perhaps I would never achieve what I longed for. Still. Still, a spark persisted within me. Feelings of anger and hatred began to boil within me, anger toward those who didn't believe in me, against those who stood in my way, and most of all, hatred toward myself for not even trying to prove them wrong. Will I make the same mistakes even in this new life? Will I once again accept what my family, even if it's a new one, wants to impose on me? In this first week, you've already proven to be one of the best in terms of effort. Echoes Professor Port's voice in my mind. Noir reminded me of the failures of my past life. She shook my spirit, but not enough to extinguish my inner flame. Today, you've shown that creativity, versatility, and intelligence are indispensable tools in the life of a hunter. Repeats Glinda's voice deep within me. A serene smile spread across my face as I reflected on how little time it had been since I began training. Despite having much to learn, I couldn't help but feel proud of what I had already achieved in such a short time. You know, Wanichan, if you had come a few weeks ago, I probably would have gone with you without resistance. Noir opened a victorious smile at my declaration, but it was premature. However, a golden, bright mist began to envelop my body, starting from my feet and rising slowly. You need to know that no one is born a hero. My body was now covered by the bright mist, obscuring Noir's view. Meanwhile, metallic plates started covering my body, sealing me in armor. What is that, dash dot? Still constrained by the chains, I exerted force before she could finish her question, and this time, I felt the chains loosen and start to creak. How? Says my wide-eyed sister. Snap! Caught off guard by my power, Noir lost focus, and the chain snapped with a metallic crack as I stood up, taking advantage of her distraction. The mist dissipated, revealing the red and gold armor that covered me entirely. Heroes are built! My voice came out slightly robotic through the armor speakers. My chest swelled with pride, illuminating the night with the arc reactor within it. I stared at my assailant through the visor of the Iron Man Mark III armor. Image Your semblance? Noir asks for the first time, a hint of doubt in her voice. Though she couldn't see my face, I gave a half-smile, lifting my head proudly. With her black sword fallen on the ground by my side and her broken chain, Noir found herself forced to draw her other sword, white and gold, midi. Image None of this makes sense. Her voice trembles and uncertain. It was as if Noir were experiencing uncertainty about her victory for the first time in her life. What are you? Pointing both hands forward, I uttered the iconic phrase. I am Iron Man. 
From the palms of my hands, Repulsor's beams of light were unleashed, hitting my opponent squarely and rendering her unconscious, securing my escape. At least, that was what I expected to happen. What actually occurred was one minute of silence as my sister and I stared at each other. Was something supposed to happen? A confused Noir asked. I think I'm forgetting something, I murmur, disappointed. Multiverse crafting system. What would you like to do? Magic, 225,454 points. Aura, 77.2%. Taking advantage of my distraction, Noir lunged at me like a black and gold missile. Whoosh! Before I could even realize, she tackled me, holding me by the armor's face. Crackle! The visor cracked under the pressure of her force and her semblance, the metal of the helmet began to press on my skull. You're scratching my paint job, you bitch! I couldn't activate the repulsors, but I managed to break the chain. I can still use the extra strength the armor provides. Even with the cracked visor and my view partially obscured by my assailant's hand, it would be impossible to miss this close. I pulled back my arm and utilizing everything I had learned in the past month, rotating my torso to put the weight of my body and the force of my back muscles behind this haymaker. The punch went straight to her face, with all the training I had, plus the strength of the armor, landing a solid hit on her. Thud. A dull and weak thud revealed that my punch had zero effect, shattering all the confidence I had just gained. Pathetic. The scorn in her voice only heightened my despair. I guess you're just here for attention after all. You forgot something. She raises an eyebrow confused, but before she could ask anything, I threw a small, bright blue sphere that stuck to her chest plate. This plasma grenade. Boom! The sound of the explosion echoed throughout the neighborhood, and the dust lifted, covering us. I felt the impact from inside the armor, but I was shielded from the damage of the blast. However, Noir. Still pathetic. She was unscathed. Your semblance is so overpowered, not even your hair was damaged. Says the boy who creates technological armor and grenades with his semblance. Frustrated and holding me by the face, Noir lifted my encased body in the armor. I tried more punches and even kicks to free myself, but it was like punching an invisible wall of steel. She released me into the air, but before my feet touched the ground, I felt an impact on my chest that threw me away. She it! I shouted, flying and spinning through the air. Crash! I hit the wall near the parked motorcycles, leaving a hole of my proportions. It didn't hurt at all, and I didn't lose any aura, it just hurt my dignity. Something I never had much of. I got up quickly when a window popped up on the helmet visor. Structural integrity at 63%. What? After the warning, I looked down, finding a large cut in the armor just below the reactor. In some parts of the damage, I could even see my clothes. Hull compromised. Now you are talking? I ask, burning with anger but there was no response. You're the most useless AI dash dot. Mid-complaint, I realized my mistake. I made you without an AI. I brought both hands to my head, protected by the helmet. I'm an idiot. I created one of the coolest armors in fiction without the damn artificial intelligence to help me pilot it. It probably only had the basic system to help with walking and keeping the person inside protected. Clink. Clank. Heavy and metallic footsteps approached me. Although I am not inclined to indulge in your vulgar language, you are correct. Comments Noir, slowly approaching. You are never the sharpest blade in the armory. Cunt. I retort to her, getting no reaction from my sister. Multiverse crafting system. 
what would you like to do? Magic, 225,454 points. Aura, 59.2%. This damn armor also consumes more than a sugar baby with the platinum card. The golden mist of my semblance emerged once again, now removing the armor around my body. Noir stares at me, eyebrows raised, sword in her right hand, wary about my actions. The cost of the armor wasn't so significant, but it was useless without being able to use its weapons or flight. Have you given up playing with dolls, John? They're action figures, yo you. Ellen DeGeneres, evil twin. I reply, pissed out of my mind. Taking deep breaths, I start summoning metallic gauntlets onto my hands with a button within thumb's reach. The new weapons hummed as I pressed the buttons on each one. Why you're? What that toy can dash dot. Boom! The shockwave hit Noir, catching the Black Knight off guard. She hadn't prepared her defenses against a sonic attack. With her boots anchored to the ground, Noir was dragged back a few meters, leaving the asphalt marked with two lines. Even without the defense of her semblance, Noir was strong, as evidenced by her instinct and experience guiding her to deal with an unknown attack. Without giving her time to react, I activated the shocker gauntlets once more, this time I wanted a longer and more powerful attack. This time, I held the button longer, remembering that it made the bursts more powerful. Boom! The sonic explosion was ridiculously powerful compared to the previous one. A white light engulfs Noir when she received the attack. Although I was sure I had hit her, I would rather not waste the chance and kept pressing the button. The attack continued to grow, as I finally felt in control of the fight. That is, until I heard something from the gauntlet. ZZZT. What? I felt a strange tingling starting to radiate from my fist. ZZZT pop. Sparks came out from inside the gauntlets, the attack continued against Noir, but I felt something odd in my arms, almost like my bones were vibrating. Shit. The vibration started to affect me and causes me a lot of pain. Every bone in my arm seems to vibrate at a disconcerting frequency, as if they were being crushed by an invisible and relentless force. Each pulse of pain reverberates through my entire arm, making it difficult to maintain my combat stance. The intense agony threatens my strength, forcing me to cut the attack and dissipate the gauntlets. Swish! While in agony from the pain, the white and gold sword whizzed in my direction. This time aiming for my legs, Noir probably wants to break them so she can take me home more easily. I think about creating a wall or shield to defend myself, but before I can react, a red and black figure jumps in front of me, intercepting the sword. Clash! Quickly, the white chain is drawn back to the Black Knight's arm as the sword flies into her left hand. Furious, Noir glares at whoever had dared intervene between the two of us. Who do you think you are to meddle in Ark Family Matters? She snarls in fury. Immediately, I identify the figure just over five feet tall, despite her back towards me wearing weird black tight clothes, and her face covered, her scythe is too distinctive to conceal her identity. His first friend from Beacon. Shouts Ruby, dressed as a ninja, wielding crescent rose. Image. Friend. Anger and confusion paints the face of the blonde in black armor. Do you have any idea what you're doing? With a shit-eating grin smile, something I had never seen on the face of the little reaper, Ruby replied. Distracting you. Slash. A black figure cut through Noir's leg at the gap in the armor behind her knee. Despite feeling pain, the black knight refuses to fall and turns to punch her assailant. As her fist connected with her target, it dissolves into shadows. What? 
Distracted and surprised, Moore didn't notice the feminine figure that leaped over her after leaving her shadow clone behind. Landing beside Ruby, the figure also had her face covered and was dressed like a ninja, but the black cleaver in her right hand pointed out that it was Blake. Image You're also his friend? Meh. She says while shrugging. Thank you, Blake. I feel so loved. I grumble annoyed at her answer. At least this disguise is better than the ribbon. I mutter to myself, forgetting her feline hearing. Her body stiffens in response, but I didn't notice her reaction to my not-so-secret comment. I was too busy creating two new weapons, one for each hand. Both were black guns, the one in my right hand had blue details, while the one in my left hand was detailed in orange and red. This is my dearest sister, dash dot. I drawl out sarcastically. Don't worry. Blake interrupted me. We heard everything. Okay. Despite feeling oddly violated, I decide to focus on the conflict. Blake, use hit and run tactics using your semblance to escape if she grabs you, don't engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with her. She is known for depleting auras in a single attack. Understood. Ruby, don't engage in close combat with her, provide cover for Blake. But, dash dot. She tries to complain, but I cut her off immediately. She is very dangerous, I stress in a serious tone. Her semblance, tactile telekinesis, works like Professor Goodwitch's, only on what she has physical contact with. Noir, outraged by me revealing her semblance. Exposing my semblance to others? Noir seats more furious than ever. Does family mean nothing to you, John? At the moment it's a pain in the dash. Crash! Ruby and Blake jump to the side, dodging the flying sword. The impact broke the ground, leaving a small crater in its place. Is her semblance just a limited version of the professor's? Ruby asks. She doesn't have range, hence the chains, but it's probably three or even five times stronger than Goodwitch's. What? Ruby shouts. Bibi, but I've seen the professor lift pieces of concrete weighing two tons. A white glow reflected the moonlight. Noir was using Mitty in a wide arc, trying to hit us all at once. Get down! I yell at the two. Swish! We manage to duck in time, Blake runs towards Noir, who retracts the white chain to confront the ninja fauna's attack. Meanwhile, Ruby jumps onto a lamppost and switches Crescent Rose from Scythe to Sniper mode. Good thing I broke Minuet's chain, I think to myself, glancing at the black sword with its broken chain on the ground. We're only managing to dodge her long-range attacks because the white sword stands out too much at night. Bang! Crescent Rose's shot brought me back to the fight. Blake was faster than Noir, attacking with the gamble shroud and dodging the blonde swords was easy for her. However, my sister was a veteran of many battles and had experience dealing with agile targets. Making a wider arc with her scabbard in cleaver mode, Blake tries to hit behind Noir's other leg. Clang! However, an invisible wall deflected her weapon. Ugh! Blake grunted, confused, only to be grabbed by Noir. You are mine, says Noir triumphantly, holding Blake by her neck. Run or she'll kill you, I yelled desperately. Noir's fist clenched as she closed her hand, only for her target to dissolve into shadows. Blake took some distance while coughing with a hand on her throat. She 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 was really going to dash Blake's stammers, terrified with noir brutality. A bright white and sharp glow flew toward her. Blake! Ruby yells her name, trying to snap her out of it. The sword pierced the night like an albino steel missile toward the huntress apprentice. Frush! 
only for the sword to be hit by a pale blue luminous burst, encasing Mitty in a solid block of ice. Blake and Noir stared in disbelief as I lowered the blue-detailed gun and raised the other. Sizzle! The other gun's beam, actually a liquid flammable fuel that ignites upon contact with the air, hit the part of the chain that wasn't trapped in the ice, melting and severing the sword from its owner. Aarg! Noir roared in pain when the heat from the chain reached her arm, once again proving that unexpected attacks are effective against her. The three women stare at me, each reacting differently to Captain Cold and Heatwave's pistols from the Arrowverse. Image not mine. Blake was perplexed, Ruby looked like a little girl seeing a pony for the first time, and Noir was breathing furiously, consumed by hatred and disgust. Enough! Noir shouts, raising one leg and then slamming it down with all the force of her muscles, or and semblance. Crayol wash! Blake jumps away from the cracks that opened in the street, the lamp post where Ruby was positioned bent, forcing the reaper to descend, the sidewalk where I stood split up, and I also noticed some cracks in the surrounding buildings. I'll take you home, even if I have to destroy all of Vale. She charges at Blake with such force that her impulse created a crater where she had stood. Ugh. Grunts Blake as she receives the punch at maximum speed. Instinctively, Blake used her semblance to throw herself back, to disperse the energy from the punch, but the impact was so strong that she was still threw against the wall on the other side of the street. Crash! Through Blake's leg, we noticed her aura flicker and then break. With just one blow? Says Ruby in a horrified tone. Blake! Sizzle! Moved by rage, I shot fire at Noir, only to be blocked by her semblance. Damn! I say frustrated. If Noir knows the type of attack, she can protect herself from it, fire, ice, electricity, acid, impact, cuts, and explosions. Someone with a similar semblance wouldn't keep the shield activated all the time, like her. It drains a lot of aura, but Noir is an arc and we have plenty of aura. You know that I would go easy on your friends, little brother. Noir says in a sadistic tone. The blonde leaps again, this time towards my other ally. Ruby dodge. I shout, trying to alert her. She was still staring towards her teammate, Ruby only notices the danger when a large shadow envelopes her. Behind her, Noir fell with enough force from her punch to bury the little rose in a crater in the ground. Smash! Just like Blake, Ruby's aura flickers and then shatters. No! I whisper, feeling helpless. Noir walks over to Ruby's body, slowly, the Black Knight raises her boot over her skull. Stop! I shout desperately. I raise the firearm and fire at her. Sizzle! The burst of flames hit her chest squarely, the air distorts around Noir, covered in flames. The fire ceased as soon as I released the trigger, only to reveal Noir unscathed, stepping on Ruby's skull, not even a burn mark appeared on her armor. Get off her, you bitch! I yell, raising the other weapon and attacking her. Frush! The shot from the ice gun had an effect, beginning to encase Noir in a layer of ice, but in a few moments, I realized the ice wasn't touching her skin or armor. Her semblance protects her from being touched by the ice beam, leaving a bubble of air around her. Crash! Noir broke the ice that held her, opening her arms with little effort, without removing her foot from Ruby's head. Pathetic! Noir said with disgust at my attempts. Do you always rely on these toys? The weapons dissolve into golden mist. Fuck. 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 I need something that can hurt her without harming Ruby. I raised my hands as I began to materialize something similar to a futuristic-looking rifle. It has an elongated body, parts of dark gray metal, a long, 
thin barrel, and elements that look like electronic components. What is this now? Noir asks, suspicious of the weapon in my hands. Gauss rifle. I reply, squeezing the trigger. When the counter reached 99, I released the trigger, the electromagnetic magnets firing the projectile at high speed, hitting the target and exploding in a blue light, but nothing happens. Before Noir could speak, I got rid of the rifle and created something else, the weapon from the paste pot peat, and shot the glue at her. Once the female figure was covered in the liquid adhesive, I breathed a sigh of relief. Phew. But I spoke too soon. The liquid wasn't adhering to her, in fact, it started to run down her body, as if it were water, I swore of course, if the ice didn't work then why would this? Before it could fall onto Ruby and suffocate her, I dissolved everything into a golden mist. Enough! Noir shouts. I froze immediately, obeying her, afraid that she would kill Ruby, crushing her head like a grape. You've already proven to be weak, and now it's obvious that your toys are useless against me. She declares. I start thinking about using my dust. I can't create magic items with my aura, but maybe I have enough to create something truly powerful, like a noble phantasm. She's still alive, say Noir, catching my attention. But if you create something else, I'll crush her skull. I drop to my knees instantly, feeling helpless, fearing for the lives of Ruby and Blake. She smiles at me, removing her foot from Ruby. Empty your pockets. She says in a voice that is both commanding and threatening. I don't want any weapons, hidden explosives, or even a scroll when I come take take you back. My hands tremble as I empty my pockets. Desperation and fear choke my mind, as I can only think of the unconscious girls held hostage by Noir. The air is heavy and suffocating making it hard to breath, and each beat of my heart felt like a resounding drum in my ears. The uncertainty of what might happen to them tore me apart inside. I was failing to protect them. They were in this situation because of me. As I hung my head, trying to hold back the tears and control the trembling in my hands, I mentally pray any god listening for their survival. It's my fault, I think, blaming myself inwardly. If I had dealt with the theft case earlier or at least asked Ashbin to talk to the Arks, if only I thought ahead instead of just trying to get better. Noir is right, I am a complete idiot. My heart pleads for a miracle, for the hope that all this would end without more harm. Wait. Orders Noir. What's that in your hand? On the ground is my wallet, scroll, and speeder bike keys. In my hand, I hold a small glass vial. Is it poison? Noir asks with concern. My mouth opens and closes, but I can't respond to her. One last trick? Annoyance is clear on her face. And the most cowardly and dishonorable one at that. What does it do? I, I it drains aura and makes the target unconscious. I mutter to my captor. Perfect, says the Black Knight with a sadistic smile. You will use it on yourself, and if you do, I give you my word as an arc that I'll never attack your colleagues ever again. Without hesitation, I removed the metal cap and injected the blue liquid into my arm. Clink! Clank! Noir's footsteps echoes through the street as the strange liquid runs through my veins. What are your final words, little brother? I couldn't help it, I give her a big, radiant smile. You're an unbelievably stupid cunt. Equals 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 equals
This chapter took longer than I thought. I'm not used to writing fights. But I hope you guys liked, or hated, my OC, John Ark's older sister. Sim 36 Mui bien capichulo el de hoyang y pier teniendo el corazón a corazón fue la joya de este capichulo para mi. Mui bien trabajo. Response equals, thank you for the compliment, I rewrote their conversation several times, I'm glad it was well received. Ainzo zero al gown. His sister won't actually kill him, right, right? Response equals, it's just going to hurt him, a lot. Danny Elrin. Absolutely amazing man, XD. Altoa it's surprising to see this pass from Yang, it would make sense about why did the OG Yang prefer to date Blake than any other guy, not like there is any guy that was of Yang's interest. But now that MC exists here it makes sense why she is so hesitant. Also love MC's progress and Junior and Militia's reaction to MC. Also finally John's family is here, now it comes the best part, Ruby and the rest of John's love interest meets John's family, that interaction will be amazing, just a small recommendation. Make it so John has more than one mother, since in this world is normal for hunters to have a harem then it would make sense if John's dad also had a harem and that's why his family is so numerous. Response equals thank you for the kind words. The conversation between the two was something I took great care with and rewrote several times. The idea of John's father having a harem is interesting. Fuck you dad, I'll have a harem bigger than yours. Nora Vakari. Ren. I shout, opening the door. You lost the duel for our fearless leader's hand. As I entered the dimly lit room, I was taken aback by what I saw. The entire space was illuminated by candles, and a peculiarly set table caught my eye. The table showcased an interesting sight. In the center, golden pancakes with maple syrup took the spotlight. Surrounding them were crispy bacon and a variety of eggs, scrambled and poached. Is this breakfast for dinner? I murmured in surprise. Nora? I heard a male voice from the corner of the room. I turned to see Lyran, my childhood friend, emerging from the darkness in a way I had never seen before. He was donning a peculiar shirt, a chamshan, red with golden details, and it hit me right in the heart. Ah! Uh, I involuntarily sigh. Ren was already handsome, but in this traditional Australian outfit, he transformed into something delicious. The vibrant red accentuated every line of his face, making his skin seem even more radiant. The golden details added a touch of sophistication, as if he were a walking piece of art. My heart beats faster than I swing my hammer against a horde of bio wolves. Every movement of Rin was a blend of gracefulness and confidence, as if he were dancing through the room towards me. The Chamshan highlighted his strong shoulders and imposing posture, making him irresistible. I was speechless. What is this? I ask, still in disbelief. It's a surprise for you. He says shyly. I wanted to have a private talk with you. With Pira in the infirmary and John in the city with Carden, I thought it was a good opportunity. Besides surprise, I also felt nervous. I didn't know what Rin was planning, fear and anxiety were bubbling in my mind. I know this is sudden. He continues. But, I've always loved you, Nora, as a friend and a sister. I instinctively shrink back in disbelief. All this just to put me in the friend zone? I get pancakes and friend zone. With despair and depression clouding my mind, tears welled up in the corners of my eyes. But over time, I couldn't help but notice how you've grown into this beautiful and wonderful person that you are. He takes a deep breath while looking into my eyes. But I was always afraid to talk to you about it, afraid that these new feelings wouldn't be reciprocated and you would want to pull away. Now, hope returned, dispelling all the negative emotions. 
This must be the greatest emotional roller coaster I've experienced in my life. But you know me better than anyone, know that I'm not good at talking, especially about my feelings. Rin says, looking at the floor feeling embarrassed. However, in this last month at Beacon, I had the opportunity to talk to someone, and I realized it would be worse to say nothing and suffer in silence. Ren, what are you dash? I love you, Nora. He says smiling at me. Not just as a sister or a friend. I love you as the beautiful woman you are. You'll also like. I was silent for a moment, trying to process everything happening. I always had a slight, teeny tiny crush on Ren, but he never seemed to show interest in me or any other woman, or man for that matter. I... I don't know what to say. I finally reply to him. He smiles wearily at me. You don't need to say anything now. He says in a friendly tone. I just wanted you to know how I feel. He approaches me and kiss my forehead, then hugs me. Thank you for listening. Ren whispers in my ear. I return the hug, still in shock. Take all the time you need to respond. He says, patting my head. I'll be by your side as always, waiting patiently, no matter how long you need. Fuck that. I shout, pulling him by his shocking shirt and planting a big kiss on him. His eyes widened in surprise before closing gently as our lips met. Image not mine. The kiss was a whirlwind of emotions. His hands found my face, while mine firmly held onto his shirt. Each second was an explosion of feelings kept for so long, finally set free. When we finally parted, our breaths were rapid, and our eyes met in the midst of surprise and mutual understanding. The room around us seemed to have vanished, leaving only the two of us, lost at the moment we had just created. I smiled, perhaps the brightest smile I had ever given, and Rin smiled back. In the silence that followed, we realized that something had changed, something that connected us in a deeper way than ever before. Who did you talk to about your feelings? I asked, curiously. Some beacon professor or therapist? Actually, it was our fearless leader. Dot. John? I ask incredulously. Ren nods. Thank you. I say as if he could hear me. Our first child will have your name. Nora. Rin says with a shaky voice. We're too young to have kids. But we can practice. I reply, smiling and licking my lips, staring at my prey. Nora, no! Rin exclaims, retreating until he cornered himself on John's bed. Nora, yes. I whisper lustfully at him. Ruby Rose. I open my eyes slowly. My mind is foggy, and my body feels heavy. Every part of me aches. Looking around, I notice I'm lying in a small crater. One last trick? A feminine voice above me says. And the most cowardly and dishonorable one at that. What does it do? Is Noir on top of me? How? Why? What happened? I swallow all my distress and anxiety, fearing what the blonde huntress will do to me if she knows I'm awake. In the distance, I hear John's voice, but I can't make out anything. He spoke too softly for me to hear from this distance. Perfect, says the black-clad knight. You will use it on yourself, and if you do, I give you my word as an arc that I'll never attack your colleagues ever again. Wait! John will use what? Then, metallic footsteps echoed through the ruined street. Clink! Clank! Looking to the side, I see a tall woman in black armor walking away from me. What are your last words, little brother? No. 
I whisper with a raspy weak voice, but no one heard me. J. John Even with my body aching, I couldn't give up. I have to rise. I placed my hands on the ground and forced myself to stand. My muscles scream pain, but I won't give up. I focus on my friends, and with determination and feeling tingling and spasms of pain in my legs, I rose. You're an unbelievably stupid cunt. When I finally managed to stand, a wave of exhaustion washed over me. My body trembled, on the verge of falling, but I forced myself to stay firm. Hump. Snorts noir. Even if this isn't poison, it won't make a difference in the final result. I walked slowly, my legs were heavy, feeling like they were made of concrete. Every step hurt, not only in my muscles, but my bones seemed to throb with pain. What is this? Noir asks. Another cowardly trick? Before John could respond, I finally saw the two. Noir in her black plate armor with golden details was as imposing as ever, even from behind. John, on the other hand, is on fire? To be honest, John said, contemplating the small fires permeating his body. I'm more lost than a dick in your dash. Ugh. Instead of completing what would most likely be an insult to his older sister's sex life, John doubled over, clutching his stomach in agony. I watched the scene with growing concern. My first friend from Beacon had his face contorted in agony and pain, a distressing sight that made my heart ache for him. First, his lips tightened, as if trying to suppress a groan of discomfort. His tense body began to tremble as drops of cold sweat formed on his forehead. The strange scene paralyzed even Noir. John. I whisper worriedly. What did you do? He continued to show signs of distress. His body was rigid, and his face now displayed a worrying paleness. It seemed to transcend physical pain. You didn't lie? Noir asks in surprise. Maybe you still have some ounce of honor in you, little brother. Then, his eyes narrowed, and he began to breathe rapidly, as if trying to find relief. Each breath seemed like a loot effort, his agony was palpable. I felt helpless, not knowing how to help. That's when he let out a scream, a sound that echoed through with a mix of pain, anger, and power. hi a yeah. His voice echoed through the street, emanating his suffering and fury, while golden flames engulfed his body. It was as if he were channeling an inner force beyond Aura itself. He seemed to use his anger to combat his suffering. Suddenly, he rose, looking at Noir. His body muscles seemed to swell and contract with a supernatural intensity. His hair floated upward, carried by the flames. There was no doubt that I was witnessing something extraordinary. I'm not from Alabama. John shouts, consumed by fury and pain. But I'm gonna pound my sister's ass. At the end of his scream, he was panting, with sweat streaming down his face. His eyes, which moments before expressed acute pain, now shone like golden suns with an almost supernatural intensity. He seemed exhausted, but also transformed and bigger. Image Do you think you can defeat me? Noir asked, smiling savagely. No, he replied in a serious tone I had never seen him use before. I just know this hurts like hell, and there's only one way to deal with this pain. John lunged at his sister, cutting her off mid-sentence. The golden mist manifested as his right hand rose to the sky, by its size and shape, it seemed like he was creating something akin to a sword. Take it out on you. You're becoming predictable, little brother. Noir comments in an arrogant tone. A simple attack like dash dot. B R M M M M M M M M M M M M. A motor's roar echoes through the night. 
The weapon in John's hand was not a simple sword, it was a chainsaw. A chain's word? Image. Noir quickly recovered from the surprise, raising her arms to defend against the blow. Vrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Without words, I nodded in agreement, and he smiles through the pain, only to then charge at his sister, who was getting up. Both weapons had disappeared from his hands, and in their place he had a small silver cylinder with a red button. Will you show me your true power now? Blanche says, already standing, ready to receive him despite her damage to Moore. Then come, John, no more holding back. I will shatter your dreams and hopes with your bones. I want to stay and help, but his commanding voice still echoed in my mind. I dissolved into a red blur surrounded by petals, darting toward Blake with my semblance, petal burst. Please, come back to us, John. Noir Arc I find myself lying on the ground, my breathing heavy and painful after being knocked down by John's dishonorable attack. Every part of my body seems to pulsate with pain, especially my stomach, where the impact was most intense. Anger and bewilderment mix in my chest, and my wounded pride adds another layer of emotion to this turmoil. It's as if a storm of violent feelings is happening inside me. The physical pain is nothing compared to the piercing emotional wound. I look at John, my younger brother, talking to that side-wielding woman whore, with a mix of anger and disbelief. He used to be the smallest and weakest in the family, and now he is capable of knocking me down. There's a strange, almost contradictory pride that mingles with resentment. He grew up, became strong, and even though my ego is wounded, there's a part of me that silently takes pride in him. It was a mistake to underestimate your abilities, little brother. I mutter, smiling as I begin to get up. However, fury and disgust predominate. How dare you surpass me like this? How dare you challenge the hierarchy established for so long? It's a dangerous dance of emotions, standing up to gather strength to deal with this storm inside me. Looking ahead, I see John running towards me, still with his strange golden aura. Will you show me your true power now? I shout to the seemingly unarmed boy. Then come, John, no more holding back. I will shatter your dreams and hopes with your bones. Pshoshu! I knew John wasn't unarmed, he always seems to have a trick up his sleeve, but I didn't expect a stick of bright green light. Image It was as if the blade of the weapon was made of pure dust energy. Not wanting to be caught off guard again, I focused all the power of my semblance into my fists to receive the attack. KKSSSSHHH Even while holding the blade of light, I could still partially feel its heat. Smiling, John withdrew the blade and returned with a sequence of strikes against my fists. KKSSSSHHH. Wum. KKSSSSHHH. Wum. Exchanging blows, I noticed that the green light blade was weightless, so no strength was required to use it, at least John wasn't using it. As we continued to fight, probing each other's defenses, I noticed something strange in the way John was fighting. He seemed more focused, not striking blindly. His eyes were analyzing me, searching for openings. Did that serum affect his mind as well as his body? I thought amidst the fight. With each blow, he seems to improve. I need to change the rhythm of this fight. I stomp the ground, cracking the concrete, trying to unbalance John. Crack! But he jumps backward and assumes a defensive stance. Quick reaction. His reflexes seemed better than before, was it the effect of the liquid in his veins? But it won't be enough to defeat me. Hmm. He grunts at me, drawing another light blade, this time blue. The reason for your downfall, pride will be, Yen Padawan, after all I have the physical and moral high ground. I frown, impatient with his banter and mildly confused. Moral? No such thing in this world of bloody evolution, only the strong and the weak. High ground. We are standing on level ground. We charge towards each other and immediately spring into action. 
I throw a punch at John, but he blocks it with his dust-powered saber. Then, he attacks me with a thrust, but I used my fist to block. The fight continued for a while, and we were evenly matched. John's lightsabers were too dangerous for me to test my shield at a lower capacity, and he was beginning to parry my punches with more precision. We were mutually attacking with full force, but John's facial expressions indicated that he was suffering from the effects of whatever he injected himself with. It was frustrating. I know I was stronger than John, but he was surprising me with his speed and adaptability. Are you tired? John asked, chuckling quietly. I ignore him and kept fighting, not indulging him in mid-fight banter, an underhand tactic to distract your foe. I had to win, not just for myself to I had to bring the sole male heir home, not only my personal honor but the family's honor is at stake. The fight continues for a few more minutes, and then I see an opportunity. John attacked me with a dual set of thrusts, and I used my semblance to block it. But instead of stepping back, I used my strength to push him backward. Surprised, John slides back. Victory is mine. I exclaim confidently. Not wanting to miss the opportunity pushing him back, I quickly approach him, preparing to punch his face as he fell to the ground. But John, showing a dexterity not seen up to that point in the fight, rolls backward instead of falling to the ground, taking advantage of the kinetic energy from my push to move away from me, leaving me to punch the ground where his head should have been. Don't look down. Unable to control myself, I looked down. What tube is th- dash dot? Bam! The explosion of light and sound whitened my vision and also robbed me of my hearing, leaving a high-pitched ringing in its place. Jiao Wu Ni! I scream in anger. It takes a while for my vision to return to normal, I notice that half of the street is covered in a thick golden fog, hiding everything in that area. Are you going to use something big now? I shout at the smoke curtain in front of me. Give me your best shot. I'm more arc. I fear nothing and no one. I raise my guard, and after almost five minutes of waiting, the curtain began to dissipate, revealing. Nothing? I question disbelievingly. I looked around, and the two whores had also disappeared. I stand alone in the middle of the street, looking at the place where John and his compatriots were moments ago. I couldn't believe what had just happened. He fooled me? I mutter in shock at how that weakling managed to deceive me. John fought against me, using dishonorable and cowardly tactics just to buy time and then run away? The worst part is that I fell for it. I murmur in disbelief, running my hand through my sweat-soaked hair. What else could happen to me? A siren caught my attention, as if it had been summoned by my question. W-E-E-O W-E-E-O Freeze! Shouts a new masculine voice. Veil police? I wonder when I look around. I am surrounded by five cars. I could easily slaughter them all and avoid the veil bureaucracy, but such an act would bring dishonor to the Ark Clan. I slowly raise my hands to the sky, sighing tiredly. I give you my word that I will take you to our father, even if it's the last thing I do. Blake Belladonna I wake up abruptly, eyes blinking to adjust to the light. Ruby is staring at me with concern, her expression mixed with relief and anxiety. Blake! Ruby shouts on top of me with her unmistakable hyper voice, forcing me to sit. The green bean worked. I want to ask her about this so-called green bean, feeling an urge to talk about putting strange things in people's mouths, but remembering our dire situation and jumping to my feet. Where's Noir? I ask, looking around anxiously. What happened to John? So. 
Ruby told me of the events that had transpired while I was unconscious, and they confirmed a terrible suspicion of mine. Noir Darksteel is John Ark's older sister. Even Adam avoids places where she was active. Feared for her ruthlessness, she treads a bloody path, dedicating herself to a dark career of relentlessly hunting human and faunus criminals alike. Whether they have awakened Aura or not it matters not both meet the end of her blade. Missions completed by her are remembered for ending with piles of corpses and grim accounts of her brutal actions. The Valish version of Winter Schnee, but without the public scrutiny of being a Schnee allowing her to commit any measure she deems necessary to complete her mission. When I heard John's sister's name, I thought it was just a coincidence, maybe the name Noir was common in his home region, but now I have no doubts. John is related to a monster amongst monsters. Blake, are you okay? Ruby asks, her voice laden with concern. I realize that my thoughts were visible on my face. Ruby had tried to read my expression and come to a grim conclusion, but I just nodded, processing the newly discovered truth. Where is the dash? Before I could finish the question, I was interrupted by a strange engine roar. Zoom W H E E N. From a distance, a strange vehicle approached rapidly. It looked like a floating motorcycle, but the speed was abnormal. John! Ruby shouts, jumping with joy. I know John has a flying motorcycle, but why is he glowing? Vush! Get on! He says, his commanding voice brooking our argument, pulling up beside us. As I watch him pilot the flying motorcycle, I can't help but notice. At the beginning of the school year, John was a mystery, and easily the worst student in our year. If it weren't for his powerful semblance and the luck of having the Mistral champion as his partner, he probably wouldn't have passed the initiation. But when I found out that two Beacon teachers were instructing him in private lessons, I decided to investigate him further. During the first few days, I couldn't get anything concrete, so I shared pictures of his training on the Academy forums to see if it generated any buzz. Maybe some student would recognize him and share information that could shed light on this mystery. I admit I should have stopped when nothing came to light, but he still intrigued me. His training with Professor Port, the way his muscles developed, his body sweating, stretching, and training caught my attention. Proof that I'm not the only one is the comments from other girls and some boys on the forum making more lascivious comments about John and Professor Port. Comments that inspired me to create art about a possible relationship between the two. But this John in front of me was different. John, usually smiling and cheerful, his face twisted in pain making it look like a someone is wearing a grim mask made out of John's flesh. He had transformed before my eyes from a happy-go-lucky boy toy grim warrior that reminded me the Huntress Dark Steel is his sister. The muscles, outlined even under the torn and blood-stained clothes, gave him a wild imposing disposition I had never noticed. John, what happened? Dash dot. Ruby begins, only to be interrupted. Now! John shouts as an order. Ruby, and I flinch from his tone. I jump behind him and hug him. His back is large and muscular, like warm, finely crafted marble. The smell of sweat initially bothers me, but I end up getting used to it and the strange heat of the golden flames. It was so comfortable that I inadvertently purred. PRRR. Fortunately, Ruby's choked wine drowns out my sound. Yip! John had lost patience and grabbed Ruby by the collar, sitting her in front of him. Hold on! He says, pressing the accelerator of the vehicle. Zoom! I hold on, expecting the wind resistance to throw us back, but I was surprised when I felt nothing. It was as if there were an invisible shield around the vehicle, protecting us from air friction. We flew in silence, the only noise was John's powerful engine of his bike. In a few minutes, we would reach Beacon. 
When we spot the school in the distance after the emerald forest, John sighs tiredly and said something to us. Sorry for yelling at you too. Hmm? I murmured to the blonde. It wasn't cool for me to yell at you. But circumstance called for fast action and you weren't moving fast enough. Don't worry about it. I replied with a shrug. We needed to leave quickly, you were right. Ruby said, sitting in front of him, clinging to the motorcycle so as not to rub against John's front. It wasn't just about noir. John said in a somber tone. I think I'm dying. What? Ruby and I shouted together. The fire doesn't burn me, but pulls me apart. I feel my muscles being torn to shreds, hot needles piercing my cracking bones, my eyes burn, and headaches. I can hear the beats of my heart, it is beating so fast I couldn't count it if I tried. John. Ruby whimpers. Before healing Ruby, I ate one of the beans trying to heal myself. My body and aura returned to normal, but the pain didn't stop, in fact, it seems to have only intensified like an exponential slope of pain. I am only conscious due to the use of my aura. Silence was the only response Ruby and I could give him. But don't worry, I double you will. John says, putting his hand to his head, trying to finish his sentence. I I will dash dot. John slumos forward, leaning his body on Ruby. John! Ruby screams, turning to the blonde, falling on her. As she took John's body, instead of taking control of the vehicle, it leaned forward, and we started to fall. We een! Jump! I shout, grabbing John and jumping off the vehicle. Boom! Using our landing strategies, we fell to the ground without losing much aura and laid the flaming body on the floor of the forest. Then, I asked Ruby to call for help while I improvised a stretcher to carry John through the Emerald Forest. The kind of thing you learn when you take part in a guerrilla group. Young! We need help! Ruby shouts desperately into her scroll. Maybe it wasn't a good idea to let the most stressed of the two of us make the call. John is dying. Next time, I'll make the call. Huntsman Logs, Entry Headmaster Ajpin. Name, Noir Arc. Alias, Dark Steel. Allegiance, Arc Family, Kingdom of Vale. Weapon, Midi Minuet. Stats Strength Endurance Agility Fighting skill Mental Aura Semblance Noir Arc is of the newest generation of huntsmen, unlike her peers she has been exposed to the horrors of our trade and as such has developed little to no empathy for those that stray from the straight and narrow. Her father and the council have seen fit to place into the Executor Corps, huntsmen hunting down prey far more dangerous to the kingdoms than the Grimm. Traitors, criminals, terrorists, and bandits have all met their end on her blade. Like most arcs, she is incredibly proficient in killing her body, count quickly reaching that of a senior huntsman. Her first year out of Beacon was apprenticed underneath Crow Branwen, and between the two of them crushed the bandits plaguing her homeland. Crow has recommended to bring into the fold after she has matured a bit much like his recommendations for the others in the Executor Corps. The only matter of her loyalty I can find in question is that her armor is of unknown make, her brother denies making it, his exact words were. As if that crazy bitch needs help killing people, don't tell her I said that, Dash. Are you recording me? The only person to my knowledge to make such alloys was the late Dr. Merlot, and the Ark seemed to protect their secrets behind seven keys. Something that I can relate to. E.A.I. Gurizada? One of the first versions of the fight between John and his siblings had John winning using the Saint's Rodildo bat, but the tone of the fight was too serious for something like that. 
So, respecting the serious tone of the fight, we went with a Jedi Super Scion. So, Huntsman Logs was my editor's idea, what do you guys think of it? Let me know in the comments if you're interested in seeing entries for other characters. I love the comments about Noir, we had people who love to hate her and people who genuinely hate that she exists and had the nerve to almost kill little Ruby. PJSCH So the arcs are BS with semblances? Response equals if the arc doesn't have a BS semblance, his aura reserve makes it BS. Sonica. Always good to see another Pathfinder 1 e enjoyer, though if John is able to make anything from Pathfinder, he really needs to power game harder. A custom magic item that applies constant haste is only 120,000 gold. Response equals Pathfinder 1e is definitely one of my favorite systems and the first one that I reached level 20 as a player and GM. GM was level 2010 in fact, if you played Wrath of the Righteous you know why. Pain Lover 792 How many points would it take for him to create a devil fruit? Or better yet, could he recreate bloodline limits from Naruto? Response equals on chapter 12, John saw that a Mara Mara no Mi would cost 500,000 magic points. Bloodline limits from Naruto would be tricky, but he would need to make something from Orochimaru research I think. Sim 36, fue una buena secuencia de battle y trajo muchas emociones de frustración por lo fácil que noir contraresta to do lo que le mandan pero era obvio si su trabajo es el de cazar cazadores. Mui bien capichulo y espero ver que tipo de relation tendrán John y noir más adelante. Response equals, thanks for the comment, noir will be back, but it will take some time for that to happen. Tracone Charlie. I'm sorry, but I think you made her to strong honesty with how that fight went, it feels like she could storm Salem's castle and beat the shit out of her, all of that did practically nothing to her unless you do some fuckery that serum shouldn't matter. Response equals she is certainly powerful, I made her inspired by Hazel and Glinda herself. I think I got the idea of tactile telekinesis from the 90s Superboy, but I don't remember it with 100% accuracy, it's been 20 years since I read those comics, f-u-c-k, I'm so old. Her semblance is powerful, but drains a lot, however arcs have a greater reserve than most people, which makes the semblance viable in overpowering enemies in short battles. A large group fighting trying to extend the battle, using hit-and-run tactics, could overpower her. But for that, you would need a capable leader and the knowledge that Noir is coming for you. Salem has a huge army and is a capable battle planner and the strongest magic user on the setting that is also immortal. Purgator Freaking amazing man. Curious about the ninja outfits though, but I'm sure there is a perfectly logical explanation, lol. I know it's hard to create those characters that we love to hate, but I think you did a decent job with this one. Response equals, we can only pray for Ruby's soul, there is a chance that she is reading filth now. Original point of view My eyes slowly open, vision still blurry as I try to comprehend what happened. Feeling a bit lost, I realize I'm in an unfamiliar bed. As noble as your intentions may have been, it doesn't justify the destruction of an entire street. The firm and unmistakable voice of Professor Goodwitch delivering a lecture pierces my foggy consciousness, as if I'm emerging from a distant dream. With each of her words, the veil of confusion lifts a little more. Not to mention, you were wandering around the city after curfew without notifying the administration. Dot. The lecture fills my ears. My mind tries to piece together the puzzle as reality unfolds. Is Professor Goodwitch reprimanding Blake and Ruby for getting into the fight with my older sister? I rise slowly, feeling the temporary weakness that set in after fainting. Wait. I speak with my weak and raspy voice. John? Ruby murmurs with concern. With a clear view, I notice I'm in Beacon's infirmary. It's still night, but is it the same day? What time is it? 
I ask with a slightly improved voice. It's 2 a.m. on Saturday, Mr. Ark. Glinda says in a stern tone that conceals concern. The teacher in front of me is not alone, behind her is Headmaster Ajban with his steaming cup, at the foot of my bed are Ruby and Blake, and on the other side are Young and Pira. I'm glad you're conscious, Mr. Ark, but you'll be under observation in the infirmary. Aura exhaustion is a serious matter. You could have died. Multiverse crafting system. What would you like to make? Magic, 219.454 points. Aura, 0, 0, 0 percent. She's right, I'm exhausted. And I spent 2,000 MP for each senza bean, kind of expensive for a consumable item, but their healing makes it worth it. I'd like to think about on what I'm going to spend this MP, but I think it's better to help those who helped me first. Sorry to interrupt, Professor Goodwitch. My respectful tone and keeping my promise to address her as a professor in front of others brought a smile to her lips, though she was still clearly not pleased with the situation. Blake and Ruby only joined in the destruction after I was attacked by Noir. So they have no responsibility for the destruction since they were assisting a fellow Beacon student. If you've gathered testimonies or have access to the security cameras at the scene, it will also become clear that the primary and perhaps only active party responsible for the material damages was Noir Arc. Everyone stared at me in silence, as if witnessing something abnormal. As for the curfew violation, it's attributed to the extent of the fight. And while someone may argue that this argument is invalid, I would like to request the transfer of the punishment to myself. You'll also like. Once again, my response was silence. Why is that, Mr. Ark? Asks the director. I won't stand for people being punished for helping me. Why would I punish them for helping you in your time of need? No, I am punishing them for other reasons such as why they were dressed up as if they were about to embark on an espionage mission. The uncomfortable silence lingered for a few more seconds until Ajban cleared his throat into his hand, drawing everyone's attention. Mr. Ark your punishment will come and will be separate from Ms. Belladonna's and Ms. Rose's their punishment shall be served with Ms. Goodwitch for now I let you rest, says Ajban, leading everyone out of the room. But tomorrow, I'll speak with him alone to determine his punishment. Speak now, I'm awake. But not alone. The director says, pointing to a bed beside mine as he leaves the room. To my surprise, Rin was in the bed next to me, with his torso and groin in a cast. What happened to you? He took a deep breath and answered without looking me in the eyes. A manly tear glistens in his eye. I broke my pelvis and ribs when I fell down the stairs. You should be proud, Ren, I said to him in a tone of infinite wisdom. Few survive a night of SNU SNU. Shut up, John. Did Nora hammer you all night? I'm serious, stop. She may have a hammer, but were you the one who nailed her? This is my last warning, stop, or you will regret it. You had a heart of stone, but I'm sure after she hammered your groin, that was sorted out. We fucked on your bed. You what? Weiss Schnee. I know it was late, but there was still a matters to address. I think I am entitled to ask, what got into you three today, you fools? I asked my teammates sitting in front of me. Sorry, bestie. John and even the headmaster cleared me. What did I do? Ruby is looking down, feeling guilty, Blake pretends she did nothing wrong knowing her, she might actually believe it, and Yan looks at me confused, not understanding my question. Why did a friendly sparring end with the Mistral champion unconscious in the infirmary? Because I'm awesome. Yan replies with a mischievous smile. I face palm at the reckless girl that will face the wrath of all invincible girl fans on her social media. 
Can I also know why you two were dressed as risque ninjas? Risque? What does that mean? Blake said they were professional spy outfits. Maybe a professional sex worker, dash dot. Quiet, Xiao Long. I retorted, pointing my finger at the blonde. You may not be a stalker, but I talked to Pira, and she told me you were gathering information about John too. Red-haired snitch. Yan complained, crossing her arms. Initially, my attention to John Ark was entirely pragmatic. His intellect and remarkable abilities were the features that initially caught my attention. It was evident that he possessed extraordinary potential with his inventions. In my world, where excellence is a requirement, his skills set him apart notably. However, conversing, debating, planning, and other professional interactions gave me the chance to get to know him better. I noticed a subtle shift in my perception of him. The intellectual interest began to transform into something deeper, something that, I admit, was not so easy to analyze or control. Not that I loved the dorky knight, but marriage to John would give me a permanent contract with him. Despite appearing as a cheerful fool, he was also very intelligent, good company for conversation, helped me confront my father, trusted me without ulterior motives, and every day he became more muscular and sexy dash. Secure I meant to say he is more secure and confident, if a bit naive. But now I realize I'm not alone in my assessment of his qualities. Pira Nikos was no surprise. The champion had a crush on him since the first day of school. As for my leader, Ruby Rose, she seemed to be suffering from her first crush, whether it will be something concrete or just a teenage puppy love, no one can say. Young and Blake are now unknowns. I know Young got accidentally rejected by the knight, but it was clear that it was all a misunderstanding, even though Blake liked to use the incident as fodder for jokes. Maybe Young had never been rejected in her life, and when John rejected her, she developed feelings for him? Or maybe she just wanted to conquer John to later reject him? Whatever Yang's situation is, it's certainly less confusing than Blake having romantic feelings for him. The two have never exchanged more than a few words, and at most, they hang out when we have lunch or class together. And there's also the second-year bunny Faunus that John saved with his stink bomb. Love rivals emerged in such a short time, if I had been faster, I could have secured John in an exclusive engagement contract. Joining a harem may be an option, but I am the Shni heiress. I cannot simply be just another in a group of women thirsty for one man. This realization, in a way, challenges my own sense of control. The competition for John's affection, something I had never imagined facing, brought with it a whirlwind of unknown emotions. It's intriguing how the lines between pragmatism and emotion become blurred when it comes to matters of the heart. Perhaps, in this complicated game of emotions, I can learn something about myself. In my defense, just because an outfit is sexy doesn't mean it doesn't have other uses. Shut up, Blake. We all said at the same time. Glinda Goodwitch. When Professor Oshman mentioned a private conversation with John, I thought it would take place in his office. She stabilized, but each day her condition worsens. Ajban said in a serious tone. We were in the underground area in front of the fall maiden, Amber, who was resting in a life support tube. I have 100% effective methods to heal her body and aura, tested yesterday in the battle against Noir, but the damage to her soul complicates her situation. John comments, analyzing Amber. However, the body, aura, and soul are intimately intertwined in each individual. If one of them is healed, it's not surprising if the other is positively affected. The city repairs had already been paid for by the Ark family, after all, we had testimonies and security camera videos proving that Noir was the main culprit for the material damage. The first to attack, and she even committed the crime of trying to apprehend a Vale citizen without a warrant or a reward on the target's head. 
still considering it concerned a hunter dynasty all it was swept under the rug. An interesting hypothesis, Mr. Ark, but since we have no empirical studies on the specific nature of the soul, I cannot say it's a solid theory. Added the director. Knowledge in remnant is limited to aura and semblances. John explained to us that the golden flames during the fight were the result of applying his super soldier serum. He's not sure why there were effects of fire, pain, and aura drain. But with Professor Ajban, they concluded that his aura interpreted the changes the serum was causing in his body as the effects of a poison. And the two battled within his body. When his aura had been completely depleted, the serum finished its work. According to John, despite the side effects, he felt that the serum was a success. He was stronger and faster than before. In yesterday's fight against his sister, he even felt a difference in the speed at which his brain processed information. How will you proceed with the treatment? John doesn't immediately answer Ashbin. He stares at Amber in silence, lost in his thoughts. I'll use the Senzabeam first. Yesterday, it healed the physical and aura of me and the girls. Even if it doesn't repair her soul, it will make her stronger for my other attempts. Other attempts? I asked aloud. I'm not absolutely sure what I'm doing here. John says in a melancholic tone, approaching Amber's capsule. But I give you my arc word. As long as I'm here, no one dies. While Ashbin began the procedure to open Amber's capsule, I couldn't help but notice the change the young man had undergone in just a month since I met him. He's almost like an entirely different person from initiation. He has always been an enigma with a strangely powerful semblance, combined with abundant aura and knowledge about the future that he refuses to clarify how he obtained. I had every reason in the world to be suspicious of him, but today I couldn't think ill of the young man. Not because I think he would be a great ally in our war against Salem, it was for a more selfish reason. Although I have never felt belittled or underestimated, from the beginning, it was evident that John made a point of proclaiming to everyone the importance of my role as a huntress, a teacher, an ally, and I think I can also say as a friend. I walked up to Professor Ashbin as the door of the capsule began to open. How much dust did you give him today? I asked curiously, looking at the dozens of empty boxes stacked in the corner of the room. Enough to power Beacon's electrical grid for over two years. With wide eyes and an open mouth, I stared at the headmaster incredulously. Yes, Glinda. I gave a student over 25 million lean worth of dust, said the professor as if it were nothing. Don't even ask how much he spent yesterday with the academy's official card. And here I was thinking he would be punished. Don't worry, Ajbin said, sipping from his mug. He will be punished. Lie, Ren. After John healed me using his green bean, I thought I would spend my Saturday alone with Nora. Perhaps we could talk more about our feelings while enjoying a delicious jasmine tea. Spill it, you pajama ninja! exclaims Yang, pointing her finger at my face. We have testimony that you've been talking to John Ark about girls. Presently, I was sitting on the floor surrounded by women. Most young men my age would find my position enviable, but I say that as a man in a serious relationship, this is quite uncomfortable. Sorry, Rennie, I couldn't control myself, said the witness who testified against me, unable to look me in the eyes. I was so happy that I ended up telling everything that happened yesterday. Everything? I ask, concerned. Almost everything, replies Nora. Nora pouted, looking downcast. I knew she didn't do it purposely, and she didn't know this would be the consequence. You don't need to apologize, Nora. Immediately, she raised her head, giving me that beautiful smile of hers. Your happiness was simply overflowing, and you couldn't help it. I know that happens easily with you, but that's one of the many reasons I love you. Aya, Ren. 
Nora tried to jump in my direction, but Blake stands in her way, shaking her head negatively. Listen, Rin. Says Yang, trying to calm everyone down. Everyone here is happy for both of you. Very happy! Exclaims Ruby. Congratulations to both of you. Comments, Pira. I have nothing but praises for the new couple. Added Weiss. I didn't think that was possible outside of books. Notes Blake. But yesterday, I went mano a mano with the serial girl to get more information about the Dork Knight. Ruby and Blake stalked the guy to a bar just to get nothing, and they almost died at the hands of his psycho of an elder sister. I still don't understand what this has to do with me exactly. Except for Nora, they all frown at me with irritation, to my surprise, even Ruby. Ren, my dear teammate, said Pira, putting a hand on my shoulder and squeezing it tightly. Do you want us to deal with the frustration of getting nothing on you? Gulp. I swallow hard when threatened under those intense and slightly insane eyes of my teammate. What do you want to know? I ask, wanting to get this over with. This proves to be a mistake, as they all started talking at the same time. Is he into me? What does he think about buff girls? Does he know what pegging is? What's his opinion on puppies and cookies? How offended would he be to have to sign a prenuptial agreement? I took a deep breath trying my mind sane amid the barrage of questions uttered simultaneously. How about I tell you what I know about him, then you can ask the questions. One at a time. They all agreed and surrounded me to hear me clearly. John Ark is a young, heterosexual male who is interested in romantic and sexual relationships with women. No do, retorts Young. I frowned, staring at her, and she caught the hint, falling silent, lowering her head in regret and shame. He doesn't have a specific type of girl he prefers, but he definitely finds all of you beautiful. I turned my head to my girlfriend in a more secluded corner. You too, Nora. But he confirmed that he won't pursue anything with you because, in his words, I'm not a tolerico. The relief on everyone's faces was evident, even Blake, who of all people shouldn't have a reason to be interested in John, was smiling for a change. He knows that a harem is a possibility in the Vale Kingdom, but he doesn't feel comfortable with that alternative. All had different reactions to my last statement, but none of them seemed positive. He wants a vanilla relationship? Blake asked indignantly at my declaration. Who would have thought that Ark was a romantic? Weiss commented with a mischievous smile. Not necessarily. I said, encouraging some of them to come a bit closer with curiosity stamped on their faces. John is not actively seeking a harem, but he wouldn't be against having one. He thinks harems just happen, like in Blake's filthy books? Ruby asked. Blake! Young exclaimed irritably. What have you done to my precious and innocent little sister? She appreciates art now. Then the members of Team RWBY engaged in what seemed like a typical argument among themselves about who was right and who was to blame. Pira, in turn, acted as a mediator and stopped the fight to continue my interrogation. He feels bad about not being capable of corresponding the expectations of the harem, almost as if he were guilty of taking advantage or even abusing the women who are part of it. That's why he won't actively pursue one. That's bullshit, says Blake. If everyone is an adult, knows the conditions, and gives consent, there's no problem at all. Wow! Blake defends polygamy? Now you just need to have positive opinions about voyeurism. Young comments in a sarcastic tone. I'm not a voyeur. Blake shouts, offended and embarrassed. Pervert say swat. What? Wait, no! 
Yan just shakes her head in disbelief at her partner's response. Trying to avoid another argument, I decide to keep talking. The only thing you need to know is that John holds a special affection for each one of you. Even me? questions Blake suspiciously. He said he has something special saved for you, just don't ask me what it is because I don't know. Blake took a step back, passing a hand over the ribbon on her head, breathing rapidly. I decided to continue, even with her reaction. At the moment, he said he's focused on other things. He can't date until after the beacon dance, which happens a few days before the vital festival. Why? Weiss asks. I don't know either. Although they hadn't gotten all their answers, they seemed happy with what they had heard. I stood up and extended my hand to Nora, who took it and pulls me, skipping to the door. But before leaving, I turned to them with one more answer. And about pegging. All, except Ruby, froze and stared at me with wide eyes. John never talked about it, but he said that if it's with a woman he likes, he'll try anything at least once. P-R-R-R-R. Purred Blake with a lascivious smile. What is pegging? Ruby asks. I'll explain when you're forty years old, Young replies. Amber Stone. Since that damn attack, my life has turned into constant agony, a torture that extends with every breath. Here I am, confined to this life support tube, witnessing my own decay. Each day is a lost battle, and the pain has become an unrelenting shadow that refuses to leave me. Weakness is my new self, an oppressive presence that infiltrates every aspect of my life. The few minutes I spend awake feel like every movement is a superhuman effort, and even blinking seems to require more energy than I can muster. Every breath feels harder than the last, as if the air is escaping me, reluctant to prolong my agonizing existence. Fainting has become my only respite, a fleeting pause from the cruel reality. However, even in these brief moments, I find no relief. Each faint is a journey into the unknown, a free fall into an abyss that only amplifies my distress and the fear that I won't wake up anymore. Amber, can you hear me? A voice echoes in my subconscious, bringing me back to reality. Please, Amber. You need to be strong. With monumental effort, I open my eyes and see a blurry figure speaking to me. I know you're weak, but I need you to swallow this that I'm putting in your mouth. The blurry owner of the male voice plays something in my mouth between my teeth. He seemed to know I was too weak to eat solids on my own, so he gently used his hands on my jaw to help me chew the strange seed he had given me. Crack! After breaking the seed, it became easier to chew the rest, and I swallowed it without difficulty. The effort to break the small seed was enough to exhaust me. I could already feel my mind being taken over by fatigue when something strange exploded inside me. It was as if a bomb of distilled energy had exploded in my stomach and then spread throughout my body. A miracle! There's no other word to describe what I feel after eating that strange seed. A surge of life runs through every cell in my body, dissipating the pain that was slowly consuming me. The relief I am feeling now is overwhelming, almost palpable, as if a heavy fog had lifted, revealing a new world before me. Every breath is now invigorating, as if the air filling my lungs carries a renewed vital energy. I look at my hands and see strength, a strength that I had forgotten I possessed. Tears roll from my eyes, not from pain, but from relief. It's as if I emerged from an endless nightmare to find an oasis of healing. My muscles, once frail, are now full of vigor, and the weakness that was chaining me has disappeared, leaving behind a renewed version of myself. My now clear vision reveals a blonde boy smiling in front of me, the one who offered me the seed is now an angel of flesh and blood in my life. I look at him with teary eyes and a choked voice as I try to express the magnitude of my gratitude. Thank you. 
I murmur, but the words seem inadequate in the face of the miracle he triggered. Original Point of View Not that I'm averse to having a girl hugging me tightly and whispering in my neck, but the crying and the onlookers make this situation very uncomfortable. It's good to see you healthy again, Miss Stone. Says Zajbin approaching. Thanks to my enhanced perception from the Super Soldier Serum, I could notice all of Amber's body language change with the director's presence. Her hands on my neck start to sweat, her pupils dilate, her facial expression tenses, the muscles of her arms and legs that were touching me contract, and with her chest pressed against me, I could hear and feel her heartbeat had accelerated. I extended my hand and stopping Ashbin before he could get any closer. Turning to Amber, I whisper, any problems? Before I was attacked, I wasn't getting along with him. She says in a weak and tearful voice. That's enough to be afraid of him? I mentally question. There must be more to it. Amber. As soon as I mention her name, she looks at me relieved. I need you to get back into the tube and as if by magic, all the relief disappears, and the fear comes back. I'm not sure if you're cured, we need another diagnostic. Now depressed, the brunette lowers her head and enters the machine. Ish, I didn't want to depress her that much. I guarantee you that after today, you won't need to get into that tube again. Okay. She mutters lowly, not trusting my promise. I feel like a dad who said no to his daughter wanting a puppy. The machine containing Amber was truly fascinating, a machine for aura transfer with the capabilities of keeping someone in suspended animation and diagnosing the person's body and aura in 30 minutes. After the diagnosis, Ashbin needed a few more minutes reading the medical record in silence before explaining Amber's situation. It's as we feared. Ashbin comments in a low voice, so Amber couldn't hear from inside the tube. You restored her physical body and aura, but they continue to deteriorate slowly. Open the tube again. Ashbin looks at me with concern. Your treatment has already proven effective in extending her life and relieving her pain. I stare at him with a raised eyebrow, but the director ignores me and continues speaking. You've done enough. John. We already know the identity of who attacked Amber, and we are monitoring her. It's just a matter of time until we neutralize Cinderfall and recover the maiden's power. I turned, facing the director. Two things, Ajbin. First, Cinder is a treacherous snake, much slipperier than you think. Every bit of help is needed to deal with that pyromaniac bitch. And the second? I have a certain familiarity with creatures capable of draining the vitality of their prey, similar to what Cinder did to Amber. Are you talking about a Grim? Ajbin asked. No. When the creature I'm talking about drains the vitality of its prey, you can only recover it in a very specific and costly way. I reply, looking at the director. You provide supplements to the individual, do exercises to increase their vigor, and compensate for the weakness caused by the drain, but without the correct treatment, the person is left with that missing piece forever. Fascinating. The surprised professor commented. And do you know the treatment? Yes. Multiverse crafting system. What would you like to make? Magic. 344.454 points. Aura, 0, 0, 0 0.00%. With all these points, I could create an artifact to destroy Salem once and for all, but I still don't feel 100% comfortable with my body post serum. After we neutralize Cinder's team, I'll build my power to destroy that millennial old crazy witch. But let's take it step by step, first, cure Amber once and for all. Cinder drained the powers of the Fall Maiden using a Grim. In the original series, it seemed something similar to drain effects of level or attribute from a creature akin to a succubus in RPGs like Pathfinder 1E or Dandy 3.5. 
How much does it cost to make a restoration scroll? Multiverse crafting system. It will cost 1.000 magic points. Magic, 344.454 points. Aura, 0, 0,0,0%. A consumable 1.000 points cheaper than a god's bean? Doesn't seem right. I know the effect only removes negative conditions instead of healing, but it still seems too cheap. Wait! I exclaimed aloud, unconsciously. Make a restoration potion. Multiverse crafting system. It will cost 2.000 magic points. Magic, 344.454 points. Aura, 0, 0, 0 percent. Phew, almost made a mistake. Scrolls can only be activated by spellcasters with knowledge of magic or someone trained to use magical items. Since I'm neither, I would be dependent on Oshbin if he had the power to use it. With the mental command, I'm drained of magic points, and a vial with silver liquid appears in my hand. Ember finds the item's manifestation in my hand strange, but I simply smile at her and nod, handing her the vial. Even though she's apprehensive, the half-maiden doesn't hesitate and drinks the potion. As soon as she finishes ingesting the liquid, a gentle glow envelopes her dark skin and the scars begin to disappear. Her eyes reflect surprise and gratitude for each mark now erased, revealing the pure and renewed beauty of her skin. Don't move, Miss Stone. We'll run another round of tests to make sure said Ajbin, approaching the machine. While they run the tests, I'll take advantage of being literally in a secret hideout underground and create a few things. MCS. On. I said aloud, unable to contain my excitement. The golden mist begins to emerge, enveloping me in a radiant aura. But this time, it's different. This mist is more intense, more vibrant than ever. I feel the pulsating energy around me, the golden light that seems to transcend the limits of everything I've ever created. It's as if the power itself residing in me is anticipating something grand. John, exclaimed Glinda trying to interrupt the process. What are you going to create? Ignoring the teacher, I focus on my power as the golden mist expands, forming a luminous halo around me. Each particle shines like stars on a clear night, the symphony of light seems to echo with the promise of something extraordinary about to happen. Maybe we should wait for Director Oshbin to finish Miss Stone's examination. Use magic. John! Shouts Glinda when the intense golden light dazzles her vision. When the teacher's vision returns, she looks at me worried with the wild smile adorning my face. What did you do? She asks concerned, staring at the small object in my hands. Looking at the teacher, I respond cheerfully. Let's just say, from now on, I won't make any more mistakes. She looks back at me with a raised eyebrow, suspicious of my statement. Okay. I complained in a defeated tone. 80% fewer mistakes, and 20% cooler. How do you quantify that? Despite her lack of faith in myself, I can't stop smiling, looking at the chip in my hands. Let's wreak some blue havoc. Image not mine. I no longer need to worry about creating weapons, robots, or vehicles too complex to control. Mr. Ark called the director, drawing my attention away from my mighty creation. I turned slowly to face Director Ajbin. His tired eyes met mine, and I could sense a change in his expression. His once imposing posture was now more relaxed, and there was a hint of relief in his gaze, mixed with the fatigue that seemed to carry an immeasurable weight. The wisdom and leadership skills of Beacon Academy's director were unquestionable, but now, in front of me, I could see the humanity he hides beneath his aura of authority. It was as if, for a brief moment, worries and weariness had surfaced in his countenance. 
John Ark, says Osbin, his voice calm and relieved. You've done something many couldn't have done. You saved Amber and, consequently, all of us. Once again, you've proven that your abilities and knowledge are a blessing to our cause. As he expressed his gratitude, I noticed a shadow of sadness in his eyes. As if, behind the mask of a strong and unshakable leader, there was a man carrying the burden of countless losses. Oshbin continues, his words revealing a vulnerability rarely seen. I've witnessed the deaths of many throughout my life, John. With each loss, the burden seems heavier. However, it's imperative not to desensitize ourselves. Every life lost, especially that of an ally, hurts as if it were the first. Without words to respond, I simply nodded. However, he begins, assuming his usual posture. The damage to the city was extensive, and there were witnesses to your presence at the scene. Therefore, I need to punish you in some way to maintain the appearance of impartiality. Any ideas on how to do that? I ask curiously. Miss Blake's escape is scheduled within a two-week window. If you're suspended during that time, no one will suspect that you left to force Team RWBY to resolve their internal crisis on their own. He's right, my knowledge of the future is still a secret known only to Oshbin and Goodwitch. And no one knows that I'm not from here except me. Hold on! I exclaim concerned. This way, I'll miss the excursion to forever fall. The director chuckled at my expense before speaking. It wouldn't be a punishment if you didn't suffer in some way. Despite him being right, I couldn't control myself. Fuck you, bitchy Dumbledore. Your insults used to be more creative, Mr. Ark. Now they just tire me. The audacity of this asshole. I think to myself, already planning my revenge. And it's going to be a huge show. Pira Nikos. Red leaves fall from the trees, as if time had stood still. Foreverfall is a forest with a magical air, where autumn seems to last forever. Despite being infested with grim, the landscape brings me peace and tranquility, causing me to reflect on everything I've experienced in these past few years. At first, many approached me seeking the shine of my fame as a champion, an exceptional warrior. But when I look between the shadows of the red trees, I see those who valued the true essence behind my gleaming armor and fake smiles for the cameras. However, there is a thought that hangs heavier than the autumn leaves themselves. A feeling that, like the colors of forever fall, is impossible to ignore. My thoughts turn to John Ark, my team partner. I turn to face the partner I almost lost last weekend. He was wearing his new Huntsman equipment, a black outfit made of a blend of cut-resistant and puncture-resistant fabrics. Over the fabric, reinforced white plates with golden details formed a Kevlar armor protecting his body. And in his left eye, he had a strange device with a visor for only one eye. He said he was testing the equipment and that if the results were positive, he would make it available to everyone on the team. Image in the first week at Beacon, John, with his gentle nature and determined eyes, kindled in me a warmth that transcended the seasons. As I gaze upon the trees of forever fall, I make a silent vow to myself. This year, I will confess my feelings to my partner. It's a promise made under the splendor of red leaves, a declaration echoing in the corridors of my heart like a solemn commitment. Ruer. The guttural roar echoed through the dense forest of Forever Fall, announcing the presence of an Ursa Major rising before us. Adrenaline pulsed through my veins as my shield instinctively rose, reflecting the reddish glow of the falling leaves around us. By my side, John Ark also wielded his sword and shield, assuming a similar defensive stance. Even though John is my leader, I took the initiative and fired at the monster just for John to catch up and match my pace. Our synchronized movements were like a dance choreographed by the urgency of the imminent battle. 
the Ursa Major lunged its enormous claws, seeking to tear through anything in its path. With an agile spin, I slid under one of its attacks, my shield protecting us while John advanced, slashing against the giant opponent's arm with his flaming sword. The trust between us was palpable, a connection that transcends words. While I distracted the bear with my agile movements, John seized the openings to attack with precise strikes. Each assault was a coordinated dance of individual skills interweaving perfectly. The gleam of our weapons reflected the sunlight filtered through the trees, creating a surreal scene of battle under the autumnal dome. Roar! The monster roared in pain, unable to attack now that we found our rhythm. The creature's growls were answered by the sounds of metal against its black fur like the night, a combat symphony resonating through the forest. In a moment of synchrony, our gazes met, and a brief exchanged smile amid the attacks showed the mutual trust we had developed. The battle was not just a physical challenge, but a cooperative dance, where each move complemented the other. We advanced together, combining our strengths to finally bring down the grim. R-A-R-R. -R -R. The creature snarled, falling backward. With the creature lying on its back, we jumped together and landed on the monster's body, brandishing our swords. As silence settled in the forest again, I realized that this was not only a victory over the Grim, but also proof of how, side by side, John and I were a formidable team, capable of overcoming any challenge fate presented us. Did you see that, Rennie? It looked like they were dancing, Nora exclaimed, though we could see she was covered in red sap from the trees. Great job, team. Rin just nodded in our direction. Thanks to my excellent teacher, John said, smiling and winking at me, not even breathing heavily, truly showing how far he had come along. That radiant smile, those sapphire blue eyes, that chest within the armor seems larger than last week, and more delicious too, Dash. No! I think to myself. Stop daydreaming, girl, focus. You need to talk to him about my feelings. I take a deep breath, and with my heart in my hand, I touched his arm, looking at him. John, there's something I need to dash, but in the middle of my declaration, I was interrupted. Your strength, speed, and reaction time are exceptional even when compared to trained huntsmen. But your techniques could be less, basic. A robotic voice from John's scroll at his waist speaks. John took his new white and gold scroll from his belt. As soon as the device was at the level of his chest, a holographic blue projection of a soldier wearing futuristic armor appeared. Image Effectiveness is more important than style, church. John retorts in an irritated tone. True, but it wouldn't hurt you to stop being a lazy ass and learn other fighting styles to incorporate into your mediocre one. J. John. I stammer. Drawing my partner's attention. What is this thing? The small holographic being had no expressive face, but it was evident that he was annoyed by my statement. This here is the Alpha Unit, an extremely advanced artificial intelligence, but you can call him Church. Oh, P. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Church. I address the strange being in a casual tone. Sup, says the little digital creature in an irritated tone. Don't give him too much credit, despite being a powerful AI, he's an asshole. Yeah, fuck you too. John just laughs at the insults the small being is throwing at him. John Romy Ark, yells a shrill female voice in the distance. MILF INCOMING! Church exclaims, disappearing into John's scroll. The teacher arrived levitating, propelled by her semblance. May I know what you're doing here? Smiling, I reply as if I had done nothing wrong. Just enjoying a school trip with my team. A vein poppies out on the teacher's forehead, furious at John's apparent disrespect. You are suspended for two weeks. Thus, you are banned from Beacon Academy for this time as determined by the director. 
This isn't Beacon Academy, it's the Forever Fall Forest. Professor Goodwitch widens her eyes indignantly but turns around and went back to the rest of the class. I almost forgot that you were going to be away for two weeks. Yeah, John says, looking sadly down. I had so much to talk to him about, but now he'll be absent for so long. The worst part is that it wasn't even his fault, John was just defending himself. When I find Noir Ark, I'll make her regret hurting my John. I mentally vow. Attention students, in thirty minutes, we will depart for Beacon. Says the teacher's voice coming from all students' scrolls. I have to go, P.Y.R. John says, hugging me. Even caught off guard, I managed to reciprocate his warm hug. Where are you going? I ask, not wanting to let go. To help a family. He says, pulling away from me. After saying goodbye to Nora, Ren, and Team RWBY, he walks into the forest. Worried? Nora asks, coming to my side. A little, but after he fought with Noir, he seemed different, stronger, and more mature. I have nothing to worry about. Was he carrying any luggage? Ren asks. No suitcase or even a backpack. Nora replies. Maybe I should worry a little, dash dot. I add before being cut off by a strange noise. Hi, I tie three eight. Powerful engines seem to start. Why, I -er. Look, Ren. Nora shouted, pointing in the direction of the noise. From amidst the trees, I witnessed the majestic takeoff of a strange black aircraft. Its engines roared like thunder, a thunderous sound echoing throughout the forest. The jet lifted gracefully, cutting through the air with calculated precision. Its noise turned into a hum, while my vision was filled with the image of its accelerating turbines. Image not mine. And with the sound of a sonic boom. Swoosh! The jet took off. I bet a thousand lean it was John. Everyone knows it was John, Nora, I reply tiredly to my teammate. You're handling him leaving out of nowhere better than expected. I think I'll use one of your moves with John when he comes back. Which one? Break his pelvis. Ha! Twist him like a pretzel. End of the first arc. Huntsman Logs, Entry Headmaster Ajbin. Name, Pira Nikos. Alias, Invincible Girl. Allegiance, Kingdom of Vale Kingdom of Mistral. Weapon, Milo Akuo. Semblance, Polarity, Control the Magnetism of Metallic Objects. Stats. Strength. Endurance. Agility. Fighting skill. Mental. Aura. Aura skill. Semblance. Since Miss Nikos joined Beacon Academy, she has proven on every occasion that her title is well-deserved. Her skill in spear handling and her masterful mastery of technique have not only set her apart in combat, but have also inspired her peers. Her commitment to excellence is evident in every training session and mission she undertakes. What truly defines Pira Nikos as a future huntress, however, is her ethics and compassion. She understands the true responsibility that falls on the shoulders of those who choose to follow this path. For these reasons, I considered Miss Nikos as a candidate for the next Fall Maiden. However, John interjected in my decision, his exact words were, Tell her about your Shadow War, and I'll tell Ironwood that Salem is immortal and your EX. Despite not wanting to yield to the threats of a teenager, the fact that Mr. Arkhield Amber made me agree to his request. E.A.I. Gurzada? 
Before talking about this chapter and the next ones, I would like to say that this was one of my chapters that had the most comments that makes me very happy to tell the truth I sat on the bed with my sick brother and read some of them to him. Even the ones who made jokes about Alabama. I thought it would be cancelled by American fans, but the darkest jokes came from U.S. readers. I sped up towards the end, but we managed to conclude the first arc of this FIC. My original idea was to finish with Noir's fight, but there were still some things I wanted to write in this part of the story. The next chapters will be interludes. Please leave in the comments what you would like to read first. 1. Winter and Dr. Polandina Evaluating the Material Weiss Scent 2. Noir Ark Introducing Themselves to the Patriarch of the Ark Family 3. Blake Teaches Ruby About Art 4. Coco Interrogates Velvet About Her Feelings About John Ark 5. Weiss, Pira, and Yang Having Coffee in a Girl's Talk 6. Junior and Torchwick Have a Meeting 7. Crow drinking at the bar, complaining about who made Ajpin change his mind. 8. Ruby upgrading Crescent Rose. Do you have any suggestions for what you would like to read? Leave them in the comments. I read them all, even though I don't respond to most. Apolocus. Thanks for the chapter, loved the OC you made as a sister. Response equals thanks man, I'm thinking about adding more arcs as antagonists to the story. Danny Elrin Okay first of all love the chap, glad to see more interaction between MC and Blake, I also love the background of Noir, of course I still hate her and I hope John's family realize she almost killed John and exile her and hate her for that. John is easily the most loved member of the Ark family once they found out about it, they should properly punish her and she should regret this the rest of her miserable life. By the way, what did John eat? Is he a scion now? Response equals he ate a senza bean, recovered all his aura and health, but he continued to be drained because of the conflict between the serum and his aura. He's not a scion, it was his aura burning in overclock trying to stop the serum from affecting his body. PJSCH Wow, he is using confusion as a weapon? Response equals, that's the idea, John was keeping her on her toes using different weapons. During the fight, he was using aura to create them as the idea was to try to use unpredictability as an advantage. But in the end, there was no way John could win alone against his sister, especially without a plan. Spartan 001, for the Emperor. Response equals ha. I picked this comment to salute all the Warhammer fans who spoke out in the last chapter. I played very little Warhammer, purely competitive games don't appeal to me, but I've played some RPGs and I love the lore videos on YouTube. Sim 36. Este fue un muy bien capitulo genial diria con una buena conclusión al final. Renoir Nora no me importan mucho pero que bien que no les dis largas para su relación. También me encanta el harem sobreviviente que es esta formando y la fluidez que leva, nada y esta inmediato es no que es eva de ser lando con su tiempo. Response equals, I wanted to accelerate the development of the relationship between Nora and Ren. I think the original series took a long time to work on him. And I'm grateful for the comments about the harem development site, I'm trying not to seem forced. John is trying to solve everyone's problem, so it makes sense for them to develop some kind of feelings for him, in my opinion at least that makes sense. Sleep Deprived Guy Honestly, that's a good addition to the chapter if you decide to add it to the last part of every chapters, but is it only limited to characters' information or could you add maybe their semblance capabilities and or aura proficiency? Response equals good idea, I'll add that, done. A Bunk Knight 21 I don't know if you already have John family problem planned out, but there is theory the fact John is the only male makes him valuable to carry on the family name. John left because he wanted to matter and do something other than be pampered upper-class snob. In this version of the world, I can see him being value because arc men, though rare, have tendency to have very powerful daughters. 
all of John's sisters well above the average, with a few S-class, like Noir. So John could be running from being nothing more than a pamper-prized breeding stallion who was never allowed gets to race or run in fear of injury. His sisters do care him, but his parents emphasize the fact if women learn about his breeding potential he would be taken against his will, so overprotective is an understatement. This also can cause more fun drama Pira's mom would love grandchildren of top-tier quality and movement up the social ladder. Weiss, how much would you bet her father would engage her sister Winter to marry him to create a bigger empire and powerful legacy? White Fang use him as a breeding for superior soldiers for the future and ransom and knowing Yang's mom I can see her use for the same reason and for personal fun. Response equals I love it when people theorize in the comments of the fix. But unfortunately, I won't answer your questions because I'd end up giving spoilers, but I won't change anything about Saffron Kodark, the only sister who appeared in the original series. Winter Schnee The chill of the elevator seems to intensify as it descends towards Dr. Pietro Polendina's laboratory. The journey is silent, aiding me in focusing on my thoughts that cannot escape the worries I carry. My younger sister, Weiss, sent me a message requesting an update on the evaluation of her partner's inventions, which we received a few weeks ago. As the elevator glides smoothly, my mind wanders into more conjectures. Who is John Ark, and how did he manage to persuade Weiss to get involved in his projects? Weiss's voice echoes in my mind, enthusiastically explaining the achievements of the young Ark non-lethal weapons, substances capable of defeating Grimm's by merely touching them, and energy generators independent of dust with the potential to overshadow SDC operations. The latter was inconceivable. Has my sister been seduced by empty promises without fully understanding the consequences of such declarations? As the elevator approaches the destination, I feel the need to protect her, even if it's from invisible threats. I need to assess the situation and ensure she hasn't fallen into a dangerous game. The elevator door opens, and I stride towards the doctor's laboratory, prepared to find out whether she's been deceived or not. The laboratory is a spectacle of engineering and innovation as I enter. A sense of curiosity mixed with apprehension permeates the environment. The doctor, an elderly man with bright eyes sitting in a chair with spider-like mechanical legs, greets me with a warm smile. Specialist Schnee, it's a pleasure to have you here. I would rather not take up much of your time. I know how important you are to the Atlas military. He leads me to a structure where holograms display a strange disassembled circular object with various numbers and notes floating beside it. What exactly is this? I ask, pointing to the hologram. This one is complex, so let's save it for last. He responds, chuckling. Everything your sister sent us has met what she had explained via text. He says, pressing some buttons on his chair. The holograms changed, and a list formed in front of me. 1. Stink Inc. Applicability, civil and military, Stink Inc. is a special non-lethal ammunition for deterrence operations. It consists of a highly viscous ink that, when fired, covers the target area with a foul-smelling and persistent substance. In addition to causing discomfort and repulsion, the intensity of the odor can temporarily disorient the targets, creating a tactical advantage for the military team. The bright purple color of the ink and its strong smell also make the target easier to distinguish in a crowd, aiding in search and pursuit. Not only that it marks the target for civilian targets allowing them to report said target to the authorities and or avoid the target. Research Priority Low 2. Peter Webb Applicability, civil and military, Peter Webb is non-lethal ammunition for restraining and restricting movements. When fired, this device releases a strong adhesive liquid, which can form a net, wire, or blanket that ensnares the target. This ammunition is ideal for situations where capturing individuals is necessary without causing permanent damage, being especially useful in capture and detention operations. 
you'll also like. Research Priority, Medium. 3. Foam Shackle. Applicability, civil and military, foam shackle is non-lethal ammunition for restraining movements and containing riots. Upon contact with air, it expands into a dense and sturdy foam, forming a physical barrier that impedes progression. This ammunition is effective for controlling crowds and ensuring security in critical areas without causing serious injuries. It can also be used to build covers and repair cracks. Research Priority High 4. Blind Pepper Bomb Applicability, civil and military, the blind pepper bomb is non-lethal ammunition developed to disorient and temporarily incapacitate opponents. When detonated, it releases a combination of tear gas agents and pepper, causing irritation to the eyes and respiratory tract. This ammunition is effective in crowd control situations and provides a strategic window for subsequent actions. Research Priority Low 5. Ghostbane Applicability, military, ghostbane is ammunition that affects only ethereal grims. Most grims experience mild discomfort when exposed to the substance, but nothing to the extent that would justify material implementation for the forces of Atlas. However, against ethereal grims like Geist, this substance has proven its worth. A Geist possessing physical matter exposed to the material is expelled from the inert material it is possessing. Research Priority High 6. Sunlight Bomb Applicability, military, sunlight bomb is ammunition that affects all grims exclusively. Small and young grims dissolve rapidly when near the substance, while larger and older ones have better resistance, the body part closest to the substance sustains the most damage. And when their heads come into contact, grims react as if their vision were obscured for a few seconds. Research Priority Suggestion, Maximum Goodness! I exclaimed, surprised. Two high priorities and one maximum? The last time we had one of these situations was when we were researching hard light dust. And these are just the combat ones, my dear, wait until you see the assessment of the energy matrix models. Tapping a few more buttons on his chair, the hologram changes once again, exposing a new list. 1. Solar Energy Model The solar energy model harnesses sunlight to generate electricity through photovoltaic cells. When sunlight hits these cells, it generates electric current. This electric energy can be stored in batteries for continuous use, making the solar model a clean, sustainable, and renewable energy matrix. Research Priority Suggestion Low 2. Wind Energy Model the wind energy model utilizes the force of the wind to rotate the blades of wind turbines, converting rotational motion into electrical energy. This electricity can be integrated into the grid or stored to meet energy demand. It is an efficient matrix, especially in areas with consistent winds, contributing to the diversification and sustainability of the energy supply. Research Priority Suggestion High 3. Hydraulic Energy Model Applicability as energy matrix, the hydraulic energy model is based on the conversion of water kinetic energy into electricity. Hydroelectric power plants channel the flow of water through turbines, generating rotational motion that is then converted into electricity. This matrix is highly efficient and reliable, providing a constant source of energy, besides being considered one of the oldest and established forms of renewable energy. Research Priority Medium Solar energy in Atlas isn't viable, after all, our kingdom isn't known for its sunny days. Maybe we can conduct this research jointly with Vacuo. Hydraulics is interesting, but it depends a lot on the river potential of the region, and the construction of the plant is too costly and could destroy the entire fauna and flora of an area. Not to mention the extra expenses for protection against Grimm in a location so far from our walls and army. I added. 
Precisely, now wind is a more promising idea. With our floating city, we have powerful winds in abundance. Does the wind model have the potential to replace dust? No, it couldn't replace it, but we can reduce our dust consumption by 30%. The doctor explained, smiling hopefully. A reduction of that level would make the price of dust plummet. The economic impact initially would be negative with so many people working directly and indirectly with dust, but in the long run, we'll have more jobs to build and maintain wind facilities. And with the price drop, dust would be more accessible to people who use it to defend themselves outside the major cities. Looking at the hologram reflecting on what had been presented, it would be time-consuming to implement most of the technologies Weiss sent me, but undoubtedly, they would change Atlas and possibly all remnant in a few years. I think it was a rash statement when Weiss said one of these models could replace dust as an energy source. In response, the doctor laughs warmly, as if I were a child who had just said something foolish. You are the one rushing, Specialist Schnee, I saved the best for last. Once again the hologram disappears, and this time it returns to the first hologram of the strange circular object, this time the original notes were not present but instead a text explaining what it was. Arc Reactor Energy Model Arc Reactor is an advanced energy generation device designed to provide energy efficiently. It is based on advanced principles of physics and engineering to channel a specific energy source, converting it into usable electricity. This reactor operates cleanly, without relying on traditional sources like dust. At its core, the ARC reactor employs sophisticated technologies such as controlled particle manipulation and highly efficient energy conversion processes. Its application spans various sectors, offering a sustainable and powerful alternative to growing energy demands. Its technical complexity is reflected in the precision required for its construction and maintenance, making it a key piece in technological advances. Unfortunately, it contains elements unknown, the experts necessary for this are unlikely to help having begun work on a Project Trinity in Vail. Research Priority Maximum Plus I was speechless and wide-eyed. The text was simple, but even without the technical language, I could see that the potential of this invention was monumental. One of these reactors, the size of a fist, is a perpetual energy source capable of generating 3 gigajoules per second. If we manufacture 100 of these and use them in a perfect system without energy loss, Atlas's public energy grid will never use dust again. T. That's impossible. Impossible? He continued in a more serious tone. Combine 150 and Atlas as a whole will never need dust to generate energy again, as well as never need dust to stay suspended in the air. The doctor continued his explanation as I tried to grasp the magnitude of what was being presented. We're talking about a technological revolution, Specialist Schnee, entire cities powered by clean and sustainable technology without the need to extract dust. The arc reactor not only offers an inexhaustible source of energy but also eliminates the dependence on scarce resources and the associated environmental impacts. He moved on to the next holographic projection, revealing a detailed model of a city powered by arc reactors. The lights shone, indicating the illumination of residences, industries, and transportation systems, all powered by the revolutionary invention. This is the future, Specialist Schnee. A future where energy is abundant, accessible, and doesn't harm our planet. We're still in the early stages, but imagine the potential. Every home, every street, powered by an energy source that never runs out. Not only that, think of the potential for energy weapons. I remain stunned at the futuristic vision unfolding before me. The city of tomorrow, driven by arc reactors, represents not only a scientific achievement, but also a hope for global transformation. However, one question persisted in my mind. And what about the interests and industries that depend on dust? Won't this change have significant repercussions? 
The doctor smiled, acknowledging the complexity of the situation. Change always meets resistance, Specialist Schnee. The transition will be challenging, but in the end, the energy of the future is within our reach. All thanks to the young inventor named John Ark. Who was he? Where did he come from? What else can he offer? What kind of contract does he and Weiss have to call themselves business partners? With the vital festival approaching, I will have the opportunity to visit Beacon and have a private conversation with Weiss and her partner. Noir Arc. Of all my progeny, you and your twin were the ones who brought me the most pride, at least until last Friday, said a heavy, rough male voice. Presently, I am kneeling on one knee with my head bowed before my father, Arthur Ark. Even seated on a throne carved from stone, he exuded an imposing and intimidating presence. At forty-nine years, he remains strong and resilient, a true veteran of countless battles clad in his silver-colored full-plate armor. His sturdy physique and his face marked by scars tell tales of courage and determination, while his deep blue eyes penetrate deeply, conveying authority and wisdom accumulated over the years. His blonde hair, cut short in a military style, adds an aura of discipline and order to his towering figure, while the well-groomed beard gives him a rugged air. Every feature of his face seems sculpted by experience and the harshness of life on the battlefield. As he stares at me intensely, I feel myself shrinking before his domineering presence, aware that this man is not only my father but also a feared and respected leader by all who know him. Arthur Ark is truly an intimidating figure, whose aura of strength and power envelopes everyone around him. Image Daughter, I never thought I would have to face a moment like this. I always believed you were a strong huntress, capable of overcoming any challenge. That's why I had no doubt that you would bring pride to the Ark name when I convinced the rest of the Council that you should join the Executor Corps. But now, here I am, ashamed and disappointed, Arthur Ark said, staring at me from his throne. Despite being alone with my father, his presence and authority made me feel as if I were being humiliated in public. When you set out to find your brother, I saw in you a determination that filled me with pride. I thought that, as the older sister, you would bring back your only brother, my heir. I imagined that you would be the protector, the brave leader who would guide him back to his family. He says, glaring at me. However, you failed in your mission, caused damage to the city of Vale, and tarnished the Ark name by getting arrested. My father dashed out. Silence! He roared, rising from his throne. The reinforced windows of the fortress trembled with the powerful voice of Domremy's golden lion. There is still hope for my heir to return, but alone you have shown your incompetence. I widened my eyes and looked at my father, worried. What are you going to do? I asked anxiously. I called in some favors with the Vale Council. Your sisters have been relieved of duty to form a team with you. I stood up, perplexed. But I am an elite huntress of the Executor Corps. Not anymore. He looked at me with a firm and unwavering expression. The weight of his decision echoed in the throne room, filling the air with tension. You have lost your position in the Executor Corps, my daughter. Your actions have made it clear that you are not up to the role entrusted to you. His voice, once calm, was now full of disappointment. Following Vale's traditions, you and your sisters will form Team BLCN. Your twin sister, Blanche, will take command of the team, and you will have the opportunity to redeem yourself, proving your worth and loyalty to our family. A mix of anger and sadness grew inside me, but I knew that questioning my father at that moment would only worsen the situation. But before you attempt to retrieve your brother, Team BLCN will be sent on a black ops mission. Why, father? Your actions in the city of Vale are being used as leverage to undermine our family's political powers. I clenched my fists in fury. 
As if my dishonor wasn't enough, now they use me to strip away the little power we still have? Is this the respect the corrupt council has for our noble house? Failure is not an option. My father says, gazing thoughtfully at the horizon. If you fail to bring John back, all plans for the revitalization of Domremy, in partnership with the Winchester House, will fall apart. I nodded, swallowing the mixture of emotions that threatened to overflow within me. I would rather not mix with those scum from the Winchester House, but we need their resources. In silence, I rose and left the throne room. As soon as I took two steps in the corridor, I came face to face with the rule princess herself, wearing an armor similar to what our father wore. Image What do you want? I ask bitterly and furiously. Do I need a reason to see my own twin sister? Blanche asks with an arrogant smile. The hostility between us was palpable, a tension that had been building up over the years. Blanche had always been more cunning and perceptive than me, she also never missed an opportunity to demonstrate her superiority. Your impetuous methods aren't as effective, are they, little sister? She taunted, ignoring the evident pain on my face. When you decided to pursue a solo career, I knew it was only a matter of time until you failed, I just didn't expect it to be so spectacularly, with so much collateral damage and so many witnesses. I ignored her provocations, taking a deep breath to maintain composure. I knew I needed to focus on the mission ahead and not allow the rivalry with Blanche to jeopardize my objectives. The Black Ops mission is a chance for redemption, not just for me, but for the entire Ark family. I reply, keeping a steady gaze. Blanche scoffs disdainfully. Good to know you're focused, little sister. I nod as we walk through the halls of the Ark Mansion. Do you have the mission details? It's an extermination mission. Blanche commented with a scroll in her hand. You, me, Seraline, and Lilis are going to kill Aphonis. Lilis? I ask surprised. But she's still too young. Despite being only thirteen, she's killed more Grimms than you or I. I always knew the kid had potential, but it still didn't seem right to bring her along. It seems excessive to assemble a group of four huntresses to deal with just one of those animals. It's not just any fawness, my dear sister, we're hunting a terrorist. She finishes handing me her scroll. On the scroll was the image of a red-haired fawness, wearing a grim mask to cover his eyes. Shocked by our target, I turned to face Blanche. Are you serious? Are we finally going to kill that insane animal? That's right, says Blanche with a voracious smile. We're going to hunt down Adam Taurus. Pira Nikos. The sun shone over the city of Vale. Normally, I would take advantage of a Saturday morning like this to train, study, or respond to the emails from my agent that had flooded my inbox. However, today is different. Today, I'm going to have coffee with two friends, Wai Shni and Yang Xiao Long. As soon as I entered the café, I spotted the two of them sitting at a table near the window. Weiss elegantly stirred her cup of tea, while Young devoured a huge sandwich. Hey, Pira, exclaimed Young with a wide smile. Weiss just waved more reservedly, but her face betrayed an expression of anticipation, probably due to the reason for our morning meeting. Hello. I replied, taking the vacant seat at the table. How are you both doing? Yan shrugged, her mouth full of food. Weiss shook her head, disapproving of her teammate, before responding. We're fine, thank you. And you, Pira? I feel fine as well. I replied. But I have to admit, I didn't expect an invitation from you to discuss this delicate matter. The expressions of Yang and Weiss changed immediately. Yang looked at me confused, while Weiss became a bit more serious. A certain blue-eyed fool has been on our minds lately. 
remarks the heiress, taking a sip of her tea. Cough. Cough. Yang swallowed, coughing up the poorly chewed piece in her mouth with difficulty but acted as if nothing strange had happened. Ah, our dark night. Comments Yang, hiding behind a sheepish smile. It's been less than a week since he set off on his road trip. Any news? I shook my head, a slight blush coloring my cheeks. No, he said he wouldn't have a signal where he was going, and with that jet of his, it could be anywhere in Remnant. I replied to Team RWBY's pugilist. But I'd like to get straight to the point. Agreeing, Weiss nods, while Yun seemed to break out in a cold sweat at my proposal. I noticed that, well, that we all share a certain interest in him. The two exchanged a knowing look before Yun let out a forced laugh. Weiss, however, maintained a serene expression. That's true. She admits, smiling. I thought maybe we could have a friendly chat about it. As friends and romantic rivals? Yun choked on her sandwich again, while Weiss raised an eyebrow subtly, now even more serious. I mean, he's a nice guy. Yun tried to play it off with a casual tone, but her eyes said otherwise. But I'm not interested in him. In fact, he's the one who must have a crush on me. Yan puffed up her chest, projecting confidence in her last statement, but it was transparent to me and Weiss. We're here to talk openly, Yang. You don't need to worry about hiding anything. Weiss added. Yan blushed slightly, looking like a bashful teenager. It's not that he's a bad guy. Yang commented, looking away. Yang clenched her fists and looked around as if she were a cornered animal. When her body tensed in a gesture to stand up, Weiss put a hand on her shoulder to hold her and calm her down. Turning to her teammate, who smiled encouragingly at her, Yang relaxed her body and sighed tiredly. Like, maybe I feel something. Yang admits, her face reddening with embarrassment. Just a little, you know. I silently thank her for her honesty, although Young was still holding back, admitting her feelings aloud was a big step. Passions can be complicated. I comment, trying to ease the tension. But you need to be honest with yourself for us to have this conversation. The two exchanged a knowing look, Weiss nodded, giving the final encouragement needed before Young finally relented. All right, I admit it, says Young, raising her hands as if surrendering. I have feelings for John. Happy now? Delighted, actually, comments Weiss, gently laughing. It's good for us to be honest with each other. After all, who knows what the future holds for us? You want honesty? Yang spoke in a threatening tone to us. I have a personal problem, John has the solution, and he promised to help me without asking for anything in return, just because he likes me as a friend. He's a perfect gentleman, he could even be one of those knight heroes from fairy tales. He may be a knight, but I'm the one who's going to ride him if he can fulfill the promise. Yang Xiaolong! exclaims Weiss indignantly. How can you joke in such an intimate and serious discussion between us? You can bet I'm serious, Snowflake, I just need to get intimate with him at the right time. Despite Yang's rudeness, I could sympathize with her. The blonde in question shot me a playful glance as she stirred her coffee. I think we can start with the serial girl, after all, you had a meteoric crush on him right from the start. I smile awkwardly, unable to contain my embarrassment. When I stopped to think about it, I realized it was pretty pathetic of me at first. Come on, Pirat Dash Dot. Weiss tried to appease me, but I silenced her by raising my hand. He treated me like a normal person and didn't idolize me like the invincible girl or try to take advantage of my abilities and title as the Mistral Champion, and that was enough for me to like him. 
Embarrassed, Weiss pretended to drink from her empty cup when I mentioned the second part, as she had acted that way at the initiation. I know you're very famous, but not everyone idolizes you, adds Young. True, but I'm talking about those who bothered to talk to me. Other people keep their distance, afraid to speak or thinking I'm arrogant and difficult to deal with because of my fame, not to mention those who hate my success. Like Weiss? Hey! I laugh a little at their interaction. Genuine moments like this make me grateful for coming to Beacon instead of Haven. But, this month that I've spent with him, I've been able to witness his honesty, humility, kindness, and gentleness. He's authentic, Young. That's something rare and special. Young gave an understanding smile, but her eyes still had a mischievous spark. Weiss, on the other hand, refilled her teacup before speaking. At first, I thought he was just a buffoon and that Pira had been cursed to spend for years as a partner with that oaf. Ladies and gentlemen, the delicate and gentle flower of Team RWBY. Comments Yang as if she were a game show host. Weiss frowns, annoyed, but didn't let it phase her as she continued to speak. But when I saw the use of his paint ammunition, I saw a business opportunity. Her expression is slightly uncomfortable as she confesses. But lately, I realize there's something refreshing about his sincerity and brashness. He doesn't try to impress anyone, and that attracts me a bit. Plus, the emotional support he gave me to confront my father means more to me than I'd like to admit. Young looks shocked at Weiss. The last statement carried an emotional weight that made me feel like a silly teenage girl in love. Then, Young leaned forward, whispering as if she were sharing a secret. I... I also have feelings for him. Her cheeks flushing. After initiation, I thought I wouldn't have to deal with that weirdo anymore. But the next day, he brought breakfast for the entire RWBY team, and I went through that embarrassment of being summarily rejected and then automatically placed in the friend zone. I reply with a smile. Thanks for reminding me, Nikos. Jan tanks in a sarcastic and aggressive tone. I admit it looks bad for me to have noticed him only after I was rejected, but for that reason, I noticed his qualities that you guys already mentioned and also his infectious sense of humor and how well he gets along with Ruby. And well, recently, he's been looking really good with Professor Port's training. The three of us exchanged surprised looks, followed quickly by nervous laughter. It was as if a weight had been lifted off our shoulders, and the tension of admitting such intimate feelings dissipated. We can't deny that he's got something special. I comment, trying to lighten the mood. And besides, the friendship we have with him is unique. I think we should continue to support each other, regardless of what happens. Weiss and I took a long sip of our drinks, feeling a sense of peace and lighter hearts after our conversation. Young, however, decided to sow chaos. Have you fucked him yet? P-F-F-F-F-F. We both spat out our tea at the same time, while our blonde friend laughed like a mischievous child. Yang Xiao Long exclaims Weiss, embarrassed. Your rudeness and lack of delicacy have no limits? It's a valid question, Pira shares a room and bathroom with the guy. But they don't sleep in the same bed or shower together, replies Weiss, outraged. I'm sure they change in the bathroom like civilized people. Well, actually, the two stop arguing to listen to me attentively. John has a habit of staying shirtless in the room. Seriously? They both ask, Young grinning fiercely while Weiss looked stunned. I have some photos if you want to see. Before I could finish lifting my scroll, it was taken from my hand by Young, who, to my horror, didn't settle for just the photo of John sleeping. She scrolled through all the photos on my device. Young, no. I plead in horror. But she didn't care. Naughty Pira. 
Yan comments, licking her lips. Image He cooks and cleans for you? The heiress asks, surprised. He's more skilled than I thought. Meow. Look at this photo of him doing squats by the bed. He really has well-toned legs. Ha! Loved the picture of him cleaning the floor when he was still a weakling. Says Young, scrolling through the photos, stopping at the one where he climbed the tree to help Blake. Why is he shirtless climbing the tree? That was his second attempt. Blake got startled and tore his shirt on the first one. Well done, partner. Despite the embarrassment I felt from these photos, we ended up laughing and chatting even more relaxed about the situation. Until Weiss brought up the subject that was lingering in the back of our minds. Have you ever thought about the possibility of forming a harem for John? Yang and I froze instantly. That was one of the possibilities if John didn't pursue one of us directly. Rin said he's attracted to all of us, but he won't think about relationships until after the vital festival. I say, recalling what we gleaned from my teammates' interrogation. Yang rubbed her forehead as if trying to force her brain to come up with an idea. I want to be a huntress and have my freedom to explore the world, help those in need, and punch those who need a punch. Comments Yang confidently. Maybe being in a harem would be better for me, so I don't feel so restricted. And if I get pregnant, I'll have free babysitters to take care of the baby. I'm in. She finished, shrugging. Considering her personality, that line of reasoning actually made sense. I'm not very excited about the idea of a harem, after all, in Atlas's high society, I would be judged as unfit for not being able to secure a man just for me. Weiss's tone was sober and somewhat dark. But maybe I should follow John's example and not worry about what others expect of me, but what I want. I'm neither for nor against a harem. What does that mean? Yang asked. I'd like more time to think. Weiss concludes, ignoring her teammate's sulky expression. And you, Pira? It's challenging to express in words the storm of emotions that overwhelms me when pondering this complex question. Loving John Ark is both a blessing and a curse. His smile warms my heart in ways I never imagined possible. His determination and kindness are like a beacon in the darkness of this troubled world. But being part of a harem makes everything even more complicated. The mere thought of sharing his affection with others makes me tremble with anguish and jealousy. How can I accept that the man I love is divided among so many other hearts? However, deep in my soul, I know that it's better to share a little of John's love than not to have it at all. After all, love is not a possession, but a gift that can be shared and even multiplied. The idea of being part of a harem goes against everything I've been taught about love and relationships. My family and agent won't be happy with my decision. But I would accept being part of the harem. Weiss eyes widen, surprise etched on her face by my decision, while Yun smiled at me, happy to have an ally. Blake and Ruby were with us when we interrogated Rin, why didn't they come with you guys? Yun was the first to answer my question. John isn't just Ruby's first crush, he's her first male friend says Yang in a wise tone. Let's give it some time, if in two years she still feels something for the dork night, we can talk about it. Two years seems like a lot, Yang. I comment, feeling sorry for the silver-eyed girl. Two years, repeated Yang, her eyes already red with fury. As for Blake, I invited her to the meeting, but she said her only interest in ARC is literary potential, whatever that means. Weiss explained. Literary potential? I thought to myself. Why does that scare and excite me at the same time? Huntsman Logs, Entry Headmaster Ajbin. Name, Ruby Rose. Alias, Silver-Eyed Warrior. 
Allegiance, Kingdom of Vale. Weapon, Crescent Rose. Semblance, Petal Burst, allows her to dash with great speed in any direction. Stats. Strength, 4 stars. Endurance, 4 stars. Agility, 4 stars. Fighting skill, 6 stars. Mental, 4 stars. Aura, 3 stars. Aura skill, 4 stars. Semblance, 2 stars. As I observe Ruby Rose, I cannot help but ponder the immense potential she holds as a silver-eyed warrior and a future huntress. Her journey thus far has been marked by determination and an unwavering sense of justice. A combination that makes her a formidable force against the darkness that plagues our world. As her mentor, it is my duty to guide her, to nurture her talents, and to prepare her for the challenges that lie ahead. And though the path of a huntress is fraught with peril, I have no doubt that Ruby Rose will rise to the occasion, shining brighter than any star in the darkest of nights. When questioning John about the development of Miss Rose's ocular powers, I received the following answer. Yes, she will learn to use this bullshit over power, but for that you need to find another silver-eyed warrior, Maria Calavera. I will make an image for you and show you places she may be. And once again Mr. Ark shatters expectations with his knowledge of the future. I would kill to uncover how he got this information. E.A.I. Gurzada? There was a tight and highly competitive vote for which interlude would be posted first. Who am I kidding? The overwhelming majority chose one winter and Dr. Polandina. Two types of people voted for this option. Those who wanted to see the world being affected by the protagonist's creations. Those who are gentlemen of culture and exquisite taste who wanted winter in the story. I was happy to see your reactions to Rin Power Move at the infirmary in the comments. The guy is a SNU SNU survivor, he should be respected. Off Funseeker 271 It's understandable most men would like a harem, but in real life getting just one is a miracle. Response equals wow. Response equals, beta, polyamory relationships tend to be an excuse to cheat or you wind up running down the street away from the epic freeway from their father with a shotgun loaded with rock salt. That said, if you have the opportunity to get with twins, go for it. Taylor Cross Most of us, Americans, have a twisted sense of humor. When you compare it on an international level. Response equals, I did not know that. In the past in Brazil, we were more naughty with our humor, but woke culture arrived here, and in our constitution, there is no freedom of speech. We have already had cases of comedians convicted without trial. That was some scary shit. Fake Son of God. What some people wouldn't give for death by SNU SNU. Yanderas, ha, huh, gotta love them, cause sometimes crazy is indeed hot. Then again, I thought Noir was hot because she wanted to kill him so. Thanks for the chapter, man, hoping to see how you take things from here. May God and the Force be with you, kudos. Response equals thank you for the kind words, and you spoke of one of life's greatest mysteries. The cultural axiom that is crazy hot. Someday we will discover the relationship between the two. Response equals, beta, based reader, women with power is hot. Ruby Rose. Today, I finally gathered the courage and marched to the Beacon Academy Forge. Standing in front of the furnace, using tongs in my left hand, I hold the pale green metal ingot into the fire. Image. I feel a mixture of excitement and apprehension filling my chest. The metal is unique and extremely valuable due to its potential to easily overcome the resistance of grim monsters. The weight of the responsibility to forge it into a worthy blade is overwhelming and suffocating. I need to focus. I grumble to myself. I won't disappoint you. Disappoint who? Kaya Awea. I shriek, jumping on one foot. 
Despite the scare, I didn't let go of the tongs, firmly holding the ingot of no goal. Blake! Don't startle me like that. I knocked on the door before entering and greeted you. At some point, the fault becomes yours, replies the amber-eyed ninja. I turned back to the furnace, grumbling about nosy teammates. As soon as I returned the ingot to the fire, Blake looked over my shoulder curiously like a cat. What brings you to the forge? Came to maintain your weapon? Actually, I just came to talk. I froze and turned to face my teammate in surprise. What? Blake asks indignantly. Can't I have a friendly conversation with my team leader? Are you out of books to read? Maybe? Blake responds embarrassed. Smiling now that the world makes sense again, I refocused on the furnace. I don't think I've ever seen that shade of green in metal before. Humph. I huff proudly, puffing out my chest. That's because it's extremely rare, perhaps unique in the whole world. Hmm. Where did you get it? That's classified information. And no matter how much you ask, I'll keep that secret to the end of time. Did John give it to you? Bleawa Aki. I whined, disappointed that she figured it out so quickly. You'll also like. What? Blake shrugs. I just guessed. Your crying confirmed my guess. Damn. Shaking her head and laughing at my reaction, Blake steps away from the forge and sat at a nearby table, giving me space to work. So, is it correct for me to assume it's John you don't want to disappoint? Hmm. My irritated groan was enough for her. As soon as I noticed the metal's hue changing due to the heat, I removed it from the furnace with trembling hands and placed it on the anvil. With my right hand, I reached for the next tool and began hammering. Clink! Clang! What are you doing there? The bored brunette asks. I'm hammering this ingot after heating it to shape it the way that I want. Clink! Clang! That's obvious. Blake complained. I want to know what you're making. A new blade for Crescent Rose. Clink. Clang. That sounds exhausting. Why don't you use one of those hammering machines? Although a mechanical forge hammer is faster and less tiring, I prefer using a regular hammer. Call me crazy, but I prefer to feel the metal shaping with my own hands. That way, I feel like I have fine control during the process. Clink. Clang. Sometimes I forget that besides being a nerd, you're a very skilled blacksmith. Thank you. I reply, smiling. Clink. Clang. Wait a second. I stop hammering, realizing the comment. I'm not a nerd. I complain, turning to Blake. In response, Belladonna stares at me with a raised eyebrow. If anyone here is a nerd, it's you. I accuse, pointing the hammer at her. With a face flushed with embarrassment, Blake stood up protesting. I'm an appreciator of literary fine arts. But you, you nerd, play video games, read comics, and fantasy books. Art? I asked ironically. What you read is filthy, filthy. An uncomfortable silence hung between us, but I decided to turn back and focus on my project. Clink. Clang. If what I read is so heinous, why did you borrow Don Ninja, Twilight Night? Yip. I exclaim, freezing instantly. A romance between a young kunoichi and a blonde knight with blue eyes. I freeze, paralyzed with embarrassment. And there was another day when I found a photo of John with a drawn beard on his face. Trying to make him look like the rusted knight by any chance? 
Hmm. I started whimpering with my childhood husband O revealed. It's not my fault, the story of the girl who fell through the world is one of my childhood favorites, and the rusted knight is so amazing in it. It's not my fault, John reminds me of him. Amidst my internal confusion, a hand landed on my shoulder. It's okay. Blake said, smiling at me. Everyone has a crush when they reach adolescence. And if he looks like your childhood husband, though, it makes everything more perfect. I know. I whispered, calming down. Once I managed to compose myself, I went back to hammering, and Blake returned to her seat. Clink. Clang. But it makes you wonder, you know. Blake asked. You, Young, Weiss, Pira, and Velvet have a crush on the blonde knight. Velvet? Clink. Clang. The faunest rabbit from the second year. Aya. I exclaim, remembering her face. And you? Clink. Clang. What about me? On the day we interrogated Rin, you were in the room with us. Aren't you in love with him too? Clink. Clang. In love is too strong of a word. I'm just interested in his literary potential. Literary potential? I repeat, not understanding between the hammer blows. Clink. Clang. Yes. Blake confirmed, nodding. And his sexy body. Thud. The dry sun of the hammer falling to the ground cut the conversation instantly. Blake. I shout, blushing. You need better hold on to that hammer. She says, smiling wickedly. I think it's better to focus on my blade than to keep talking to this Fujoshi. Clink. Clang. Ha! I exclaimed in surprise. What's wrong? Blake asked, curious. I lifted the tongs, holding the ingot now in the rough shape of a side blade against a light to examine it better. I think the metal is changing color. Hey, Xiong. The closing of the bar is always a special moment for me. A moment of calm, silence, and reflection after a tiring day, even if it's a slow day like this. At least that's what I hoped for. W H Y Y Y Y Y Y Y Y Y Y cries out a female voice loudly. I've already told you, girl, says another female voice, calmer. He must have forgotten about you. That doesn't make me feel any better. As I tidy up the last bottles and clean the glasses, all I can think about is relaxing and going home, but I'm being held back by my two last customers. One of them is a mysterious brunette woman, wearing a beret and sunglasses, even though it's night. She's dressed in designer clothes and carries herself like a socialite top model who occasionally takes a sip of her low-alcohol, low-calorie drink. She spent the whole night taking care of the other customer. The other is a faunus, with bunny ears that sway with every movement. She's visibly drunk and crying, after a whole night of drinking carrot margaritas. The poor thing seems to be going through some kind of emotional crisis, and I'm glad to have made a profit serving her expensive drinks. From a distance, the faunus raises her swollen, red eyes to me, overflowing with sadness. One more, please says the teary-eyed one, lifting her empty glass. I look at the woman with the beret and sunglasses, searching for some confirmation or intervention, but she just shrugs. Sighing tiredly, I prepare another carrot margarita and approach them, sitting at the counter, serving the glass. Here you go. I say in a dry and serious tone. And this is the last one of the night. She takes the glass and smiles weakly at me, her face still wet with tears. Thank you. She murmurs before taking a long sip of the drink. 
I swear, I'm not normally like this. It's none of my business, miss, just pay your bill, and it's all good for me, I reply formally. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to start closing up the bar. The soft sound of music still echoed in the bar, but the tables were empty and the smell of alcohol mixed with the scent of cleaning products. Stepping out from behind the counter, I walked slowly to the entrance to flip the sign. That's when the door opened, revealing a red-haired man wearing an extravagant hat and carrying a cane. Junior, my friend. How's it going, he exclaims, entering with exaggerated confidence and much swagger. I raise an eyebrow, feeling a twinge of irritation. Roman, don't call me Junior. It's hey shown to you. He chuckles, shrugging. Always so serious. You don't need to do that, we're still old pals, aren't we? I ignored the comment and continued my work, flipping the sign. What do you want, Roman? With an ironic smile, he pointed to a table with two chairs. Wanting to get this over with, I nod in agreement. Once we sat down, he put his filthy feet up on my table that I had just cleaned. I was just taking a look at my old favorite meeting spot. How are you managing in this boring place without me? I rolled my eyes, keeping calm. I'm doing just fine, thank you. But I think you should go, the bar is closed. Roman shrugged, as if the rules didn't apply to him. Ah, Junior, always so stern. You know, I was thinking we could do business again, like old times. The last time, he hires my men, and they all ended up injured or arrested. I shake my head, refusing outright. I'm trying to lay low for now, Roman. He laughs, ignoring my refusal. Ooh. Has the great junior done anything extravagant in the past few weeks? Don't leave your friend out of the loop, now. My fists clenched instinctively. Until recently, I was happy that Torchwick was drawing attention from the police, media, and politicians all to himself. But after he involved my men in a robbery stopped by a huntress in training and the visit from that blonde psychopath threatening me in my own establishment, let's just say, unlike this clown, I'm trying to maintain a low profile. It's none of your business, Torchwick. Roman shrugs once again, seeming to enjoy my refusal. Well, let's get down to business then, says Roman, reaching for a small metal box from inside his white coat. The opportunity is knocking at your door to get rid of all that dust too hot for the market. Roman concludes, taking out a cigar from the box and lighting it in his mouth. Even with my years of experience dealing with all sorts of criminals in this city, my face twitched, breaking my poker face as I remembered the day I sold all the dust that Roman is looking for. You're too late, I've already sold my entire stock. Interesting, says Roman, taking a puff. I'm not used to being kept in the dark when so much dust is being moved around the city. Who the hell bought all that at once? I keep my gaze fixed on the table, choosing my words carefully. Roman, you've worked with dangerous people. This person who bought the dust, she's on another level. Maybe even more intimidating than your employer, if that's possible. A spark of intrigue lit up Roman's eyes, but I didn't let my guard down. He didn't need to know that I was already familiar with this mysterious employer. Someone more dangerous than the fiery bitch, even more interesting. Roman crossed his arms, his expression indicating a mix of frustration and fascination. Could you arrange a meeting with this mysterious figure? My eyes widened in horror. I sighed, deciding to choose my words even more carefully. The last thing I want is to encounter that figure again, why would I risk arranging a meeting for you? Roman seemed to absorb my words, but he didn't seem satisfied. With a mischievous smile, he took a long drag of his cigar and exhaled the smoke through his nose without taking his eyes off me. How about a drink to change your mind? 
I raise an eyebrow at the thief's insane proposal. Have you ever heard of Silver Deer? Everyone in my line of work knows, it's a brand of expensive Atlas whiskey, I heard they let it age in maple barrels for at least 50 years before bottling and selling. 50 years? Roman asked, surprised. Wow, no wonder it's so expensive. The gallant thief laughed. I furrow my brow at his ironic laughter. Despite being an excellent whiskey, I won't risk it for a shot of it. A shot? Roman asks, pretending to be offended. Come on, Junior, I'm talking about a closed palate. Do you have a thousand sealed bottles of silver, dear? To be precise, I have 1050 sealed bottles, it was 1056, but no one is made of iron, Roman explains, laughing at the end. With that amount of silver, dear, I could guarantee a 50% increase in profits at my bar for two years, not to mention the savings of not having to buy more expensive drinks during that time. I didn't want to talk to that kid again, but I have no choice. I have to pay off the loans I took out to repair the bar after the visit from the blonde. As soon as you deliver the pallet to me, I'll contact him. I comment, knowing that the conversation wouldn't end there. Marvelous. I suggest you don't try to cheat. He's smarter and more dangerous than he seems. Hurl. My shoe, velvet. I think that Faunus just vomited on your counter, Roman commented disgustedly, pointing in the direction of the two girls. Sighing in annoyance that my work had increased, I stand up. If you'll excuse me, I need to grab a mop. With that, Roman Torchwick walks away, pinching his nose with his fingers. Ajpin. Sitting in my office, reviewing the receipts for the dust expenditure I provided to Young Ark, I feel a wave of frustration wash over me. Normally, this type of work wouldn't be complicated, and to be honest, I would leave it to the Treasury. However, multiple justifications need to be invented to avoid raising suspicions about the exorbitant dust expenditure of the last month to the Vale Council. I observe the meticulously recorded numbers on the receipts, but my mind is occupied with the need to keep our secret safe. After all, John's dust expenses are just a small part of a much larger scheme, a scheme necessary to protect our world from the darkness that threatens to consume it. Ding! The sound of the elevator arriving at my office distracts me from the papers. Who could it be at this hour? I raise my eyes to the elevator and see Crow Branwyn stepping out of it, an imposing figure wearing his red cloak. Good to see you again, Crow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, grumbles the veteran huntsman, who seemed both intoxicated and hungover at the same time. What's so important that you're interrupting me, again? Crow, usually loyal and diligent in his duties as a huntsman, seems darker than usual. His eyes are bloodshot, and a scowl adorns his face. He wastes no time in expressing his frustration. Am I finally worthy of knowing who your source is? He growls. Everything you've given me has turned out to be true. Are you going to retire me now that I'm useless for gathering intel? The irritation in his voice was evident and justifiable. After we failed to protect Amber, I sent Crow on a reconnaissance mission to find her assailants. Only to later pass on to him their identities and location and ask him to bug Professor Leonardo Lionheart's office because he was a possible traitor. I take a deep breath, preparing for the inevitable confrontation. Although Crow is one of my most loyal allies, his cantankerous nature and propensity for confrontation always require a delicate approach. Crow, please, have a seat, I say, indicating the chair in front of my desk. Perhaps some good news will improve your mood. He hesitates for a moment, clearly reluctant to let his guard down, but finally relents and sits down. I watch him with a mixture of concern and apprehension, aware that the conversation that follows may further shake his already fragile disposition. After a long conversation and a few swigs from his flask, Crow still wasn't convinced. 
Okay. The kid knew all your secrets, but have you considered that he might be a spy for Salem? Then why would he heal Amber? To gain our trust. To gain our trust to do what, Crow? To steal the beacon relic, he replies, crossing his arms as if he had won the argument. All right, and to achieve that goal, what does he need to do first? I ask with a raised eyebrow. To kill dash dot. Crow stops mid-sentence, realizing his mistake. In response, I just smile at him. Go easy on me, I'm drunk. You're always drunk. Crow responds with a laugh and a shrug. His future intel has been solid. So far, he was right about Lionheart's betrayal. There's no reason for him to have lied about Amber's attackers. And these inventions of his? I've seen people with creation semblances doing crazy things, but it never lasts long. Would you like to test one of them? I didn't even need a response, as curiosity was written all over Crow's face as he pulled the headset from my drawer. This device is called a scouter, it can connect to any other similar device anywhere on the planet. But CCT towers don't have that kind of range, Crow says skeptically. Two of these devices can communicate from anywhere on Remnant without the use of the CCT system. Crow was astonished by my statement. Which was not unexpected, communication on this scale without the aid of CCT seemed like only a distant dream, but if I mention that this device works without dust, Crow will question my sanity. I agree that this technology is incredible, but I still don't understand one thing. What would that be? I ask, finishing putting the device on my head. Why does it look like a neon pink headset with cat ears? Mr. Ark said they serve as antennas for the device. And why the bow tie? Image. Leave me alone, Crow. Ha 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 ha. Crow laughs, falling out of his chair from laughing so hard. I love this kid. I imagine you two will get along. After a few minutes of laughter, Crow composes himself and sat back in the chair in front of me. The ears and the bow tie just seem like decorations. Why don't you take them off and paint them a different color? I sigh irritably but respond to my ally. This device stops working if I change its appearance in any way. Whether by painting, adding, or removing parts, and if I cover my head while using it, it also doesn't work. Wow. Crow whispers, impressed. The kid went all out for this prank. All the other devices he builds won't work with me either. If I want to enjoy this technology, I have to use this model on my head. Hee <laughs> hee. I won't lie, Ozzy, I'm liking this kid more and more. If he's half as brilliant in the fight against Salem, this war is already won. He has his moments, I reply in an excited tone. Aha, uh -huh. Crow reacts to my comment. From the sound of it, this kid is a bit eccentric. Isn't the fact that a piece of technology that could revolutionize Remnant's communication system is shaped like neon pink kitty ears explicit enough? I asked with boiling blood and furrowing my brow. Don't forget about the bow tie, Crow snarks back, holding back a laugh. Any chance I could meet the kid? He's not at Beacon at the moment, but I can call him in Menagerie. Menagerie? Wow, you weren't kidding about the range of this thing, but it's like 3 a.m. there, won't he be asleep? I hope so. Although I needed to put the device on my head, it was compatible with my monitors and cameras, proving that Mr. Ark just wanted to hurt my ego by making me wear such a flashy headset. In a few seconds, the call connected, but instead of Yen Mr. Ark, I was greeted by an individual wearing futuristic blue armor. Secure line from John Ark, church on the line, said the man in blue armor. Church? I repeat, confused, staring at his projected image on the screen. 
Yep, that's my name, commented the blue being, staring back at us. And judging by the Hello Kitty headset, you must be Professor Ajbin, and that guy who looks like he slept in a gutter after getting beaten up by an entire bar must be Crow Branwen. Who's the asshole, Ajbin? Crow asks, slightly annoyed. This is the first time I've heard of this, Mr. Church. I'm not exactly a mister, I'm actually an artificial intelligence created by Project Freelancer. A special operations program created to study soldiers with AI implants during the war against the aliens, ensuring humanity's survival in a hostile galaxy. Silence and shock were the only reactions from me and Crow. Let me summarize. John created me, and I have my own consciousness, the ability to think creatively, and even feelings, although I'm an artificial life form. An artificial life form with feelings? I ask curiously. Indeed, although since my creation, I've only been exercising my hatred and disgust, empathy and patience have been harder to grasp with this guy. I swallowed the fact that John Ark had created an artificial life form and was using it as an electronic secretary. I'm proving to Mr. Branwen the effectiveness of this secure line. Could we speak with Mr. Ark? It's three in the morning, and you want me to wake the guy up just to show that the phone works? I think that might be too inconvenient on our part. I reply, embarrassed. And hilarious, I'll get the dude. After a few seconds, the screen changed, showing a tired young blonde in a room illuminated by the dim light of the moon coming through the window. Where at I, I, I is it? John asks, yawning. Please excuse the inconvenience, Mr. Ark, but I'm demonstrating your invention to Crow. I see. John mutters with his eyes closed. Wait! exclaims the young man, wide-eyed. Just for this? Basically, yes. Are you serious that you called me just for this? Church, why did you pass this call to me? That's what you deserve for treating me like a secretary. I use you to keep track of my resources and schedule my appointments. You're a secretary. Because you're a wimp bitch boy to take the injection to use me properly. The super soldier serum almost killed me and is less aggressive than this virus dash. The seemingly endless argument was interrupted by two, a female arm emerging from the darkness that grabbed John. Blondie. She says in a husky whisper. Turn off this shit, you have a mission with me in bed. John disappears, being swallowed by the darkness. We were left only with Church, who muted the audio to maintain the privacy of young Ark. So, we'll talk later? I asked, trying to end the call. Agreed. Church replies, ending the transmission. Well, what do you know? It actually works, Crow comments sarcastically. In response, I sigh tiredly, massaging my forehead. The kid's been in menagerie for less than a week, and he's already sampling the local cuisine? Not bad. Although I agree with you that Mr. Ark's recent achievement is impressive, he could have kept a low profile. He's definitely going down low under her. Crow adds, laughing once again. Huntsman Logs, Entry Headmaster Ajbin. Name, Crow Branwen. Alias, Old Crow. Allegiance, Kingdom of Vale. Weapon, Harbinger. Semblance, Misfortune, causes bad luck around him. Stats. Strength. Endurance. Agility. Fighting skill. Mental. Aura. Aura skill. Semblance. Crow is undoubtedly one of the most skilled and loyal huntsmen I've ever had the privilege of knowing. His performance in combat is impressive, his dedication to the cause is unwavering, and his strategic ability is unmatched. 
It's no wonder he has become a trusted figure not only to me, but to the entire team at Beacon, the Kingdom of Vale, and my inner circle. However, I cannot ignore the fact that Crow faces a personal battle with his inner demons. It's evident that his depression affects his work and relationships. But despite his personal demons, Crow never fails to fulfill his responsibilities as a huntsman and to his family. Crow Branwen may be a walking paradox, but his bravery, skill, and loyalty are undeniable. As a huntsman, he has honored his commitment to the cause and remained determined to overcome his personal obstacles as we continue our fight against the darkness-threatening remnant. E.A.I. Gurizada Curious about the bad news? I'm going to start posting this story just once a month, instead of twice a month. I'll try to make the chapters a little longer even though they are less frequent. And speaking about the previous chapter, we had expected reactions to the patriarch of the Ark family like, this guy looks badass and I already hate him more than noir. One reaction I didn't expect was, step on me, daddy. Loker Dome. Thanks for the chapter. John's family is shady as f. I kinda want to have the twist of his mom just being a really nice person, but I also want her to be like a Talia Al Ghul XB. I don't know what would be better. Response equals a mother like Talia Al Ghul. Interesting. Loker Dome. Mui Bun Capichulo. Our K. Aparis la familia de John and Nishina Purdy completo respito por ella y pens que podria alguina poer a John Pero Paris que están metidos en el pasado monarquico en especial el padre. Otra cosa que mi lama la atención y es lo poco que saben de John y que es y quisir en lesas con familias important Siria con la familia de Weiss y no con la de Carden. El acuerdo del Heron también fue un momento divertido y mi pregunto es si Ruby es si enterara de lo del Heron como reaccionaria young con su hermana totalmente acuerdo jajajajajaja. Por último espero que a Don sobreviva a las hermanas de John para darles otra bofetada a sus pomposos traseros. Response equals he he. Without giving spoilers, I guarantee you that Adam will suffer horribly. Sleep deprived guy. Me who look at Ken and John, who turns out to be the rusted knight, yeah, about that. Response equals yep. And in this chapter, the references were even heavier. Even sitting in the cockpit of my new jet, the Blackbird, I need to be cautious as the open sea of remnant is a place full of dangers. The biggest of these dangers are the aquatic grims of the Leviathan class, ancient and powerful creatures that inhabit the depths. Just the sighting of one of them is enough to make a city declare a state of calamity. These creatures are not only large in size but also in power, capable of sinking entire ships with a single blow, making unprepared armies and huntsmen retreat fearing for their lives. Creatures like Monstra and the Leviathan itself, which gives its name to the category, have been shown in the series as walking catastrophes with the power to destroy civilizations. It's crucial that I remain vigilant, aware of everything happening around me. The slightest lapse in attention could be fatal in this unforgiving environment. But instead, I was humming along to a badass 90s superhero cartoon theme song. To are you are you are you are you are you are you are you. To are you are you are you are you are you are you are you. To are you are you are you are you are you are you are you. To Roo. We'll arrive in 30 minutes. Wouldn't it be better if you stopped singing and got ready? To are you are you are you are you are you are you are you. To are you are you are you are you are you are you are you. To are you are you are you are you are you are you are you. To Roo. You've been listening to this song on loop for two hours straight. To are you are you are you are you are you are you are you. To are you are you are you are you are you are you are you. To are you are you are you are you are you are you are you. To Roo. We get it. You are a 90s kid with a TV. Now shut it off. To are you are you are you are you are you are you are you. 
Two are you, are you, are you, are you, are you, are you, are you. Two are you, are you, are you, are you, are you, are you, are you. Two Fuck this. Two dash. Hey! I complain as the music was cut. Okay, X Men from the 90s is the second best superhero series, but you can go fuck yourself with a barbed dick if you think I'm going to listen to one more second of your shitty singing. After Church's rant monologue, I could swear his hologram was panting on top of the Blackbird's panel. And while he was right, something else caught my attention. Who's first? What? He asked in an irritated and surprised tone. If 90s X-Men is in second place, who's first? The AI stared at me in disbelief, but nevertheless responded promptly. Batman T.A.S. He replied in a serious and dry tone. Hmm. I murmur, reflecting on the answer. You're right. Bitch, please. I'm always right. Church grumbled, looking to the left as another holographic figure materialized beside him. Assume the controls, Delta, the fearless leader is about to depart. Affirmative. A new green AI responds in a neutral, robotic tone. I got up from the pilot's chair and walked towards Church in the cargo area of the plane. You'll also like. How did you create more artificial intelligence? I cautiously ask, I couldn't hide the apprehension I was feeling. Or is he a fragment? The last thing I need is my main support going rampant. No. Chuck replies in a serious tone. He's not a fragment, much less a true AI. This Delta is more of a virtual assistant. Like Siri or Alexa. Just more useful and less data stealing for big tech. Jokes aside, this idea is brilliant. Initially, Church planned to divide his attention. Part would go with me, and the other would stay on the Blackbird. But despite the Dragon Ball Scouter giving us a global signal range, we could still have problems with jammers or buildings made of material that blocks the signal. The loss of the signal could have grave consequences for Church if he is split, but he said it was fine and that I shouldn't worry. But I annoyed and pestered him until he came up with the idea of creating these virtual assistants. I think I'll call them VA. Let's review your creations since the healing of our sleeping stowaway. Why? In Menagerie, you might have opportunities to help the people there, and judging by your previous action, you won't think before acting, much less plan how to spend your MP. So it's interesting for you to know the totality of your resources before spending MP indiscriminately. Wow! I exclaimed, surprised by the AI's reasoning. It really paid off the points I spent on you. So let's start with me then. The AI added proudly. A holographic table was projected from my watch using the same technology as Tony Stark's in the Iron Man movies, the same one Church uses when he wants to give a face-to-face -face sermon. Artificial intelligence without a chance of betrayal, 60.000 MP. Blackbird, no weapons, 50.000 MP. Arc reactor, on Blackbird, 50.000 MP. ND1 Nomad 10.000 MP. Hello Kitty Scouter only works with Oshpin 2.000 MP. Stark Tech Holographic Watch Comic 2.000 MP. X10 Arc Knights 20.000 MP. Bag of Holding 4 Limit equals 1,500 pounds 680 kilograms 2.000 MP. Decanter of Endless Water, 2.000 MP. X8 Elemental Gem, two of each type kind, 4.000 MP. Weeb Staff, 10.000 MP. Weeb Sword, 20.000 MP. Image Inducer, 2.000 MP. 
Extremis Virus, 2.0 TSC version, 50.000 MP. Total equals 283.000 MP. Dang, I spent a lot yesterday and today. I commented, not mentioning the disrespect for the weapons I had made. The beating you took from your sister opened your eyes, but for some reason, you're taking none of it with you. My disguise is as a human tourist on the island, after all, we came to help the Belladonna family and if we have time, help all the faunus on Menagerie. If I come armed with all this, it'll raise suspicions. A noble cause. Church commends, surprised. How are you going to help them? Do you have any plan? None. I reply with a sheepish smile. Yet another reason to know what resources are at your disposal. Church mentions, showing a holographic projection of my hunter equipment along with my new items. If things go south, I'll send your stuff on one of those lockers you copied from Beacon or the sleeping stowaway. Agreed, just be careful not to hit civilians. No problem, and according to my calculations, you still have 61,454 MP left. MCS on. Multiverse crafting system. What would you like to make? Magic, 61.404 points. Aura, 100%. You missed, by 50. Of course I am dash. What? Church bellows, cutting off the audio of the watch where his voice was projected. It's impossible for me to be wrong. Relax, it's normal for people to make mistakes once in a while. I'm more than just a person, I'm the most powerful AI in this world. Hey! Don't forget about Penny. I can calculate routes through slipspace in seconds, command fleets of starships in combat, coordinate space stations with populations larger than that of this planet. Translate unknown languages with just 10 sentences, provide medical assistance, facilitate neural interface between humans and weapons, and if you make a decent server, I can reach 500 teraflops. Don't compare me to that red-headed Pinocchio, who still struggles with handshakes and hugs. An uncomfortable silence fell over the environment. I had a stern look on my face in response to Church's unkind words to the ginger robot girl. Listen here, Alpha. I said, pointing a finger at the hologram. You're a copy of Dr. Leonard Church. My statement, combined with my serious tone, caught the AI off guard. You had a shortcut to your humanity. Penny is climbing each step until she reaches hers. I don't think you're any less for it, but Penny certainly deserves your respect. The holographic projection looked down, avoiding my gaze. Even though his image was covered by a complete combat armor, it was still evident from his body language that he was ashamed. You're right, I'm sorry. You understood your mistake, so it's all right. I need to make sure that every time he throws a tantrum like this, the watch mutes. But I'm still puzzled, what did I forget to account for? Snapping my fingers as soon as I realize what's missing from the whiny AI's list. I think it was the stakes. Stakes? Before leaving, I made dinner with Pecana steaks. You spent magic points on a piece of meat? They were pecan steaks, you fucking ignorant gringo who thinks hot dogs and hamburgers are barbecue meat. Approaching Menagerie Announces Delta's voice through the internal speaker of the aircraft. I look angrily at church and take a deep breath to calm myself. I knew it wasn't worth fighting over this. Look, sorry I didn't tell you about those 50 points. You're helping me organize my life, something I'm grateful for, and I know with your help, we will save this planet. My sincere tone disarms him, but I hadn't finished speaking. But I would still have spent the points on my colleagues, not just because it's good food, but to relax and say goodbye to them. I understand. Church replies, sounding tired. 
I increasingly wonder if AIs need to breathe. Sorry again for being an asshole. No problem, you're famous for being an asshole. Fuck off. He replies irritably. You still have time to change your clothes, you don't need to go dressed like that. The AI complained, pointing at my body. Before I could respond, the cargo compartment door opened, revealing a beach of white sand 25 meters below. Some people were pointing at the aircraft curiously, but from afar, I could already see a militia coming towards us. Hakuna Matata! I shout, jumping out of the plane without a parachute. You crazy motherfucker! Church shouts from the watch. The wind whipped against my face as I dove towards the ground. The sound of the wind echoed in my ears, drowning out all other sounds around me. I felt like I was flying, even though I knew I was in free fall towards the ground. The feeling of falling is indescribable, a mixture of excitement and fear that makes me feel alive like never before. In a matter of moments, I was dangerously close to the ground, I twisted my body to try to land on my feet. Poof! The impact was stronger than I had thought. I felt my feet hit the sand of the beach with my right fist. Inadvertently, I had made a superhero landing. Deadpool was right, this thing fucks up the knees. Despite the pain, I stood up with a relieved smile spreading across my face as I realized I was unharmed, thanks to the combination of the super soldier serum coursing through my veins with aura. A group of faunus fishermen looked at me in astonishment. Which wasn't surprising, since a human had jumped out of a military jet onto their island where they were supposed to be safe from the rest of the world's pursuits. But that's why I'm wearing a light blue Hawaiian shirt with pink flowers and matching shorts, the sunglasses were just to complete the look. Good morning, menagerie. I said in a friendly tone, greeting the curious onlookers from afar. But everyone kept their distance, looking at me suspiciously, suspecting that I had nefarious intentions on this island. What's going on? I commented, walking slowly, my feet protected from the hot sands of the beach, by my flip-flops. I just came here to enjoy my vacation. Stop right there, human, shouted a powerful voice from behind the fisherman. In response, the crowd of faunus began to make way for a group of soldiers. The militia I had seen from afar? I think to myself. Their equipment seemed simple, despite being uniforms they weren't wearing armor or weapons dependent on dust, just spears, bows, and arrows. I come in peace. I comment, raising my hands in surrender. Image. Peace? says the same voice that had shouted orders earlier. You come to the island with the most grims in the fucking world for peace, are you retard? Now that they were closer, I could make out who was leading. Actual I... I had stopped at the letter wide before the beautiful creature in front of me. A sun-kissed, red-haired war goddess emerged as the soldiers made way for her. Dazzling and powerful, crossing the beach sands with enchanting grandeur. Her short, blood red hair danced in the wind, highlighting her attractive and powerful figure. Her eyes, like shining sapphires, met mine for a brief moment, and it was as if time stood still. I found myself completely mesmerized by her presence, unable to look away. I felt my heart beat faster in my chest, as if I was trying to escape to find her. Her intimidating gaze radiated confidence and aggression as a feeling of heat spread throughout my body. She seemed to possess a power and grace that took my breath away. Instantly, I realized that this red-haired woman completely enthralled me with her intoxicating beauty and dominating presence. And she has the biggest pair of boobs I've ever seen in my life. I thought to myself. This woman makes young and good witch look as anemic as Weiss did in the first season. Image What I wouldn't give to stick my face in the middle of those perfect mountains. Did I stutter? Spit it out, brat! 
shouts the red-haired barbarian goddess, pointing a giant axe in my direction. And of course, I responded in the most eloquent way my super-soldier serum-enhanced brain could respond at the time. Why 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 I admit it wasn't my finest hour. Gyra Belladonna Your tea, my love, says a melancholic female voice. Thank you, Callie. I reply, trying to sound optimistic. You're welcome, dear, she smiles at me, but the weariness in her voice was evident. Sitting at the breakfast table, I watch my wife as she moves around the kitchen. A sense of heaviness hangs over us, weighing on our shoulders like an unbearable burden. I try to maintain my composure, hiding my feelings behind a mask of calm and control, but I know Callie can see through me as well. She seems so fragile today, her shoulders slumped under the weight of the sadness that surrounds us. Her eyes, normally full of warmth and vitality, are now dull, reflecting the pain she tries so desperately to hide. I should be the rock, the strength she can lean on in tough times. But today, I feel as powerless as she does, unable to offer comfort or solutions to our problems. As we sit at the table, the heavy silence between us is unbearable. Every movement, every glance exchanged, is laden with the weight of our worries. I wish I can find the right words to soothe her broken heart, but for now, all I can offer is my silent presence, my hand extended in solidarity, as we navigate the storm of sadness and uncertainty together. As the silence persists, it's impossible to ignore the reason behind our shared sorrow. The absence of our daughter hangs over us like a constant shadow, filling every space in our hearts with overwhelming anguish. Each day that passes without news of her feels like an eternity of agony and uncertainty. Callie and I constantly wonder where she is, if she's safe, if she's happy. Concern for her well-being consumes our thoughts, keeping us awake during the long nights of insomnia. As we sit at the breakfast table, surrounded by the echo of our sadness, I hear a powerful female voice shouting in the distance. Chieftain announces a familiar voice in the distance. I've brought you a prisoner. A prisoner? Callie asks curiously. What is she talking about, Gyra? That's what I intend to find out, I reply, rising from the table. Accompanied by my wife, we hurriedly walked to the gate. When I open it, we are greeted by the sight of the commander of the militia accompanied by a young blonde human wearing sunglasses and a floral shirt, with his hands and neck tied by a thick rope in the hands of the commander. Good morning, Chieftain Belladonna, she said in a loud and formal tone. Good morning, Commander Taurus. Taurus, the young man asks, looking at the commander. Are you Adam Taurus's sister? Because your brother's a massive C.U.N.A.C. The commander turned, grabbing the young man by the throat before he could finish his sentence. Audra! I exclaimed the commander's name aloud, trying to stop her. The commander sighs tiredly, but let go of the young man on the ground. Adam was a delicate subject for her, something she didn't like to discuss, especially with strangers. He said he's a friend of the Belladonna family, says the commander, pulling the young man roughly by the rope, but he didn't seem to mind being mistreated by her. Other than the clothes on his back, sunglasses, scroll, and a watch, he has nothing else on him. Then he possesses no weapons or dust, the woman affirms, nodding. Despite appearing harmless, I believe I've never seen this young man in my life. Do you know him, Callie? I asked, turning to my wife. Callie stepped up from behind me and looked curiously at the young man, but shook her head in denial. HMPF. Snorts the commander, a wicked smile spreading across her face. Well, well. You said you come in peace, but ultimately, you're a liar with vile intentions. Says the commander, grabbing the boy's arm. 
Despite her having awakened Aura and being a powerful fighter, the boy showed no reaction to the commander's titanic grip on his arm because he also had Aura that reacted by lighting up where the grip was. A huntsman? I questioned myself mentally. I'm not lying. Explains the boy to the commander. It's just that this is the first time I've met Blake's parents. Blake? Callie asks, leaving my side to approach the stranger. When was the last time you saw my daughter? How is she? Desperation and hope boiled inside Callie at the prospect of news of our daughter. The last time I saw her was yesterday, she was researching recipes to prepare fish with syrup she harvested in Forever Fall. My wife's feline ears twitched upon hearing the boy's report and although the discretion seems to be our daughter's, we need more proof to be sure. I would rather not offend you by doubting your words, young man. But I lived a public life dealing with politics when I was leader of the White Fang, so it's not difficult to get superficial information about my family. I commented in a serious tone, trying to maintain a formal stance on this delicate subject. Would you be able to prove that you really know our daughter? The boy looked in my direction, but remained silent for a few seconds, thinking about what to say. She doesn't like to socialize, and she's always reading books. Ha! You're going to have to do better than that, kid. Said the commander. Anyone who has heard of Blake Belladonna can tell you that. Hmm, mutters the young man who had returned to thinking. She doesn't mind reading filthy books in public. Tears of relief began to stream from Callie's eyes. Our daughter is alive, says Callie, hugging me. I returned the embrace as overwhelming relief flooded my heart. It was as if an unknown burden had been lifted from me, allowing me to finally breathe. Knowing our daughter was safe was a balm to my torn soul. And all thanks to this young man, whose fixed gaze on the commander's cleavage while drooling explained why he didn't complain about being mistreated by her. Callie Belladonna While I prepare breakfast, I feel a bubbling joy within me. Every movement is light and fluid, while a smile adorns my lips. It's as if I'm emerging from a dark phase of my life and stepping into a sunny day. The feeling of no longer being sunk in depression and hopelessness is incredibly liberating. Every step in the kitchen is a small victory, a reminder that I am gaining my well-being and happiness. Despite being a luxury in menagerie, I brew a pot of coffee as the fresh aroma fills the air. Thanks to that friendly young man, John Ark, I know that my daughter, besides being alive and healthy, Blake was also regretful of having abandoned us and the way she treated us. She realized the point of no return that Adam was heading towards, and violence wouldn't bring peace and equality between faunus and humans. Now she is a huntress apprentice at Beacon Academy, where she intends to be an example that faunus and humans can not only coexist peacefully but also work together for a better future. Although I feel sad thinking that our daughter is afraid to meet us in person, ashamed of her past actions. My chest swells with hope that one day we can reunite. With coffee ready and some cookies on a plate, I take everything to the table, where Gyra and John are sitting on cushions on the floor tea table while chatting. As I approach the two, I catch the tail end of their conversation. Then, on the second attempt, I managed to get her out of the tree, John says with a smiling face. All this without a shirt, because she tore it on the first attempt? Gyra asks. Yes. John exclaims, rising arms in an exaggerated gesture. That's a Blake thing, or Faunus have some inherent behaviors linked to the animal trait they exhibit? No one has the exact answer about Faunus genetics, Gyra comments, reflecting on the young man's question. But in this case, it was due to trauma. Blake was chased by dogs when she was seven years old, and since then, she has feared them. Did they hurt her? The young man asks in a concerned tone. No, they just wanted to grab the fried fish she was eating. The boy burst into hearty laughter as he served the coffee and cookies. 
Thank you, Mrs. Belladonna, says the polite young man, helping himself. Eat as much as you want. I reply, patting the blonde-haired, smiling human's head. I bet a young man as polite as him would be a great father. I thought to myself. I would love to have grandchildren with golden cat ears like his hair. As I dreamed about future little gifts from heaven, Gyra continued to question the boy. Despite being grateful for the news and whereabouts of my daughter, Gyra said in a serious tone, shifting the focus of the conversation. I still need to know what your intentions are in menagerie. I knew it, my husband still suspects this human. As for me, I can't help but like the young man who took advantage of his suspension to help his friend reconnect with her family. And I would like to reiterate once again, Mr. Ark, for you not to take offense at your person. I am the leader of Menagerie, not its owner. And as much as I want you to feel welcome on my beloved island and home, I need to consider the possible risks that your presence may bring. Risks for my people, my family, and for yourself. Gyra's heavy voice carries the authority of a chieftain, but his sentence was crafted to make clear his intentions while seeking not to offend our guest. All these years leading the White Fang and now the island of our people have given him political skills that few leaders in councils can rival. The boy, caught off guard by my husband's tone and phrase, blinked his eyes in surprise at the situation he found himself in. He adjusted on the cushion, reflecting on how to respond to the question. It's understandable to pause to think about a response, although this seems like a casual visit, this boy got involved in an important political stage for Faunus from the entire island. She helped me, so I'm helping her. The boy replies, grabbing another cookie. What? Gyra and I ask. The boy stared at us as if we had asked the most obvious thing in the world. Like... I'm her friend, and a few days ago she saved me when I was in danger, so I came here to help her, John says, reaching for another cookie. Gyra was as surprised as I was by the boy's simplicity and honesty. You traveled halfway around the world just for that? Gyra asks in disbelief. John, with his mouth full, replied with a shrug. I laughed at the boy's laid-back demeanor, while Gyra sighed tiredly. Despite finding humor in my husband's frustration, I understand his exhaustion from mentally preparing for a serious discussion with John. And he responded as if it were nothing for him to have crossed a sea infested with Grimm's to try to mend his friend's ties with her family. You still seem suspicious to me, boy. My husband says in a melancholic tone. It was evident that Gyra wished it were that simple, that he just needed to accept this boy's help and that he could reconnect with our daughter. But Gyra is too cynical and not easily convinced, years of political career do that to an individual regardless of being human or fawness. Would it put you more at ease if you did something for me? Surely would raise fewer suspicions, Gyra grumbles to the boy. John raised his right arm, revealing a strange but modern digital watch. Are you listening, church? Affirmative. Echoed the voice from the small device. Impossible! Gyra exclaims. We are too far from the CTT network, how can you communicate? A network of my own connected to the jet that brought me here, John replied once again as if it were nothing. Are you capable of using the Blackbird to map Menagerie? I and Gyra looked at each other, not understanding the boy's plans. Yes, but it will take time. Despite the speed of the jet, Menagerie is a large island. John paused to think, eating another cookie. After taking a sip of coffee to wash it off, he kept talking through the watch. And most of the territory is infested with Grimm's. John comments. If you use the Ark Knights, how much time would it accelerate the process? Let me see, said the slightly irritated voice from the watch. Around two hours, but I'll avoid using them around the city outskirts, we don't want the population to freak out thinking Atlas is attacking. 
Please let me know as soon as you finish. Gyrus stared at the boy open-mouthed. Why are you going to provide us with a map of the island? We should be doing something for you. John looked at Gyra, surprised by his question, as if he hadn't planned to give the map. If you'd like, I can give you the map, but I was thinking of something else, actually, John says, getting up and stretching his arms upward. I need to train, and coincidentally, I'm in the most grim-infested place outside the land of darkness. Audra Taurus Since I met that human brat dressed as one of Atlas's central intelligence agents on the beach, I didn't like him. He simply jumped out of a plane onto our island, the island of all faunus, not his, as if he owned all menagerie. The boy didn't help his situation by staring at me the whole time, probably with disgust and wounded pride for having a faunus like me holding him and immobilizing him, only to then bind him on a tightrope like a common criminal. My opinion of him only worsened when Chieftain Belladonna explained that the boy was heir to a wealthy family, which brought in various resources to help menagerie. In return, the boy would spend a few days training against Grimm's with an escort from her forces ensuring his safety. All members of the guard protested against the idea, my men shouted that our honor and pride were not for sale. They said our dignity was our most precious possession, and that we wouldn't give it up for handouts. Well, at least that's what they said before they saw the handouts. Twenty laser weapons, one hundred power packs of ammunition, twenty lightweight armors. A few years ago, Chieftain Belladonna would have refused this offer, offended by someone providing weapons of war in an attempt to gain favor from him. But the truth is, with each passing day, we receive more refugees, and these weapons would be a great help in expanding into territory now controlled by Grimm's. As a gesture of goodwill, the boy gave 25% of the resources as an advance and explained to us how to use them. The armors initially seemed not worth it, although they were good protection against long-distance attacks from Grimm's like a Nevermore's feathers, blows from larger Grimm's destroy this type of protection easily. But as soon as we tested them against swords and hammers, we noticed great resistance to cuts and bruises as well. This, along with the fact that they were very lightweight, had some of my men fighting over them. Although the armors were a pleasant surprise, it was the laser weapons, called Lost Guns, that surprised us. Lost Gun Weight, 2.3 kilograms Length, 900 millimeters Ammunition, Lost Gun Power Pack, recharges in the sun for two hours Magazine capacity, 150 shots Type of fire, single shot or fully automatic Full auto rate of fire, 220 shots per minute. According to the data the boy showed on his scroll, the lost gun is quite lightweight for an assault rifle, the recoil was non-existent, 150 shots are incredible as capacity of one magazine, and its full auto mode was quite fast. But what caught my attention the most was the fact that the power packs recharge in the sun. The boy explained that the batteries used solar energy, a new energy matrix that was still being researched by him. Twenty weapons and armors may seem like little, but with them, I can train small elite troops to make reconnaissance incursions. The only warning from the boy was that the weapons don't work outside of menagerie or with active members of the White Fang. When asked how this was possible, the boy just smiled maliciously in response. That was very suspicious, a human genius inventor heir to a wealthy family, crossed the sea just to train and help the family of a Beacon colleague? According to the chieftain, he wasn't a partner or teammate of Blake's. Come at me, rat. My reflection is interrupted by the young Ark's provocation. Squeak, squeals the rodent grim, charging toward the blonde. As soon as the creature jumped, John stepped forward, dodging the larger than a pit bull grim and hammering it with a precise punch from top to bottom on its head. Pow! The grim dissolved instantly as the punch connected. Suck it, bitch! Obscenities aside, 
the boy was remarkable, not because he destroyed a grim with just one punch, but because he destroyed a small horde of twenty capybara grims without using semblance, aura, or weapons. The fact that he managed to fight wearing flip-flops was also notable for a rich family playboy. Image Despite being small, when compared to most of the Grimms on the island, these bastards are fast when they attack, they even remind Borbatusk because of how fast they charge. As John walked towards me, I couldn't help but think about how his touristy appearance tricked me into thinking he was just a stupid human. I'm not happy being his babysitter, the blonde handpicked me to accompany him and prohibited the involvement of any active member of the White Fang during his visit. What do you have against Fong? I thought to myself. I'm not a fan of them, but why avoid their involvement? After the chieftain left the White Fang, it took me a short time to leave as well. The group's new philosophy was terrible for Adam, who had his dark side brought out, and that bitch Sienna Khan, who seemed to nurture his violent tendencies, also pissed me off to the extreme. I need to take advantage of my position now, around this boy I can confirm his intentions and see if John Ark is a manipulation genius or just a reckless fool. I think I got the hang of my strength and speed after this warm-up. Warm-up? Is fighting in the sun with so many grims warming up? And now that he's gotten close to me, I can see he's not sweating. You only have one more hour of sunlight, if we leave now and walk to another grim's hotspot, it will be too late and dangerous to return to Kukuana. True. The boy replied, raising his arm. Did you hear her? John asked for his watch. Who are you with dash dot? Positive, Delta is already descending to drop the vehicle and its equipment, said an irritated voice from his watch. By the way, our sleeping stowaway has woken up. Ha! laughs John in a sarcastic tone. Tell her to get equipped and go down with everything. I approached the boy to demand some answers, but a crash followed by a roar cut off my train of thought and made me pull out my axe. Ruer. Where did that come from? I asked with the axe ready as my heart beat faster. That was fast, said John smiling at the sky. I wondered if the boy was crazy, but when I looked in the same direction as him, I noticed that the air was distorted, cloudy as if a shape made of water was descending from the heavens. A camouflaged grim? I muttered to myself. As the shape approached, it became larger. Bigger than any elder nevermore I've killed. Big as a... Dread shadow? I whisper, wide-eyed while a shiver runs down my spine. Hmm? The young man murmured, looking in my direction. Terrified, I ignored the boy's attention. My body shook, my hands gripped the axe so hard that it felt like the weapon was going to break in half. Good to know that stealth mode works well. John commented. Confused, I look at the boy for a second and then up and see the strange blurred shape turn black revealing the shape of a huge black jet. Mouth agape at the situation, instead of landing, the jet opens a gate and another, less powerful engine, roars, accelerating and a six-wheeled car jumps out of the plane, falling in front of us. Poof! The dull thud was muffled by the sand and suspension of the strange car in front of us. Image Let's go! John says, walking towards the vehicle. It was a large land vehicle, made for all terrain. The driver's door opens, revealing a red-haired girl dressed in leather for exploration. Image Sorry for the delay, the girl said, giving a mischievous smile. Took me a while to find a parking spot. Boo! John booed the red-haired girl. Weak! Boo! Irritated with Ark, she simply flipped him off and then tossed a backpack to John, who, after catching it, went behind the car to change. As I approached, the young woman turned towards me, surprised by my presence, which was normal. 
I'm quite tall at 2.20 meters. Few people reach my height, even fewer when it comes to women. Greetings, Yen Human, I say in a formal tone, extending my right hand towards her. I am Audra Taurus, commander of the Menagerie Guard. The girl blinked confused, surprised by my formal tone. Um. Nice to meet you, she paused suspiciously, as if trying to remember her own name. I'm Budika Nikos. We shook hands, and from her grip, I could tell she wasn't a dainty girl, but a warrior. Probably with an awakened aura. The boy, when he arrived at the island, said he came as an unprepared tourist, but he has a jet at his disposal with more vehicles inside and someone with an awakened aura to support him? That's too suspicious. I need more information. The Ark over there said he came to Menagerie to help the Belladonna family, and now he wants to train fighting Grimms, I comment, looking at the vehicle and then back at her. And you? The girl paused again to think, and despite still having doubts, she answered. I think I came as John's security, she replied uncertainly. Answering a question with I think isn't a good sign, but it's easy to see that this girl isn't hiding anything nefarious, which leads to my next question. Are you his girlfriend? Ha! Huh? exclaimed the girl, widening her eyes. W. Why do you ask? She stammered. Did he say something to you? She clearly has a crush on the boy, but it doesn't seem like she's dating him. Bringing extra security to such a remote and grim-filled place like our island isn't a bad idea. I'm ready, says John, emerging from behind the vehicle. He looked like a different person now. The young blonde huntsman impressed me with his appearance. When he arrived at the island, John wore that idiotic human tourist outfit that made him look like a fool, but now his style is so distinct, he looked like someone ready to fight against anything and anyone. His attire reveals a harmony between functionality and elegance, something many fighters usually overlook. The black fabric armor he wears seems molded to his body, highlighting his toned physique. The white armor plates add a touch of grandeur and protection, contrasting perfectly with the dark background. The strange visor over his eye breaks the modern white knight theme a bit, but the sword on his waist and circular shield on his back bring it back until he turns around, and I see that he's colorful with a white star in the middle. Huntsmen and huntresses, especially from Vale, value their flashy outfits, but within a theme so they can stand out. John seemed inclined towards the aesthetic of a modern white knight, but the visor and strange shield break the theme. This proves that he doesn't care what others think of him. Which is uncommon for someone from a traditional Vale family. We set off for the location I suggested, Dire Death Valley, where terror raptors of the Grimm species live. They are a bit smaller than a Beowulf and lighter, but just as strong and faster. The redhead girl paled at my suggestion, while John raised his arms to the sky in celebration. The vehicle inside was comfortable and as futuristic as its exterior. I told you to sit in the front seat, to be ready for danger. John protested, saying that was his spot. I didn't want to question his decision since I was just an attendant, so I sat in the back seat while the redhead girl took the wheel and John next to her opened a holographic console as soon as he sat down. Given the limited view of what was ahead, I decided to pay attention to what Ark was doing. The hologram in front of him showed the surrounding terrain, by the size it seemed to be about 100 meters. Weird, I thought to myself. The chieftain informed me that he has a detailed map of the entire island. If he has a map of Menagerie, he would be able to see a plateau near Dire Death Valley. The ideal place to land that jet at his disposal. Can I ask something? I inquire aloud. The boy stopped fiddling with the map and smiling, turned to me. You can ask anything, Miss Taurus, he replied cheerfully. Miss? How quaint, I thought mockingly. It's been at least twenty years since I've been called that. 
It took some time to formulate my question, which was enough for Ark's eyes to stare intensely at me. I knew it, I thought to myself. He can be polite and make those fake smiles. But he can't help but look at me with disgust, can he? As if I'm a fascinating aberration. Or someone he can't trust and needs to keep an eye on. I swallowed my anger fueled by my thoughts and asked my question. Why didn't we go with your plane? Good question, complains the girl next to him. Not that I'm not having fun, but it would be faster flying in that jet of yours. John smiled tiredly, shaking his head negatively, but turned to face forward, changing the holographic map in front of him to the entire region. I want to train fighting Grimms. The jet consumes more fuel than the car having to land and take off all the time, he says, pressing a gauge on the console. And if you're afraid of being overwhelmed by Grimms, you can relax. This is the ND-1 Nomad Exploration Vehicle. Besides being able to cross any terrain, it comes equipped with thrusters, shields, radar, and life support. I can't help but feel a little envy at the technologies developed by humans. We Faunus could also create incredible things if we weren't persecuted everywhere on the planet. After 40 minutes of silent travel, we arrived at our destination. The name alone hung heavily in the air. The white rocks of the canyons reflected light towards the center, making it obvious that it would be hotter than the open desert. As soon as I opened the door, the blast of dry heat slapped me in the face. Through the dust haze, I surveyed the scene. The irregular, skeletal ravine stretched out before us, a scar on the already devastated land. For training or a violent death, I say sarcastically. This is one of the best places on the island for both. One of the best? Asked John, jumping out of the car. You mean there are others? I stared at the boy, raising an eyebrow, disbelieving the statement that came out of his mouth. How about we explore this ravine, and if you survive with all limbs intact, we'll talk about going to another one, I said in a mischievous tone. You're right, John replied sincerely, without noticing the irony. Thanks, Miss Taurus, you're an excellent guide. Finally, some action, adds Nikos, joining us with a red wooden staff in hand. Okay. I guess this boy is less cunning and more clueless than I thought, but the intense glares he throws in my direction when he thinks I'm not noticing reinforce how much this boy despises me for being a faunus. Even as we descended into the canyon, it was easy to notice a stiff facial expression on John, furrowed brows, widened eyes, and tight lips as he stared at me. He also seemed uncomfortable in his walk, as if he were trying to hide something in his pants pocket. When he wasn't staring at me, John was smiling, wielding his shield, but his smile disappeared within minutes as we descended further into the gorge. I thought this place would be full of grims, complains the frustrated blonde. Terror raptors, when threatened, form large packs to attack, I explain, taking the lead. If we walk quietly, we can catch some of them off guard and dash dot. Bong! I was interrupted by a gong behind me. I turned on my heels and stared at the culprit of the idiocy, and to no one's surprise, it was John Ark, the offender. The foolish human had slammed the hilt of his sword against his shield. You idiot! I exclaimed, keeping the volume of my voice low, as there was no reaction from the Grimms. Do you want us to dash dot? Bon! 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 He hammered his shield as if his life depended on it, and as soon as he stopped, he looked around for Grimm's. Man, what a bummer, I thought there, ugh. Whatever Ark was going to say was cut off when I grabbed his throat. You idiot! I shout, squeezing his throat. You've doomed us all. 
Even with his throat caught in my hand, the human still stared at me with wide eyes, only this time with more intensity and looking down on me, avoiding my eyes. Listen here, you shithead, dash dot. Before I could finish, I was cut off, not by an audible noise, but by a strange tremor that I started feeling with the soles of my feet. The tremor started subtly, a low vibration that tickled the soles of my feet. Nikos, the more perceptive of the two, was the first to realize that something was happening. Audra, she asks, her voice tense, with urgency. I turned to the humans and delivered my message bluntly. Grims, I growl, the word laden with dread. In the distance, a cloud of dust was heading our way. We don't have time to go back to the car, I shout frantically. We'll have to try climbing the canyon. I jumped on the rocks and started climbing. In a few seconds, from the top, I could see the herd of Grims heading our way. Image Terror Raptors I murmur with concern. It was a pretty big bunch, there must have been almost one thousand of them, all because of all that noise John made, speaking of John, it's too quiet around here. To my left I see Budika following my pace on the climb and to my right is, no one? John? I ask for the blonde fool. John! I'm fucking here! Shouts the white knight from the bottom of the canyon. Had he not moved? In fact, he had a shield and his sword on fire raised in a fighting stance. After I destroy all the Grimms, you can come down. Is he insane? I question shocked. He has to go up to give the Grimms time to disperse, then you attack. Well, Nico says next to me. He was never the sanest person in any group, but I guarantee he didn't go crazy. How can you be so sure? With a calm look, the redhead looks at John tenderly before completing. Based on how little I spent time with him and what other people say about him. I'm sure of two things about John Arcade. She comments smiling. Common sense doesn't apply to him. And the second thing? The woman dressed as an explorer sighed, smiling even wider, before she turned to me and replied. He always kept his word, no matter how impossible it seemed. PV Original I know we even came to this shithole to fight these dinosaur chickens, but could you have thought of a better plan, or at least thought of a plan, or thought at all? Ha ha. I laugh in a sarcastic tone. How about if instead of making jokes, you help me? Caught surprised by my serious attitude, Church dematerialized, activating the scouter in my ear to provide information. What do you need? Tactical data overlay, threat assessment, target tracking, weapons guidance, aura monitoring, or send in some arc knights. I couldn't help but smile mischievously, Church seemed excited to help me with this fight. Almost making me regret what I'm about to say. Play escape from the city. Dot. The image on my display shook like a glitch, and then I heard Church's crying voice. Are you serious? He asks the discredited AI. From that Sonic game from Dream Quest? I actually played the GameCube one. Not relevant. Church shouts stressed. Instead of answering, I decided to focus in front of me on the herd of dinosaur grims that were getting closer and closer. With the shield and flaming sword in hand, I was sad thinking I was going to fight without music until a familiar bass riff came on my watch and scouter. Woo! Oh, yeah! Thank you, Church! I exclaim, running towards the Grimms. I hate you! He replies with a mumble. I threw the shield at the herd leader and jumped to intercept the shield in midair with my feet just as the lyrics began. Rolling around at the speed of sound. Got places to go. Gotta follow my rainbow. I fell surfing on the shield, cutting Grimm's left and right. 
When the shield lost its momentum, I stepped hard on the edge of it, making it rise to my eye level, only to kick it in midair towards a cluster of terror raptors. Can't stick around, have to keep moving on. Guess what lies ahead? Only one way to find out. The shield hits three heads and returns to my left arm, fitting perfectly. That super soldier serum really helps with calculating the angles. I comment, punching a grim in front of me. The flaming adamantine sword cuts through the grims as if they were made of butter. Thanks to the serum my stamina was also increased along with my strength, speed and mental capacity. I.e. I can do this all day. A shame that my joy was short-lived because after half an hour the fight started to get monotonous. Boring! I exclaim, dodging a raptor's attack. I have to admit, this isn't exactly the grimpocalypse I was hoping for. Those things they call terror raptors? So more for terror chickens. Even though they are faster than a beowulf, it wasn't a big deal for my enhanced reflexes. One of them jumped towards me over the few remaining grims, but with a blow from the shield he flew against the canyon wall, dissolving on impact. Okay, this has gone from boring to sad. I grumbled out loud. Be careful what you say, man. Church advises, cutting my tunes. Why? I question cutting the last terror raptor. At the scouter church, he changed the display and focused on small rocks shaking on the ground. The fuck? Better stay away. Without thinking, I ran to the opposite side as the tremors increased. Want help? Shouted Amber using her disguise from the top of the canyon. No, K.S. I responded by shouting. Crack! In a deafening crack, the canyon wall was shattered as a monstrous creature pierced through it. Image My eyes widened as my mind struggles to process what I see. A T-Rex with two heads? There's no other word to describe it. The monster, over six meters, twenty feet, tall, let out a roar in front of me. Roar! The creature's deafening roar echoed through the canyon, making me tremble. I feel small and insignificant in the face of its magnitude. The creature's smoky black body stood out in the desert, and its red eyes seemed to burn with supernatural intensity. The sharp fangs in its open mouth are like steel blades, ready to tear through anything in its path. And its face and chest are covered in a bone armor typical of older and more powerful grims. As if being a damn T-Rex with two heads wasn't enough to indicate power. And even intimidated by the monster, which might be of the Leviathan class, I start to tremble, but not out of fear but anticipation for a good fight. Finally, a worthy opponent! I exclaim, pointing my sword at the monster. Our battle will be legendary. Are you crazy, kid? Amber shouts in my ear. Ha! Huh? How are you talking to me? Church connected me to convince you not to get yourself killed and to take this seriously. I throw my brow, frustrated by the lack of faith my friends have in my fighting ability. Let's do this, Church. Send me four Ark Knights, two for support and two to film. Seriously? Both judged me through the scouter communicator. Of course, I commented as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. This is basically a heavy metal album cover in grim form. I want to boast about it later. Guru! Both heads finally noticed me. The monster took a step forward, cracking the ground as I ran towards a pile of rocks that formed steps. Play victorious Dino Gods, Church. Can you mute the song for me? I won't suffer alone. Damn it. Amber complained over the communication channel. You know, sometimes you're an asshole, church. Ha! 
I laughed aloud, jumping from the highest rock towards the monster. He's famous for being an asshole. Dinos arise. Stand up and fight. Huntsman Logs, Entry Headmaster Ajpin. Name, Weishni. Alias, Ice Queen. Allegiance, Kingdom of Vale, SDC. Weapon, Mertonaster. Semblance, Glyphs, allows her to create glyphs in a many ways. Stats. Strength, 1 stars. Endurance, 3 stars. Agility, 4 stars. Fighting skill, 3 stars. Mental, 4 stars. Aura, 3 stars. Aura skill, 6 stars. Semblance, 4 stars. Weiss could have easily settled for a life of privilege, but she chose to fight and become a huntress. Defending the world against the forces of darkness. The SDC heir is an exemplary student with notable skills in dust and combat with her sword, Mertonaster. She is a natural leader, although she sometimes needs to be reminded of the importance of teamwork and trust in her teammates. I have great respect for Weishni and am confident that she will make her mark on the world, not as the heir to a corporate empire, but as a hero who rises against adversity with grace and power. Regarding Weiss' abilities, John asked the following question. I know she's not the best fighter among Beacon students, that title belongs to people like Yang and Pira. But for me, she is the best candidate to be a maiden. Her fighting style can easily adapt to magical powers and no one among the students would be more committed than her when training to master magical powers. Once again, I find myself forced to agree with Young Ark, despite not admitting it out loud. E.A.I. Gurzada? My original idea was to call this chapter a new arc, but I thought it was too obvious. As I had already warned in the previous chapter, Multiverse Crafter will now be updated once a month, but it will have more words than normal. I would like to reiterate that I am looking for more beta readers, anyone interested just send me a DM. And before going to the comments I would like to ask. Does anyone else think Weiss would be a better candidate for Maiden than Pira? I know Pira is the better fighter, but I think Weiss would be a more competent maiden than the Invincible Girl. Chaos King 24 Isn't the Rusted Knight John from a different universe? Response equals John des Universo Neo Viesi Torner o Rusted Knight. Esta bensando m desconsiderer a existencia do ever after e temperata 9, exito a evolico de semblance que tivamos de neo. Mikhail Sharon. Someone already took his first time? Already. Can we expect the others to follow suit? Response equals sim, alguim pigu a virgin de deli e neo foi du main cast, he tambum neo foi a cali per que neo so fe de entear contra personagens que eu gosto. Archer who? How many point would cost for a Cayman Rider belt and items just asking for curiosity or how many point would cost for Boboy Boy Power Watch? Response equals Agora Sim. Buma Pergunta K Sapara OS Homans Dos Weebs. No Minimo O Dobro du K Foi O Saro du Super Soldado. Cayman Rider M Media Tem Am Punching Power de 2.5 Tons, O K Faz Dealies No Gerald 32, 69 Vezes Mes Forte K O De Am Humano Adulto Medio E4, 90 Vezes Mes Forte K O De Am Litador de Box de Elite. Blazing in 1. Nice new chapter. Did Crow wonder why church sounded like Tayan? Response equals. EU So Am um, Idiota. Como EU SKC Diso. AARGH, thanks Blazing in One for reminding me.